This is actually a backup line for the court reporter. Oh, oh, good to know. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Can't think of anything more fun than on a rainy day. Are you in the Midwest? We've heard it's raining in some places there. Actually, uh, Galveston, Texas. Oh. Well, it that's is. good. I'm glad you're not missing sunshine today. No, um, it's uh, kind of gray and dreary, but it usually blows over pretty quickly. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, we'll wait just another minute or two. Thank you to everyone who's joined so far, just to give everyone time on if there's any issues, and then we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. We're just giving everyone a few more minutes to join. Um, our numbers are jumping up quickly, so just waiting to make sure as many committee members as possible can join our call, um, as well as anyone else. We'll begin about 9.05.
Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the spring 2022 behavioral health and substance use measure evaluation web meeting. My name is Tamara Funk and I'm the director supporting the behavioral health and substance use project. I'm excited to be here with you this morning and look forward to the robust discussions we will have today. I want to thank you in advance for your time and participation, as I understand that it takes a significant amount of time and effort to review these measures and to prepare for today's discussions. I would also like to extend a thank you to all our measure developers for being on the call today. We also recognize the time and effort that goes into the creation, testing, and submission of a measure. And we want to highlight those efforts and thank you for this important work as well. I'll start by introducing our co-chairs, Dr. Harold Pincus and Dr. Michael Trangle. I'd like to give both of them a chance to provide some welcoming remarks. So I'll first turn to Michael to kick things off. Welcome and thank you for being here as a holiday uh, weekend uh, approaches and a lot of people are busy and traveling. Uh, I just hope today's discussion is uh, fruitful and efficient. Thanks again. Um, I don't have much to add from, uh, from Michael's introduction, but um, welcome. And uh, we have a lot on our plate and we hopefully we'll be able to get it, get through it um, effectively. And as Michael said, efficiently. Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, I'll turn now to Hannah Ingber on the NQF team to review some housekeeping reminders. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, yeah, I'll just review a few housekeeping reminders really briefly. Uh, as most of you know, we're using the WebEx platform to host this measure evaluation meeting today. Um, we know there are inherent challenges with facing a virtual platform. So if you're having any technical difficulties, please let us know um, because our team is ready to assist you via the chat feature or if you want to email us directly at behavioralhealth@qualityforums.org. Uh, in the spirit of engagement and collaboration, we encourage you to turn on your video if you're able so that we can see each other's faces and bridge some of those virtual gaps. If you're not actively speaking, we ask that you please place yourself on mute to minimize background noise and interruptions. To mute, you can click on the microphone at the bottom of your screen. And to unmute, just click on that again. Uh, we highly encourage everyone to use the chat box feature and the raise hand feature throughout the meeting today. Um, NQF staff and the co-chairs will monitor the discussions and highlight any chat comments that come through our call. Um, uh, there's also an option to chat with people directly if you need to, so we encourage that if you need to communicate with the NQF staff. Um, we also, of course, encourage using the raise hand feature um, so that you can be called upon to speak. That raise hand feature is also at the bottom of your screen near the sort of smiley face. Um, let's see. Uh, so very shortly, our senior director, senior managing director, Tricia Elliott will conduct roll calls and review disclosures of interest. Um, it is important to note that we are a voting body and therefore need to establish quorum to vote during our meeting today. Uh, we ask that you please, uh, if you need to step away from the call, please notify the NQF team in chat so that we can maintain an awareness of attendance and forum numbers throughout the meeting. Uh, I'll bring, I'll pass it back to Tammy now. Thank you, Hannah. It's now my pleasure to introduce our project team to you today. Again, my name is Tammy Funk and I'm the director on this project. Aaron Buchanan is our senior manager. Hannah Ingber is our manager. Sean Sullivan is the associate and our support staff listed here and present on the call today to help address questions and provide support to the discussions are Poonam Bal, our senior director, Iyami Kidan, our project manager, and Dr. Jesse Pines, our consultant. Uh, you'll note that uh, most of the project staff have been able to add the letters NQF to our names on the WebEx platform to help you more easily identify us should you need to chat us directly with a tech or voting issue. Okay, and now I'll briefly review today's agenda. We'll begin by taking attendance and we'll ask committee members to state any disclosures of interest. After this, Hannah will provide an overview of the evaluation and voting processes. Sean will then conduct a voting test. As usual, we'll be using Poll Everywhere, an online platform for our live voting process. You should have received an email with a Poll Everywhere link this morning. The link uh, should also be added to the calendar invite. If you can't find the link in either place, please send the team a chat or come off mute when we're doing the voting test and let us know, and we'll be happy to send you another link. 
please do not paste the link into the general chat as it's critical to our process that we vote to standing committee, committee members only. After the voting test, I will briefly introduce our measures under review and then hand the discussion over to our co-chairs to facilitate the consideration of each measure. The standing committee will discuss each criterion in order and vote on each criterion. The last vote will be an overall recommendation for endorsement for the measure. Following the discussion of all measures, we will review related and competing measures for any measures that were recommended for endorsement today. We will then host an opportunity for NQF members and the public to voice their comments. And then we'll conclude with next step and what to expect moving forward and then I want to point out that we have planned to achieve the review and voting of all seven measures during today's meeting. However, you should still have a calendar invite and time reserved on Friday, July 8th from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. If we do not complete discussion and voting of the measures under review today, we will reconvene a week from Friday the agenda. If we do make it through the agenda today, next Friday's meeting will be canceled. Next slide, please. Okay, I will now turn things over to Trisha Elliott to conduct our attendance and disclosures of interest. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today and your commitment to the Behavioral Health Standing Committee. We truly appreciate your, your time and experience uh, as part of the NQF processes. So to, today, as Tammy mentioned, we'll combine introductions with disclosures of interest. You received two disclosure of interest forms from us. One is our annual disclosure of interest, and the other is disclosures specific to the measures we are reviewing in this cycle. In those forms, we asked you a number of questions about your professional activities. Today, we'll ask you to verbally disclose any information you provided on either of those forms that you believe is relevant to this committee. We are especially interested in grants, research, or consulting related to the committee's work. A few reminders. You sit on this group as an individual. You do not represent the interests of your employer or anyone who may have nominated you for this committee. We are interested in your disclosures of both paid and unpaid activities that are relevant to the work in front of you. Finally, just because you disclose does not mean that you have a conflict of interest. We do verbal disclosures in the spirit of openness and transparency. Now we'll go around the virtual table Starting with our committee co-chairs, I will call your name. Please state your name, what organization you are with, and, a, and if you have anything to disclose. If you do not have disclosures, please just state that I have nothing to disclose to keep us moving along. If you experience trouble unmuting yourself, please raise your hand so our staff can assist. So I'll start with Harold Pincus. I'm, I'm Harold Pankis. I'm professor and vice chair of psychiatry at Columbia University and co-director of the Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. Uh, I'm also a senior adjunct senior scientist at the RAND Corporation. Um, I'm on a, uh, clinical advisory committees for uh, ABLE II, Magellan Studio, and Cerebral, and the National Council. Um, I have a number of sort of research grants from uh, public and nonprofit foundations. Thank you. Any official um, disclosures of the measures today? Um, well, the only thing is I'm, I'm on the uh, uh, NCQA behavioral measurement advisory panel. And in the past, I've been a consultant for Mathematica, but not on any measure development stuff. Okay, great. Thank you. Michael Trangle. Hi, I'm Michael Trangle, a uh, clinically uh, and mainly retired psychiatrist, uh, formerly sort of senior medical director for an integrated system of care called Health Partners, um, uh, et cetera. I'm currently a, a senior fellow uh, at an institute for research and education with Health Partners and just uh, doing volunteer kind of community activities, governor's mental health advisory council, uh, some governor task force, et cetera, and so forth. The no conflict of interest Way, way, well, more than five years ago, I did uh, work um, and co lead for the development of the Minnesota Community Measurement uh, and the revisions of their depression measures, but that was more than five years ago. So, no conflicts. Okay, excellent. Thank you. 
Uh, Ann Bostick. Okay, we'll circle back. Caroline Carney. Good morning. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Vitka Eisen. Hi, I'm Vitka Eisen, uh, CEO for Health Right 360. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Julie Goldstein Grummet. Hi, good morning. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Benjamin Hahn. Circle back. Marissa Hen. Uh, good morning. This is Marissa Hen. Um, have nothing to disclose, and I am the Associate Commissioner for the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Excellent. Thank you. Lisa Jensen. Okay, we'll circle back. Caitlin Colheed Larson. Good morning. I have nothing to uh, disclose. Thank you. Craig Knudsen. Good morning. Um, I'm Craig Knudsen. I'm the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Barbara Lang. Good morning. I'm Barb Lang. I work with Community Bridges Incorporated. Nothing to disclose. Thank you. Michael Lardieri. We'll circle back. Raquel Mazan Jeffers. Brooke Parrish. Good morning. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. David Pating. Hi, this is David Pating. I'm with the San Francisco Department of Public Health. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Vanita Pindolia. Okay, we'll circle back. Chantel Rice Collins. Hi, Chantel Rice Collins from the University of Southern California Clinical Faculty Occupational Therapy and nothing to disclose. Thank you. Jeffrey Sussman. I am Jeff Sussman. I've uh, recently transitioned to the University of Texas uh, medical branch in uh, Galveston, where I serve as senior associate dean and get to uh, torment medical students primarily. I uh, have nothing uh, current to disclose, although in the past uh, I've had uh, research grants from uh, HRQ and uh, worked with NCQA and uh, some of the related issues here, but uh, nothing current. Thank you. Alan Tien. Hi, good morning. I'm Alan Tien. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the founder and uh, president chief science officer of Medical Decision Logic Inc. or MD Logics. I think there's nothing to disclose. We're a, really a measurement agnostic uh, web platform for suicide prevention and broader behavioral health inter integration, but we, we do, I do partner with folks at um, Drexel and Jefferson with another measure, the behavioral health screen, but I don't think that causes a conflict here. Great. Thank you very much. Patrick Triplett. <clears throat> Heidi Waters. I am Heidi Waters and Senior Director of Policy Research for Otsuka Pharmaceuticals. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Bonnie Zima. Bonnie, if you're talking, you're muted. You might be double muted. Better? Uh, now we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. I'm Bonnie Zuma, professor in residence, UCLA uh, Child Psychiatry Health Services Research. I get uh, funding for my research from the Mental Health Service Act and the California Cannabis Bureau. And I'm also a member of the annual review group for the corset. No other conflicts. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to circle back on a few members um, that we did not hear from. Um, Ann Bostic, have you joined? Benjamin Hahn, not seeing him. Lisa Jensen, Michael Lardieri. Raquel Maison Jeffers, not seeing. Benita uh, Pindolia, just checking the list. And Patrick Triplett. Okay, I think uh, all have been accounted for who are on the line. Uh, so thank you for your time and patience as we work through uh, our disclosures. I'd like to let you know that if you believe that you might have a conflict of interest at any time during, a, during the meeting today, as topics are discussed, please speak up. You may do so in real time during this web meeting, or you can send a message via chat to your chairs or to anyone on the NQF staff. If you believe that a fellow committee member may have a conflict of interest or is behaving in a biased manner, you may point this out during the meeting Send a message to your co-chairs or to the NQF staff. Does anyone have questions or anything you'd like to discuss based on the disclosures made today? Okay, hearing none, as a, mem as a reminder, NQF is a nonpartisan organization out of mutual respect for each other, we kindly encourage that we make an effort to refrain from making comments, innuendos, or humor relating to, for example, race, gender, politics, or topics that otherwise may be considered inappropriate during the meeting. While we encourage discussions that are open, constructive, and collaborative, let us all be mindful of how our language and opinions may be perceived by others. With that, I will turn things back to the team to start the meeting. Thanks so much, Tricia. And I'll just let everyone know that at the moment we have 16 committee members in attendance, which is quorum today. So we will be able to vote live on the meeting. Uh, we have heard from a few people who will be joining later or need to leave early. So we will keep a close eye on our numbers, but right now we are good to proceed as planned. I'll turn things over to Hannah again now to review the evaluation and voting processes. Sammy, uh, next slide, please. All right, yeah, I'll um, give a brief overview of the evaluation and voting process. So your role as a standing committee, committee member is to act as a proxy for the NQF multi-stakeholder membership. Um, as the behavioral health and substance use committee members, you not only oversee the portfolio of measures, but you also work collaboratively with NQF staff to provide recommendations for endorsement of measures based on our CDP evaluation guidance. You're also tasked uh, to respond to comments that are submitted during our public commenting periods. And um, today you will be asked to evaluate measures against each criterion and subsequently make recommendations according to your evaluation. Next slide, please. Uh, we just wanna remind you that this is a shared space of interdisciplinary multi-stakeholder committee members. So everyone's voice is important and we wanna emphasize that each committee member holds equal value on this call and in the broader scope of the work. As NQF staff, we do our due diligence to encourage committee members to adequately review the measure information prior to the evaluation meeting. And today we invite you to remain actively engaged and cognizant of the varying experiences of all of those on the call. Please remember to allow others space to contribute and keep your comments concise and focused on the specific voting criterion at hand uh, to fairly evaluate the measures against the specific criteria. Please be respectful of others um, and allow others to contribute, share your experiences, and of course, we all learn a great deal from each other on these calls. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this slide describes the process by which we'll conduct today's measure discussion and evaluation. Each measure discussion will begin with a brief developer introduction on the measure overall. Uh, facilitation will then be led by the respective co-chair and discussion will be stewarded by our assigned lead discussions. Thank you again, lead discussants, for your leadership today. Uh, the lead discussant will briefly explain the information on the specific criterion, emphasize notable areas of concern, 
uh, the preliminary staff rating, any standing committee pre-evaluation comments, any public comments, and then the full committee will discuss um, the measure criterion at hand. Uh, is there any discussion items requiring clarification from the developer? NQS staff and the co-chairs will collect those and ask the developer to clarify after the committee discussion. Any remaining discussion can then be resolved and then we'll vote. Uh, if the measure passes the criterion uh, or the criterion is not must pass, the process will then be repeated with the subsequent criteria. Measures are, oh, next slide, please. Okay, measures are evaluated for their suitability based on standardized main and sub criteria in the order depicted on the screen. Uh, so I'll just go through these to remind everyone of our criteria. Uh, importance to measure and report shows the extent to which the measure focus is evidence-based and important to making significant gains in healthcare quality, where there is variation in or overall less than optimal performance. This is must pass. Scientific acceptability is the extent to which the measure produces consistent, another word for reliable, and credible, another word for valid. Uh, results about quality of care when implemented. Feasibility shows the extent to which the specifications require data that are readily available um, or could be captured and implemented when, without undue burden. Usability and use shows the extent to which the measure is being used for both accountability and performance improvement to achieve the goal of high quality, efficient healthcare. Uh, and then we discuss uh, a comparison to related and competing measures if the measure meets all of the above criteria and are recommended for endorsement. Um, Okay, so I'll just note that the assessment of each criterion is a matter of degree. However, if either a, a new or returning uh, or maintenance measure is judged as not passing for importance to measure and report, scientific acceptability and use for maintenance measures, it cannot be recommended for endorsement and will not be evaluated against those remaining criteria. Um, if a measure, again, meets all of the above criteria, they are recommended for endorsement and we will discuss the related and competing measures. Um, okay, uh, NQS staff will provide a brief overview of the related and competing measures and we'll invite the committee to weigh in with any further commentary at the end of the meeting. Uh, Again, it's important to reiterate that measures that fail one of the must pass criteria will not proceed to additional discussion or voting on the subsequent criteria. However, if consensus is not reached, discussion will continue to the next criterion, but the vote on overall suitability will be deferred to the post comment meeting. Next slide. Okay, achieving consensus. Uh, as Tammy mentioned, in order to conduct live voting today, the standing committee must achieve and maintain quorum, which is 66% or um, 16 out of 23 standing committee members. The chart that you see on the screen displays the margins within which voting outcomes are indicated. Yes votes are a total of high and moderate votes. And a measure that does not reach consensus, again, will move forward to the draft report commenting period and the committee will reconvene uh, in subsequent months to revote on that measure. If the measure is not recommended for endorsement, it too will proceed to the draft report commenting period. But the difference here is that the committee will not be called on to revote on the measure unless the committee decides to reconsider their recommendation based on either a public comment from the draft report commenting period or a formal reconsideration request from the developer. Um, I'll note that the quorum, den quorum denominator will not change today as there are no recusals, so we'll always need 16. Next slide, thanks. Um, okay, uh, I'll also note that we need a baseline of 50% of active standing committee members to be present on the call. Uh, that is 11 uh, members, oh, 12 members, I'm sorry. Um, so this is where attendance plays a significant role, as Tammy already mentioned. Um, yeah, and if you at any point you need to leave, uh, please, uh, or anticipate a change in your attendance status, please just place a note in the chat to everyone to let us know or you can chat any NQF staff privately. Um, if you need to step away, you can log out of the platform and log back in when you return to help us keep track of who is on the call that way as well. Uh, in the event that the attendance drops below quorum, we will continue discussion um, of all of the measures at hand, but we will defer the voting activity for the remainder of the call to an offline voting survey that we will send out after the call finishes. Okay, next slide. 
Are there any questions about the evaluation process that I just went over? Okay, hearing none, uh, let me check the chat. Okay, uh, I'll pass it to you, Sean, now to conduct our voting test. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Hannah, so much. So as my NQF colleagues have mentioned, everyone should have received a voting link this morning um, in your email between 5.30 and 8.30 a.m., depending on your time zone. Um, if anyone is having any trouble accessing the voting link, please let us know and we will be sure to get that over to you. Again, just as a reminder, please do not share the link in the chat or communicate that outside of the standing committee. And we are looking for a total of 16 votes. And our test question today is, do you prefer the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? And option A is for the Beatles and option B is for the Rolling Stones. Okay, we're at 12 votes, just a few more. If anyone is having any trouble finding the link, please let us know. 14 votes, almost there. Looks like we're looking for one more vote. Um, if anyone has any trouble finding the link or accessing the poll everywhere, please uh, do let us know. Hi, this is Craig. I'm having a hard time loading it. It won't let me in. Okay, Craig, thank you for letting us know. Um, let me see here. Greg, I once had trouble with Poll Everywhere and, and used a different browser or even an incognito window, and that gave me better results. The browser does have an effect sometimes, yes. Also pretty well um, optimized for use on a smartphone. We don't have any time to make arguments on behalf of the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I'm afraid not this time. <laughs> There's one it's vote like... left to be influenced, Harold. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out that sympathy for the devil is worth the entire White Album. <laughs> <laughs> we try not to sway votes too much, Harold. <laughs> so it's it's just saying um, username not recognized. How do, do I have to register? It's, that's what I'm trying to figure it out. You, sh you shouldn't have to. In the interest of time, I'm going to yeah. close the poll now, um, mm -hmm. and then we can we can sh we'll try again before the first vote as well. Sure. Thank so you. the poll is now locked, and we have 11 votes for the Beatles and four votes for the Rolling Stones. So I will turn it back over to Tammy. Thanks, Sean. And Craig, I think someone from the team is going to chat you on the side to see if we can get that link working for you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. All right, next slide, please. I'm going to review the measures that are under review today now. For the spring 2022 cycle, the Behavioral Health and Substance Use Standing Committee will be reviewing seven maintenance measures. The first will be measure 3312, continuity of care after medically managed withdrawal from alcohol and or drugs. The steward and developer are the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and Mathematica Policy Research. Oh, this is incorrect. This is Lewin Group now, I believe. Um, and this did not get updated on our slides. My apologies. Is Lewin Group on the line? 
Yes, we are. It is My Lewin. Apologies. Three zero two and three zero three. We we were not so we had sent our slides through our five hundred eight compliance process, and apparently the change did not get absorbed in time. Um, we will make this change on everything else, and if we have a day two, we'll make sure that's updated. So. Um, sincere apologies for this error here, and just to note for everyone, the first two measures are in fact now um, uh, the developer is uh, the Lewin Group, not Mathematica. Uh, the second measure is 3313, follow-up care for adult Medicaid beneficiaries who are newly prescribed an antipsychotic medication. Um, the Stewart and developer are again the same, it's CMS and Lewin Group. The next five measures under review have all been submitted by the same developer. Minnesota Community Measurement. The first of these five is 0710E, depression remission at 12 months. The next is 0711, depression remission at six months. The next is 1884, depression response at six months, progress towards remission. The next is 1885, depression response at 12 months, progress towards remission. And the final measure under review today will be 0712, depression assessment with PHQ-9, PHQ-9M. Next slide, please. Okay, a quick review of the scientific methods panel. This is a group of researchers, experts, and methodologists in healthcare quality and quality measurement uh, that NQF convenes to review complex measures. And the panel's comments and concerns are provided to the developers so they, they can provide further clarification and update their submission to strengthen any measures that are to be evaluated by the standing committee. Next slide, please. This cycle, no behavioral health measures were reviewed by the SMP. Okay, next slide. So with that, we will now begin the review of our spring 2022 measures. To remind you of the flow, our co-chairs will start us off by introducing the measure. They will then turn to the developer, who will have three to five minutes to provide a brief overview of their measure. The co-chairs will then hand things to the lead discussants, who will summarize the measure and review committee and public comments. During the discussion, any questions from the standing committee or the developers will be noted by the NQF team and co-chairs. After sufficient discussion, the co-chairs will pause and pose each question to the developer for a response. Discussion will then turn back to the standing committee. If at any time during the discussion, the developer team would like to address an inconsistency they hear or clear up some confusion, we ask you to please use the raise hand feature or put your request in the chat. That way the co-chairs can call on you to speak at the appropriate time. The full committee will be discussing and voting on each of the measure criteria. With that, Michael, I hand it over to you. Thank you. So, as you said, the first measure we're going to talk about is continuity of care after medically managed withdrawal from alcohol and or drugs. And it's the Lewin group and the person who's going to give us a 3 to 5 minute summary uh, for the developer is, I think, uh, Colleen McKeeran. Is that right? That's great. That's uh, perfect. Thank you. I'll go right ahead. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about NQF. 3312, Continuity of Care After Medically Managed Withdrawal from Alcohol and or Drugs. Um, my name is Colleen McKernan. I'm a Managing Consultant at the Lewin Group, and I'm joined by a number of colleagues from Lewin, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, who stewards the measure, and the National Committee for Quality Assurance, or NCQA, one of our subcontractors. To specify and test this measure, CMS originally contracted with Mathematica Policy Research, as you heard before. Uh, the development efforts were then transitioned over to Lewin in September of 2019. So CMS developed NQF 3312 for use in state Medicaid programs with an aim of improving transitions of care for participants who recently received treatment for alcohol and or drug use. Individuals are included in the measure's initial population if they were discharged from a medically managed withdrawal program between January the 1st and December 15th of each year. Within the numerator, participants are included if they then received follow-up care through a breadth of means, including inpatient admission, partial hospitalization, outpatient visit, residential treatment, or prescription medication that occurred in the seven and the 14 days following that index discharge. 
Consensus within the clinical community, including in publications that we identified as part of our most recent environmental scan and literature review, and feedback that we've received from our project's technical expert panel, suggests that continuity of care occurring shortly after a completion of a medically managed withdrawal program reduces morbidity associated with the alcohol or drug use and improve rates of participant mortality. NQF 3312 aims to document this process, allowing the clinician that, see, clinician that sees a participant who recently completed a program seven or 14 days prior to engage in follow-up care. Use of results for 3312 by states may reduce long-term costs for management of societal sequelae associated with uh, alcohol or drug addiction. A performance gap for this measure still exists, as demonstrated by analyses described in our uh, measure submission form, suggesting an opportunity for states to improve on the continuity of care that is provided following medically managed withdrawal. On behalf of CMS, Lewin and NCQA performed a series of quantitative and qualitative efforts to assess the measure's current evidence base, distribution of performance, scientific acceptability, feasibility, and usability. And so we're excited to chat with you all today about the measure, and we're here to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. On mute. Good morning. Is it my turn? I think so. I, I just unmuted myself, but it looks like Brooke and it, uh, you're the lead discussion for this. Is that right? I believe so. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, basically, in terms of comments that we have received back is a concern of telehealth, um, not, I guess, being specifically called out. Also, the bridge appointments, those that can be seen perhaps on the same day of discharge as a bridge over. Um, also, there was a little bit of a concern with inpatient being counted in the numerator because they thought that perhaps that might show more of a relapse going back to a higher level of care from detox. And there was also some concern with the 7 or 14 days with sort of the consensus going that they would like a 14 day um, as opposed to 7 and 14 days. And I believe that captures the majority of the comments that were sent. So I guess it's now up to discussion. Now, are, are there other assigned discussions for this? Brooke was our sole lead discussant for this measure. Okay. You, Another committee. Wow. <laughs> now, that, that <laughs> must be that we really trust you. We know and we trust you. <laughs> So other committee, other just uh, uh, our work, our uh, Behavioral Health Standing Committee me member comments, concerns. Uh, this Mike, is Jeff. Jeff, Jeff has raised his hand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is Jeff Sussman. I'll just jump in. Um, I was just concerned or questioned. Uh, this is more for the developer. Uh, whether behavioral health, uh, telephonic or telemedicine uh, follow-up was uh, counted, and if not, why not, uh, particularly given our um, pandemic? Would you like me to respond? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, thank you, Jeff. Um, we absolutely acknowledge that times have changed. Um, the measure, the data that we use for testing um, were, were actually from 2018, I believe. And so pre-pandemic results, um, we absolutely acknowledge the importance of telemedicine and um, alternative methods of management of uh, participants outside of the traditional medical model um, that we were relying on prior to the pandemic. Um, and so I would say that we're agnostic to including telemedicine visits and certainly something that we have on our radar, both from your comments and from evidence we've seen in the literature that suggests a significant uptake in telemedicine over the last two years. Um, so it's something that we plan to track as claims data become available to, um, for Medicaid participants um, in, we don't have 2020 data yet. So we're not quite able to assess the um, impact of telemedicine specific CPT codes on the uh, numerator. I mean, I understand um, why you're in the position you are, uh, but I worry given where we are in the pandemic Mm -hmm. that it's a, a significant threat to the validity of the measure. Uh, so 
Um, I guess we can discuss that as we go through the uh, criterion. Thank you. Just, just the clar. I, I, I'm not sure I understand your answer. Does that mean they're included or they're not included? So I do not believe there are CPT codes specific to telemedicine in the um, in the list of encounters that are captured in the numerator. Again, these data are from 2018, um, so just a different frame of reference for the the care that was provided. Certainly, it's something that we hope to evaluate in future years once higher rates of telemedicine visits are available, uh, likely in the 2020 and beyond data. So 2020 to 2022. Oh. I, I still don't understand your answer. Are you, you know, are they included or not? So the specification does not include those. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, so okay. if you let's pause on this discussion, we're going deep into specifications and validity. We really need to focus on evidence right now. Um, I think these are great questions, and I want to make sure we have a good conversation on them, just in the right area. So let's hold these concerns for specifications and for validity. Poonam, I would I would argue that um, the uh, construct validity, the um, measure itself, whether it is a, a good measure or not, um, which is I guess isn't that our first thing? Evidence. Evidence. The yes. evidence would be flawed if we weren't counting what has become a very common um, method to uh, do follow up and care. If you want to wait till another portion, that's fine. But I would think we don't, don't we also need to know what the evidence actually, what the measure actually measures in order to understand the rest of the conversation. Yeah, so we can have a conversation on, you know, what is the measure and is it supported by evidence? But if we're going to start getting into, um, you know, can, like, can you tell meaningful differences? Are we going to capture the right, um, uh, the right cases through this, that's a little bit more of the specifications and validity section. But if the focus is, is there evidence to support this measure and you're understanding what is the measure and, you know, how that aligns with evidence, that conversation is fine. So I know it's a little nuanced, a little gray zone, but as long as the conversation is housed in, the evidence is supporting um, the specifications and that's what you're getting clarity on. We can have that discussion now. Again, I think it's a completely valid conversation to have. We just want to make sure we're having it in the right area. So really what we're going to be voting on shortly is, is there enough evidence? Are there enough studies to show that routine follow up at 7, 14 days makes a difference and improves the care and outcomes for folks that are going through this. Uh, issue developer did add uh, more about 3 more pieces of evidence supporting their measure. Okay, other comments, other questions, or should we proceed to voting on the evidence here? I feel like I'm in jeopardy and we should have like a duck, 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 duck. <laughs> Give people a certain amount of time to have comments or questions. But hearing that, maybe we should go vote on the evidence then. Okay, let me get that pulled up. All right, you should be seeing the question for measure 3312 on evidence. Uh, voting is now open on evidence. Your options are high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And we're looking for 16 votes and there are no recusals. We're just waiting for one more. Okay. Let me just calculate the results. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Voting is now closed for measure 3312 on evidence. We have zero votes for high, 14 votes for moderate, 
two votes for low and zero votes for insufficient. Therefore, the measure passes on evidence. Okay, uh, Brooke, you wanna uh, talk to us about performance gap? Certainly, under performance gap, there still is a performance gap. Um, they did compare between seven and 14 days. Um, and there, in my mind, not a huge difference in between those seven and 14, although some. Um, looking at younger patients were more likely than those that were older to have a follow up visit. Non white and black non Hispanic patients were more likely to have a follow up visit than um, Hispanic beneficiaries for both um, seven and 14 days. Dual eligible patients were much less likely to have a follow up visit than Medicaid only. And males were more likely to have follow up visits than female patients. Um, CHIP patients were less likely to have a follow up visit than adults or disabled. Um, clearly there is still a, um, a gap in performance. Um, seven day follow-up mean was 37, I mean 35.7% um, and the lowest state at 19 and the highest at 52.7. Um, So still clearly a gap. Thoughts, uh, comments? Yeah. So no other committee members uh, have anything they want to say at this time. Well, maybe we vote on this then. Okay, uh, I'll just pause for a couple more seconds while I pull that up. Is there any other comments? All right. Voting is now open for measure 3312 on performance gap. Your options are high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Uh, voting is now closed on measure 3312 on performance gap. We have six votes for high, 10 votes for moderate, zero votes for low, and zero votes for insufficient. Therefore, the measure passes on performance gap. Okay, the next section is scientific acceptability, and the first part of which is uh, reliability. So, Brooke, what are you going to tell us? Uh, for reliability, um, it got ranked fairly high, or it got ranked high, rather, I should say, for preliminary. Um, they are looking at the average signal to noise, and those came across basically 0 0.991 across the different states. Um, one should, I will say that there were only, I believe it was, um, a few, there's only a, um, several states that they tested this on. I believe I'm trying to find the exact number. Um, I remember reading it and now I forgot it. But again, the um, signal to noise is fairly good um, in terms of reliability. And I think for our telehealth, that's going to go into validity, correct? Um, I don't think I'm, uh, someone else is probably better qualified to respond than me. I was going to ask whether the specification comes under reliability, which would be um, about the uh, telehealth issue, um, but it could also be validity. I don't care where we discuss it. 
Yeah, because I think um, perhaps. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, specifications should be discussed under reliability. Sorry. Continue. Under reliability. Okay. Um, then we... obviously the telehealth um, issue, along with potentially even um, the bridge appointment issue. Um, they felt that probably for the day, those appointments seen the day of discharge may not be easily captured in Medicaid data. If people have thoughts, I certainly have thoughts on telehealth that it should definitely be captured as especially in substance abuse. That is probably with the pandemic. Yeah, I completely agree about the substance abuse, uh, the telehealth comment. I think it should should be captured. Um, I mean, I think given today's environment uh, that not including telehealth for many of our measures is a real um, problem and uh, one that uh, almost, uh, to me, makes it a fatal uh, flaw. But um, it would be interesting if the developer had data uh, about uh, this issue, uh, because if only 2% for argument's sake of uh, follow-ups were by telehealth, then you would say, well, okay, I, I guess my anecdotal experience is wrong, uh, but I suspect it's actually quite high. So to bring us back to where we're at, we're talking about that not under this vote, but under an upcoming vote, right? We're factoring I, it. I thought we were talking about specification, if I understand uh, the staff correctly. Yes, so specifications and reliability testing fall under reliability. So the inclusion of telehealth and other factors would fall under specifications and thus can be discussed uh, for this vote. Okay, thank you. Colleen, I yes, I'd love to speak more about the telemedicine uh, inclusion within the technical specifications. So um, I would reiterate a point I made a couple of minutes ago before we started talking about scientific acceptability. Um, the data that were used to perform the analyses that are described in our measure submission form were from 2018. Um, those were the most recently available data at the time when we completed testing. Recently, since our submission, 2019 data have become available, but regardless, there aren't data that are yet available for us to evaluate the impact of telemedicine and uh, asynchronous encounters uh, that we know um, anecdotally and as part of the literature, we've seen um, a significant increase. I would hate for us to test telemedicine visits using data for which the, either the encounters weren't covered or they weren't as prevalent and make um, inappropriate assumptions about the use of telemedicine uh, for the types of encounters that are captured in the measures numerator. Um, that said, it's not something that we have addressed yet in our technical specifications, but we absolutely see it as critical to make to incorporate it in an annual update once the 2020 data are available. And we would do so by relying on evidence we've located from the literature that suggests an increase in telemedicine uh, for all of the encounters we captured in our numerator. So for both alcohol and drug use follow up. And we'd also run that uh, by our project technical expert panel to verify that the changes we make are appropriate. So we do have a plan in place uh, to make the change once we have sufficient data. But as of right now, we're relying on 2018, which just would not reflect the, sub the substantial increase in telemedicine. When do you think you would have sufficient data to factor that in and, and learn what's happening and, and kind of figure out how you sort of move care forward uh, using that data. What, how much time? Sure. So the, the TMSYS data that are available within the TMSYS analytical files that we use for testing um, have about a three year lag. So I would anticipate 2020 data becoming available at some point in early to mid 2023. So it'd be something that we'd be able to address as part of our next annual update that we perform should the measure retain its endorsement. So if this measure retains its endorsement, when would it normally come back and recycle through for a maintenance measure again? Three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. years. Now, I, I guess then maybe this is me speaking uh, out of church, <laughs> whatever. Um, but 
if it, if our committee views this as really important, it's become such a significant part of the follow up. Um, is it would it be possible to say, could you come back in uh, 2023 or 20, you know, sooner, two years instead of three years or something with the data or just give us an update on that? Is that within the bounds? And I don't um, know if staff would reply, but. It's not, it's not a function of the committee to request an early maintenance review. So um, the only reason for a, a, a review at a different time or earlier is if there's some kind of new evidence or unintended consequences as the measure shown that would require an earlier review. Otherwise, we would plan for this to come through in three years um, as scheduled. And I, I just want to point out while I'm talking that there's a few hands up, Michael. I don't know if you have the participant list up to see them, but I saw Alan and then Heidi and then Harold raise their hands. Oh, well, thank you. I only see a little slice at the top. So, Alan, want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, this measure really kind of bothers me. Um, it feels like it's really not capturing reality very well, but I guess that's all we can do sometimes. Um, but, you, you know, just telehealth, obviously a big part, but even, you know, a text message, a phone call, any other kind of contact seems important to be able to capture. Um, and I don't know how to do it in terms of uh, getting data, but um, I, I think that's just missing something. And maybe I kind of feel like there should be a participant, you know, the patient perception of this um, such of this process. But again, I'm not sure how you get that data. But so anyway, I just feel like it's just not really capturing important things. Okay, Heidi. Yeah, I agree with that. And there's actually plenty of literature, including a. Um, a recent article in Psych Services that shows that telehealth use in substance abuse went up 143% between 2020 and 2021. So if there's that much use of telehealth, I don't, I have a problem endorsing this on reliability if we're not capturing the telehealth piece of it. Okay. Harold. So this brings up a much larger issue that we're going to uh, sort of deal with as we go through a number of these measures uh, in terms of how do we treat telehealth visits. Um, and I think, you know, it, uh, you know, the, the, the world has changed and even though the data come from, you know, prior time, um, we, we still need to th realize that, you know, telehealth is, is, you know, as was just described has gone up an enormous amount. Um, it's become in many ways almost more of a standard than face to face. Uh, and so um, I guess it's going to be a challenge for evaluating all of the uh, all of the measures that involve some kind of uh, measure of outpatient claims or, or you know, using outpatient claims. And I, I think there needs to be some kind of discussion about that at, at a broad level in terms of how we want to deal with that should you know because basically about the issue is does it get included or does it not get included um and to look at you know what does the data show about the relative impact of face-to-face -face versus tele you know as, as alan was saying face-to-face -face versus telephone versus telephone with you know video versus text messages um you know that needs to be clarified as we sort of go through all of these in terms of what's the evidence base for these things um And I see Heidi's hand up and Jeff Sussman. Let me just also say that, and, and that may differ based upon what's being measured. Right, and I, I actually, I agree with that, but this is, this measure is measuring does an appointment occur? And I think telehealth counts as an appointment occurring. It It doesn't measure quality regardless of how the appointment was given or received. So I think for process measures that just measure whether or not something occurs, telehealth should definitely be included. It, but it sounds like at present it is not included. Correct. Okay. 
we have other hands up. I see Jeff's um, hand. Jeff. Thank you. Um, I sympathize very much with the developer and I understand the conundrum they're in. But I don't believe that our developers, the way we assess measures, should be hidebound to data that are available. Uh, so, in this case, going back to 1819, uh, and that we need to be adaptable and nimble in responding to what is clearly a changed environment, which, uh, in, particularly in this case, I think there is an evidence basis for including telehealth and other forms of follow up. Uh, and therefore, if that isn't being considered by our developers, one of the things staff could certainly do to help us uh, down the line is to say, look, we understand you may not have data on this because in 19, for argument's sake, there really wasn't that much uptake. But given today, you need to really think through your specification and if there are newer data available or a new basis of evidence, that that needs to be included. So I don't favor giving developers an out, even though I, I believe some variation of this measure is very useful and important, uh, but I just don't believe it reflects a reality of what the evidence would uh, support today. Thank you. Um, okay. I think, you know, how do I want to say this? Everybody that's commented is sort of saying this is really crucial data. Times have changed so rapidly with the pandemic and how visits and care is delivered. Does anybody have uh, any contrary or other opinions besides piling on? <laughs> you know, other concerns. I just have a, so what um, Jeff, you said is, so a measure could proceed based upon opinion and judgment and so forth, um, kind of phase validity without necessarily having data, that wouldn't mean you still can't develop a measure in that direction. So yeah, and I think there is evidence out there about the uptake yeah. of telehealth uh, and other means of follow-up in uh, alcohol and drug abuse, and that um, there is um, a basis for evidence actually uh, in the effectiveness, and it would vary according to condition and so on. Uh, but that wasn't presented, and by not including it, I think that's a fatal flaw, personally. But okay. Uh, David I, uh, oh, I sorry, you see oh. hands. Okay. Uh, David Pating, I have just two questions. One, uh, this is billing code and CPT codes. Is that correct? And it's MA data, I think. MA data. Okay. So if I may correct way. that, so so uh, so it's uh, Medicare, or excuse me, Medicaid, both fee for service and managed care, and there are a breadth of different code types, including ICD-10, CPT, HICPIC, and rev and revenue codes. Um, the second thing is, we can't be the first committee that's addressing this issue. How this NQS staff, how has the the, the other committees or measures been brought forward? Diabetes care, other post hospital care. What has been the general consensus on an approach? Has there been provisional approvals, one-year approvals? I mean, what is the what are the tools that we have? Um, maybe the NQF staff could could speak to that. So, um, a, a couple things in response to that. The first is I'll clarify um, what I said earlier about the reg regularly scheduled review. So, the developer has mentioned that. They plan to do annual updates on the measure, and if there is a change in the specifications and they add in um, some additional data sources or some um, additional um, information, then that could trigger an early review. So there are ways to have an earlier review of this measure than um, the regularly scheduled maintenance um, and uh, a change in specifications is something that could um, lead to that. Um, Outside of that, I'll just say this obviously is an issue that's touching on a lot of different measures, but um, it's, it's important to evaluate this measure by itself. Um, 
with this committee. So we're, um, we encourage you not to rely on what other measures and other committees have decided on this, but to have this discussion focused on um, the implications of the measure before you. So it would only come forward if there's a change in specifications, but I think we're trying to assure that there would be consideration and a possible change. So if they, there is a difference, but the developer decides not to change the specifications for whatever reason, you would not have a bite at the apple for another three years. Um, and that raises a question in my mind. I think Colleen, this is for you. Um, you said you had one particular data source, and I don't, it was some technical thing. I, don't, I didn't write it down. I don't remember it. But um, what I'm hearing from the committee is there are articles, there are other things coming up with the, the how much increased utilization and the effectiveness of it for various telehealth things. And you even mentioned asynchronous kind of um, computer kind of uh, interactions. Could you speak a little bit more to that and what your possibilities or flexibilities are to uh, either get more rapid data sources? or uh, what your plans are or might be to sort of like get the data sooner than three years, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so Michael, I think that that's a good question. Um, we acknowledge that, you know, when the pandemic started, everyone's lives changed and that things are very different today than they were in January of 2020. Uh, we, our process is to first identify evidence within the literature or feedback that we receive from stakeholders, and those could be members of the public, members of our technical expert panel, which represents a breadth of different experiences for users of the measures, so Medicaid participants, caregivers, state members, plan members, et cetera. And so all of that is reviewed before uh, evidence is tested quantitatively. Um, we are constrained in the data that we have available. So the, the TMSYS data, so the transformed Medicaid um, information system data um, are, um, you know, there's a process from when the claims are adjudicated at the state level until they appear in the virtual desktop that we use to analyze results. So there's just like, that's just <laughs> the way it is. We can't get data any sooner than they are available from the states. That said, this is certainly an item that we've identified in the literature. So we agree with everything that has been said that if we were testing the measure using 2020, 2021, 2022 data, there would be an entirely different set of codes that we could capture in our value sets, um, but to align the code list with the claims that were available, with the codes that were available and the claims that were available in 2018, there just wasn't prevalence of asynchronous communication among clinicians and participants of telemedicine. Those just didn't exist in the same way. And so we absolutely acknowledge that substance use management um, has had a precipitous increase in all a variety of ways that, that individuals are treated, um, but those data just aren't available to us yet. And we do know that quantitative assessment of reliability and validity is something that N NQF, um, I don't want to say required, strongly, strongly encourages. Um, we have, we do assessments of face validity using members of our technical expert panel, um, but we know that the quantitative rigor that's assessed using our beta binomial analysis and our convergent validity assessments kind of trumps the, um, qu the qualitative assessment. I hope that answered your question. If not, I can continue speaking. I have a, uh, this is Bitka Eisen. I have a question, um, yeah, point of clarification. Telehealth visits, um, I just want to understand, telehealth visits are excluded, were excluded because they didn't have a, a code attached to it, or they did have a code, but you didn't include it in the um, in your analysis. It's the latter. So um, we maintain value sets that are revised annually to align with changes in terminologies as well as ev changes in evidence. And so telemedicine codes do exist, uh, and uh, they just were ignored essentially from the specifications. You know, that said, if a modifier were used on a CPT or a HICPIC code to reflect that a discussion occurred uh, via tele, like via a phone call or um, a video visit, we don't capture it, but that could have happened if the outpatient encounter was modified to document telemedicine. We do not include the explicit codes to capture synchronous or asynchronous management of an individual outside of the office setting. Um, do, do you have to wait three years to start including it? No, um, so we perform updates annually. And so I anticipate, first of all, with the, um, 
very strong, <laughs> very direct comments that we received thus far. I anticipate this being a discussion that I will initiate with our CMS course this afternoon. Um, so certainly conversations will begin um, quickly, but you know, our our process is to update the specifications um, annually. And if there's an if we have the ability to make revisions sooner, then obviously we'll do that. That's something that I cannot decide. So if you had that discussion and started including uh, the CPT telemedicine codes um, in your analysis of existing data as it becomes available going forward, um, this might be to you and it might be to the NQF staff. Would that trigger an earlier review? So we, we, would, we would then start seeing telehealth codes included potentially a year from now? Or... Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, and I also want to offer some clarity on what our options are uh, for this measure if you, you know, chose to um, keep its endorsement. So um, annual update is definitely a, a trigger for this. So uh, the developer, you know, has stated that they plan to look into this and update it and put in the annual update. Uh, if they were to add telem tele telemedicine, that would be considered a specification change and most likely would uh, trigger the measure coming back for an early maintenance review, specifically on that area. So we would focus solely on uh, the additional work that's been done on telemedicine. Along with that, uh, we while you can't require that they come back once that's done, we can definitely emphasize it in the report. And then there is a mechanism for all public members, standing committee or not, to request an early maintenance review of a measure because there is you know, new evidence or that there is new data available that they feel uh, should be implemented to change that measure. Um, uh, I think also it is fair to say that without the data, they wouldn't be able to do the testing and then we would have given them an insufficient on their uh, form uh, if we did not actually see the data to um, enforce the specifications that they have provided. Um, but there are multiple options uh, for the standing committee and the developer if you you know choose to move forward with endorsement that we could um, you know use to make sure that the measure is reevaluated. Okay, other comments, questions, concerns? I will say I wonder if the exclusion of telehealth has affected the gap measures, because I come from New Mexico and the MCOs have been um, almost incentivized, oh, that's probably not the right word, to increase use of telehealth since 2015. And so I wonder if that may not have contributed a little bit to a gap measure, which obviously we're going backwards without my comment, but I felt a need to say it. Thank you. You know, and I, I'm also aware that um, um, not Medicare, but for MA, which is what we're talking about here, um, and for some private insurances, you know, there was this emergency situation and telehealth got paid for at par by everyone, you know, and now on a state by state and health plan by health plan kind of thing as, a, as the emergency ends or ended, um, does telehealth still get covered? Does it get covered at par or a different, uh, at a different uh, payment rate, which would affect utilization? It's, it's gonna be a rocky road <laughs> of how, what, what our data is gonna consist of almost state by state, I think, um, that we can't control. Um, now, I was notified a little bit ago that we, we may have lost our quorum very temporarily. Um, I don't know what the latest is because it feels like we're getting close to voting on this and I don't know if we have our quorum back yet or not. Could the staff give us a, an update? I, so, uh, oh, sorry. You just have Michael. Discussion. Yeah. Hey, Alan, go first. Yeah, just given uh, that reality you described um, and the kind of uh, chaos right now with respect to telehealth services, doesn't that make it even more important that a measure, ex you know, would include that in some form? Great point. Has his hand up. I had my hand raised. I just wanted to say that 
you know, there are other data sets that, that could answer some of these questions, even though it may not be directly on point to the MA data. Um, but it would, you know, represent a way of sort of looking at that. I'm not sure why some of those other data sets weren't examined. Um, you know, it, it's not, it may not necessarily be uh, essential to wait three years to get the data. And Jeff, it looks like your hand is up too. Now that I'm trying to scroll other yeah. screens. Thank you. Um, I was just going to add on to Harold's comment that um, when Poonam said it, we'd rate it as insufficient uh, because there wasn't that data within um, the Medicaid set. Um, my my sense is the committee would make a informed decision if there were data included from another uh, representative database that said, for argument's sake, telehealth comprised 20% of follow-up visits for alcohol and substance abuse, and that would be directly relevant to the question. Um, the capture of the data um, from the 19 or so um, data, um, I don't think uh, speaks to the reality of today, and we've already talked about that. Thank you. You know, and I've read at least three or four articles talking about how the utilization of uh, telemedicine uh, has been higher and remains higher for behavioral health patients than medical patients. So, to some extent, what other NQF committees may or may not have done, it's probably less pivotal for them and core than it is for us. Yeah, actually, some colleagues of mine and myself published that data. Well, good work then, Harold. <laughs> Thank you for your service. So my question to again the NQF staff would be uh, David Pitting, um, what if if we don't uh, if we find this insufficient reliability, I think the measure fails renewal. And if that happens, what's the process? Does the measure it just means that it's it's uh, uncertified by NQF and could still be out there? I mean, I, I would hate to kind of have the whole machine change. I think we're just asking for an updated data and a reevaluation. So, what's the impact down the road from us making a this decision on reliability that might not be favorable or validity? I think it's actually validity the question for me, but it could be both. Uh, so, if we were to vote the measure low or insufficient. Um, or both. <laughs> um, if uh, greater than 60% of the committee voted down the measure, it wouldn't lose endorsement. Um, while endorsement does impact, uh, you know, different uh, providers using the measure, it, does, uh, it doesn't have a, a stronghold, right? So CMS or a health plan or um, someone trying to do quality improvement, they could still use the measure uh, without endorsement. It's more of a um, if a measure has been endorsed, it's saying that, you know, this group of consensus uh, building body has said that this measure is good and should be used. So, um, it would lose endorsement if we voted that way, um, but it's difficult to know what the impact on actual use would be. And if I can speak to that. So, uh, it's my understanding that CMS would retain the measure within its portfolio. So. It would not go to the uh, the graveyard, um, but endorsement does help uh, users of quality measures see what's out there. And so I would worry that because this measure does fill a niche for uh, Medicaid uh, participants, that some of the um, some of the uptake for states and managed care plans may decrease should the endorsement be lost. But the CMS would retain the measure in its Medicaid portfolio. I would assume that you could uh, reapply uh, for the measure with a renewed specification. We could. It is. This is a tremendously labor-intensive process, um, so that would be a decision that CMS would need to make based on the cost of us doing so. I can't say if it would happen yeah. or not. Of course. Thank you. Could, could someone uh, uh, in the NQF staff sort of just remind us of, of, of how this would play out? I mean. 
there's pass, is there a provisional, is there a pass, but combat, you know, what are the, what are the, our exact options? I know we always talk about that at the very end and we all sort of have some idea, but uh, there, what's the closest to a niche of what we seem to be asking for? <laughs> Keep using it, but review it sooner, you know? It seems to be what I, I feel like is, it sounds like a consensus. Or approve with caution or something like that, because it's public, uh, it's used for public reporting, right? If you're gonna report it, just put an asterisk by it or something. You know? I feel like we're uh, Ronald Reagan trust, but verify now. Well, uh, we uh, definitely will put a, you know, document this conversation in the draft report. So we will notate that, you know, again, if the measure passes um, and it continues endorsement, uh, we would be documenting that the standing committee would like this measure to come back as soon as possible with um, the data uh, on telehealth uh, to and to basically see it incorporated. So we would highlight that in the draft report. Um, other than a strong recommendation, unfortunately, there is no diff there is no middle ground uh, other than uh, endorsement and no endorsement. Um, so that would be um, the two options. Uh, if the measure passes again, you know, the developer can put in an annual update, which could trigger another review. Um, you know, standing committee members and the public um, uh, can, you know, as public members request an early maintenance review based off of uh, either uh, new evidence or new specification changes that they think are important. Um, so that's a trigger that's available to all public members. Um, we just can't require it through this process. Um, so that's if it was uh, endorsed. Um, if it is not endorsed, uh, it would lose endorsement. Um, and at that point, it would really be up to the developer if they wish to bring the measure back in, in the future with those changes or not. Does that answer your question, Michael? I think so, yeah. Is it, is it clear in other committee members what our options are, what the consequences uh, would be? I see a one thumbs up in the in the four people I can see. <laughs> I can't see others. And Michael, this is Tammy. I just want to jump in. There there is a chat from Harold um, about asking that uh, agreeing that something was more of a validity issue. I just want to point out: is there any clarification needed around the comments? relating to that chat. Um, and then the developer has her hand raised after that. Okay. So the, the comment was, I see both and staff, I see both and staff thought it fit under reliability as well. Hence the discussion now, is that what you're talking about? I think that was in response to Harold's earlier comment. So I just want to make sure that um, people saw it. everyone yeah, was clear. I, I, I guess I, I think it's both a reliability and validity issue, but more a validity issue, but. Yeah, you, you, it would be okay. relevant to both votes. Okay, and then the developer wanted to make a comment. Go for yeah, it. I'll, I'll just know our core um, has been messaging me uh, asynchronously, uh, and <laughs> she let me know that the um, 2020 data are available preliminarily within the t the TMSIS analytical files. Again, these data were released after we submitted the materials. Our testing occurred in the fall of last year, so it takes time to get the data um, analyzed. And so, again, I just wanted to reiterate that we have heard everything that has been said today. Um, we absolutely agree that telemedicine, asynchronous management of individuals um, are, it's incredibly important that that gets incorporated. And um, I'm going to work offline, as I indicated, starting today to do what I can to get this addressed. Um, obviously, if you need to, um, you're, you should vote on what you have in your discussion, but I'm just acknowledging that we are going to work on getting it incorporated as soon as possible. Okay. Um, and, and potentially that might change the specifications based upon your analysis. Potentially, yes. Well, the new data element would automatically trigger it, wouldn't it? If we, when we start including those codes, when you they start. So it. choose. That is right, Jeff. Uh, if they do the analysis and then decide to make updates to the measure, that would be triggering an annual update review. Um, if, uh, 
you know, they do the analysis and decide that it cannot be reliably and validly, validly added, uh, then that wouldn't necessarily show up in the annual update and come to us. Uh, I didn't understand what you just said. Could you say it in other oh, words? Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, if the developer does uh, the analysis of the data and determines that an update uh, is appropriate, aka to include telemedicine based off of that data, that would go into an up annual update and thus trigger, um, you know, the review of that measure. If uh, they do the data analysis and then determine that the data is not strong enough for the measure to be updated. Um, they that would not trigger, they wouldn't update their measure basically through an annual update and that would not trigger a re-review uh, through the annual update process. So you're basically saying it's their choice whether they think it's important enough to do or significant enough to do. So we, we underscore the importance of it. Certainly, I, I cannot state more strongly that we understand that telemedicine, asynchronous communication, alternative forms of management of alcohol individuals who have seek treatment for alcohol or drug use is critical. Um, I think the point that Poonam is making, and I agree, is our testing results help drive decision making. And so that's why, you know, if we were to use the 2018 or 2019 data to evaluate incorporation of telemedicine, um, as an example, if it were only 2% of our cases, those data would suggest we may not need to add it. But again, we underscore the importance, and that's why we're hoping that the, even the preliminary 2020 data suggests the substantial increase in telemedicine and other forms of uh, management outside of the office setting would have sufficient volume to necessitate a change to the specifications, which would then be submitted to NQF, and it may be sufficiently substantive to have you all review the measure again. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, I know we're kind of teetering on the edge of a quorum or not. Um, where are we at? Uh, um, you know, NQF staff, do, do we have a quorum? Are we one short? Where are we at right now? We are currently one short of quorum. Caroline messaged us that she had to step away uh, for an hour. She'll be back at 11. Um, we do expect um, Michael Lardieri to join any minute. He said he would be able to join around 1030. Um, so we've been watching for him. So um, I can lay out a, a couple options here. One is we could pause for a couple, it's 1032 by my watch, so we could pause for a couple minutes to see if he joins. Um, we'd want to confirm that he has reviewed the measure and feels comfortable voting at that point, but, and then we could proceed with live voting. Um, we could take an early break if, and, and take a 10 minute break um, and then reconvene. And if we have quorum, proceed with voting and discussion. Um, and then the third option is if we just proceed now, we don't have quorum, so we would actually cease live voting for the remainder of the meeting. So we would continue discussing all the measures, um, but we would follow up with a survey offline following the meeting um, for you to submit your votes. Um, it strikes it strikes me, but maybe others could give reactions too. That taking ten minutes seems like the most practical thing to do right now. Uh, do others agree with that, or am I just being idiosyncratic to, to think that? Could people like do thumbs up or something to just give us a sense. I got to go at 1045 uh, or maybe 1050. I'll be back uh, 75 minutes later. So just might be kind of tight timing. Yeah, I have to drop at 11 too. Okay. For an hour. So we will, it looks like we'll be right on the edge all day. Um, we could take a five minute break. Okay, let's that do way five. I think everyone here can return. We'll reconvene at 1038. We'll try and get a live vote in at 1038. And if not, um, we'll proceed with our discussion and, and vote offline. Um, we're reaching out to all your fellow committee members who we haven't heard a, a no RSVP from to urge them to join. So hopefully someone else will surprise us as well. Um, okay, thank you. We'll reconvene in five minutes, 1038.
Okay, it's 1038 by my watch. Hopefully everyone had a nice breather. Um, and we didn't lose anyone. Um, see if Michael and Harold, our co-chairs, are back on the line. Um, I'm back. Me too. Okay, great. Um, so, unfortunately, our numbers have not changed in that interim, um, but it does sound like this is a number, a quorum number we're going to be flirting with all day. So, it probably makes sense to, um, to assume this is where we're going to sit um, for the rest of the day. So we will proceed with discussion on all criteria for all measures today, but we will follow up with a survey monkey link to the standing committee afterwards for you to submit your votes. So, especially given that this is the 1st of 7 measures, I highly recommend you write down where you would have voted, how you would have voted um, after each discussion so that you don't have to re listen to a day's worth of recording. Um, but you're welcome to, of course, if you haven't made up your mind um, at that point. Um, and we will be providing the recording along with the voting survey for anyone who um, who isn't present at the meeting or who needs to really re-listen to make their decision on their vote. You know, that, if we're going to consider this uh, to be efficient or try to make it efficient for those of us that are actually participating and going through this, maybe you could we could go through the the um, uh, actions of showing the details of the vote, what our vote options are. We could check it off for ourselves and just go through it later, as opposed to having looking up, you know, is it yes or no? Is it, is it high? You know, is it strong? Is it medium, you know, moderate? It would simplify it for those of us putting the time in today. I think that's a great idea. You, you'll know what your voting options are and it'll kind of bookmark our conversation along the way. So we'll do that after each discussion. If you want to mention that this is when we would vote, we'll put up the slide so that everyone can see your options. And, and I think. Oh, I was just going to say, Tammy, is it an option to capture the votes of those of us who are here? And then just add the votes uh, of people who are then um, queried uh, asynchronously. Unfortunately, it is not um, the voting platform that we use. Um, is different for for live versus offline voting and so um we we will have to set up the offline poll and send it to you in order to have those captured and to ensure that um we have a quorum number and that um, no one has been double counted between the different polling services my, my other concern is that you know are we going to have the same discussion around every measure that has uh, involves outpatient claims. Thanks, Harold, for bringing that up. I was just trying to chat your response, but I couldn't type fast enough. Um, it It is definitely something that if it's a concern for multiple measures today, should be brought up and should be discussed. But I think as you measure discussion, if you're, you can all know if this is kind of the same issue the committee has discussed and see whether there's any new insights or new discussion applicable to the current measure that needs to be added to the discussion. It, it's ironic because uh, Harold texted me too. And what I texted back was, if we consider our, for our vote as a precedent, we could just maybe just follow that precedent, but we're not going to get the vote in to do it. Right. <laughs> right. That, that, that would have been a helpful precedent to use, but I think use, use your and then um, I think it's fair to say, you know, we've had a similar discussion about another measure. Um, let's talk about whether these items apply or if there's something new to bring to this discussion that we feel like um, needs to be added right now. Tammy, uh, I, I wonder if you and your team can take a strong message back to uh, the powers that be that having some other options at our disposal might have made this process a lot more straightforward. So if we could say, oh, but we need to see you back in a year because of this changing environment, uh, I might be inclined to uh, let them pass for a year. Uh, but given the uncertainty that has been um, as part of the process currently, we don't have any real option except yes and no. 
up and down. At least that's my my feeling. And thank you, Jeff, for that feedback. We will definitely take it back. Uh, we, you know, we're constantly looking to see how we can better improve our process. Um, so we will uh, definitely take it back and, and consider uh, what those options could be, and you know how we could implement them in in a um, uh, you know an appropriate way. So thank you for that feedback. You know, bear in mind that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It could be one element we're looking at, so that the. The develop, you know, that it's less work for the developers. It's less work for the NQF staff and for us if it's a, a limited uh, slice. It would also be important to, uh, and I don't know whether the, what the mechanism would be for NQF to get the word out to measure developers that this has become an increasingly important issue and needs to be addressed, and it's especially relevant in behavioral health. Thank you. We. Uh, we do have a couple of mechanisms for communicating with our developers, so I'll definitely take it back to that team that maybe this is something that we could uh, focus on in the uh, upcoming webinar. So, in terms of where we're at now, could you at least just show us what we would have voted on and we could write down what we would have done for this Absolutely. and go to the next element? Can we also do a practice? Would it help to, or is it possible to do a practice vote? that? I think it's not necessary because the platform that will collect your votes on afterwards is different. So it's not, it's no longer needed for you to log in. We'll put up on the screen what your options are. Because there's no way for you to record and see your own votes later on this platform. You're not able to save your own votes, unfortunately. Um, what Hannah, what about the Beatles? Slide? <laughs> you can record that one if you want also. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. Yeah, um, I'm displaying the slide, I think, in a way that looks easiest to read. Um, but this is the question regarding reliability for measure 3312. Uh, your options would be high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Is a low a not pass or only if it's D insufficient? Low and insufficient both result in not passing. High and moderate are passing votes. So if we're not voting, do we just continue to review the rest of the measure? Is that the next step? Yes, yeah, so and now we would proceed to the validity discussion. Okay, I think that means we're back to a uh work again, right? Hi there, yes. So validity, um, again, it got voted as a preliminary rating moderate. I think even particular to the discussion we just had, there was note of the developer that some state specific codes were not able to be captured. Um, and again, I think you're going to be seeing this again with, the t you know, that almost sort of adds the ball of wax of the tele um, health discussion, um, they sort of discussed again how basically the seven fourteen days um, did fall in line with each other, and that was sort of the main thing for validity. Does anybody have anything else to add or things that I have missing? So open for discussion. What were they using as a measure for for uh, for validity? Um, in terms of the validity, um, they examined the correlations basically between the seven and fourteen days was the main thing that they looked at for validity, and then they also did it with a thirty day. So, but did did they look at yeah you know, whether it predicted any kind of outcome? I did not see the outcome data. 
The outcome, I think, um, was mainly within their evidence. Maybe we could just ask the developer directly here. Yes. Um, so that <laughs> there you go. Was uh, there a correlation with readmissions, you know, um, uh, death, whatever it might be, re you know, relapse? We did not perform any sort of assessment looking at outcomes for participants that are included in the measure that we did perform convergent validity for the two rates that are captured in the measure. So the seven versus the 14 days. And as was indicated, we also compared the measure to a HEDIS measure um, that evaluates seven and 30 day follow up after alcohol and other drug abuse. So it's both internally correlated and externally correlated with a similar measure, but we did not have data available to look at outcomes. Um, and then uh, I recall that during the last time we talked about this, this is not necessarily Colleen for you as for other folks to comment on. Um, but um, we talked about what's the impact of uh, those people uh, using kind of depot medications uh, that would last 30 days. And how does that play out with this measure? Are there depot medications for substance use? My reading of it was that all pharmacology was captured, but I'll let the developer talk to that. That's correct. Yeah. So within the, the arm for pharmacotherapy, we captured that. I think the concerns were if you're coming in once a month to get the uh, sub Q kind of. Uh, Naloxone uh, medication, what does that do to 14 day rates or seven day rates versus 30 day rates? You know? So, evidence within the literature and feedback we've received from our technical expert panel suggested that having a seven day follow up is kind of the standard of care, but we allowed for the flexibility of 14 days in case. You know, there's always reasons why seven days won't work. Um, we do allow for, there was a question earlier about um, the uh, encounters that occur on the day of diagnosis. And so for pharmacotherapy, it can occur on the same day as discharge from the medically managed withdrawal program. So an individual could have received treatment as you describe on the day that they were discharged. And if they receive it every 30 days, that would be captured in, um, in the numerator. I, I see that Michael has joined us. Does that change the uh, situation? Unfortunately, we've lost Alan, so we're still at 15. Oh. Okay. All right, joining late, folks. Well, welcome. And, and um, Mike, since we're in a, a pause, would you mind introducing yourself and stating if you have anything to disclose today? Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Lardieri. I'm a uh, senior VP for strategy at Core Solutions, and I don't have anything to disclose. Okay, other other comments about validity or should we if there aren't maybe we should see the voting screen so we can write down how we will vote later. Um, and an update for Mike, we are one short of quorum, so we'll be voting offline following the meeting. So after each discussion, we'll put up the votes you know, the options, but um, we're just asking everyone to please write down how you would have voted. Um, so that it's easier for you later, but we will also send the recording when we send the offline voting survey for any discussions that anyone may have missed. And in which measure are we doing right now? It's still the first one. one. Yep, the first one, 3312. Continuity of care after medically managed withdrawal for alcohol and drugs for MA. Okay, so I've put up the, the voting question for validity and your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. So has everyone had enough time to sort of write down what they're gonna do and should we go on to Brooke talking about feasibility?
All right, for feasibility, um, obviously this is a maintenance measure. It has been being, it is being, or has been done. Um, feasibility is generally ranked as high. And that's from memory because I lost connection on being able to open this word document, but for memory, if that's comments. Open discussion. I'm not hearing any discussion and I, of course, I can't see all the hands raised or whether anything's raised. If, if, if anybody has something to say, just say it now and don't wait for us to notice your hand is raised. And maybe, maybe you could then show us uh, our options for voting then. Okay. Uh, so for measure 3312, um, for feasibility, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay, then our next section is usability and use. Um, again, usability, um, people believe that this is an important measure, especially um, with. Sorry, if I can chime in, we should start with use and then do usability. Because we want to do them separate. Oh, I'm sorry. So use first, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, use again, pretty much sort of the same comments, um, especially with pandemic. Um, there is obviously research coming out of increased issues with substance use disorder um, with pandemic. Um, this is can provide um, good information, both in terms of gaps and as a quality measure as a whole. And further discussion. Once again, just speak up. Don't wait to be noticed. Hearing that, maybe you could show us what it would look like for our vote. I think it's just passed or not, right? That's correct. Well, okay. Um, so here's the question for measure 3312 for use. Um, your options are again pass and no pass. Okay, and then uh, we need to talk about usability separately. So, Brooke, take us away, take it away. All right, usability, um, again, this provides sort of an important measure that would be um, obviously a lot of times publicly disclosed. Um, there is obviously, you know, difference between states. Um, and can provide direction in terms of how folks are doing in terms of follow up. Um, again, important, um, especially in becoming more important, especially with COVID 19. I believe there was a comment in there about that. Um, again, some comments with a seven or 14 days, with some preference towards a 14 day. Um, how many states are using this currently? Maybe that's, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, it's so we make uh, CMS makes this measure available for use at the state level. It's not something that is it's. So I had to relearn everything. I've been in the Medicare space for 10 years and I joined Medicaid a couple of years ago. It's totally different. There's not a regulatory process to implement it into a program like a hospital or an accountable care organization. Instead, for Medicaid measures, the specifications are released and states make choices on the types of things that they want to measure. So there's no 
there aren't any data that are available to us or to CMS that say, you know, X amount of states are using the measure. Um, instead, we were able to derive rates based on the data that are available to CMS through the TAMS's analytical file, like I described earlier. I wish I had an answer for you. Okay, so really, it's, you don't know. No, there was, I don't. Was a, there was some sort of pilot study, right, that had X number of states. Yeah, so our, our now the numbers that you see in here, the nine states are the nine states for which the TMSIS analytical file data were the strongest. Um, there's a document called the DQ Atlas that is released that evaluates the quality of the data. And so those nine states reflect um, states for which all data elements in the measure were ranked as high quality. We wouldn't want to analyze states for which if there were like a, a problem with their uh, it, you know, their hospitalization data, we wouldn't want it included in the analysis because that could mean we'd make um, misinterpretations of their results. So the, the data that you see are from the nine states that we analyzed. Okay. Um, and then that, that pilot study sort of ended, right? Yes. So um, the Medicaid uh, Innovation Accelerator Program it's, I would call, I would call it like in hibernation. Um, it still exists. It's not something that is um, active, um, but our famous core emphasized to me yesterday that it is still around. It just isn't um, like actively managed in a way that you would see in a Medicare program, like a something, um, there's no corollary like a Medicare program. So when I read this stuff, mm -hmm. um, which was probably like a week and a half ago, or two weeks ago, I don't remember when, um, but, um, Part of me said, okay, the pilot stuff ended, and at least the way it was listed when I looked through some of the stuff, there wasn't any current data. Uh, we don't know how many states, at least. But if it's really truly a measure and nobody's using it, I would have one opinion on it. If it seems like some states are using it, you just can't tell how many, um, uh, it would be a different scenario. Which scenario is it? So I would say it's the latter. So we don't, we're unable to quantify use. We do, however, have an email address where we receive questions and we do get questions about the technical specifications. So we know the measures are in use, but we just have no vehicle to like track consistently, uh, consistent use of the measures, um, either, you know, managed care plans or states, but we do get questions about them. So we know indirectly that they are being used. So um, if I would ask you just roughly quantitatively, if you have five people using it as one scenario, if you have 40 million, it's another scenario. Sure. What's in your database? Um, so it's at the state level, so it is not 5 million. It could be no more than 55. Um, oh, times 50 territory. states. <laughs> yeah, 50 states and the territories in DC. Um, I would say it's on the lower end um, just because states have such a breadth of measures and things they could evaluate, but obviously limited resources. So it's not like we get questions about this every day, but we do get questions every month. Um, so I'd say it's on the lower side, but not 40 million, but probably also not five, somewhere in between. And especially, um, I think just circling back to some of the comments that were made earlier about the precipitous increase in the need for support for behavioral health diagnoses and substance use conditions generally um, during the pandemic, we anticipate higher uptake as the data from the COVID-19 pandemic become available. We anticipate more users just because there's been, just been such an emphasis on um, decreasing uh, substance use disorders and then our next measure behavioral health diagnoses. Okay. Other people have questions or concerns? I, I guess I just have a question about use. How, how are states using this measure versus the other measures that track, you know, uh, an appointment when you're discharged from inpatient or rehab? It would seem that if you're inpatient and rehab, you may have had withdrawal services, so they would be covered in that. So how are they using this one versus the other one? So, Michael, I think that's a good question. It's something that we haven't been able to explore because we don't know the specific users of the measures, but I would say generally, you know, states have um, a finite amount of resources and they, can, they tend to pick and choose the measures that um, address their population most specifically. So if they have a waiver program that focuses on behavioral health and substance use, we would expect them to be more likely to implement the measure to evaluate um, uh, continuity of care for medically managed withdrawal, um, but I can't say definitively on how they're making the decision between another measure that evaluates some sort of um, continuity of care for behavioral health and substance use and NQF three through one two. Okay. 
Because I would think they might use the other measure and just stratify by diagnosis for this, you know, but still use the other measure and not add another measure, which, you know, we don't want to just continue to add measures. Yeah, understand. I wish I could give you more. I wish I could give everybody more data. I just don't have them available. Other comments, questions, concerns? Okay. And once again, you know, don't raise your, don't bother raising your hand unless we get into a heated discussion, I would say for the rest of the day. Um, uh, so you want to show us how the vote would look, what our options are again? Yes. So for measure 3312 for usability, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay, then um, the last vote, uh, Brooke, is uh, overall suitability for endorsement. And so at this point, if you want to have any more general discussion about the measure, um, you can, but obviously we won't be taking this last vote either. And this last vote would be passed or not passed? Correct. It's a, it's a yes, no vote. It's would a yes, no vote. Any further discussion? Well, I want to thank Brooke for doing a great job, you know, under duress here. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you all. Okay, so then we will move to discussion of our next measure of the day, uh, which is Thane Steward and Developer, and this is 3313. And now I will turn things to Harold to lead our discussion. Okay, so this, uh, uh, my worry is that this may uh, generate a very similar discussion that we just had. Um, but if uh, we could ask, uh, the measure developer to uh, uh, to present the uh, in, in just three to five minutes to present the uh, overview of the measure and um, and our uh, lead discussants are um, Craig and Carolyn Caroline. Uh, thank you, Harold. I'm going to stick with you all for a little bit longer. Um, so, again, my name is Colleen McKernan from the Lewin Group. Now we're going to talk about follow-up care for adult beneficiaries who are newly prescribed an antipsychotic medication, or NQF3313. Um, similar to that measure, uh, we received uh, this one from Mathematica in September of 2019 um, at following a transition um, of the developer. So CMS developed NQF3313 for use in state Medicaid programs with an aim of monitoring medication safety and improving transitions of care for participants who were recently prescribed an antipsychotic for either new use or those who returned to taking antipsychotics after a long break. Participants are eligible for inclusion in the measures denominator if they are at least 18 years of age and they filled a new script for an antipsychotic. Within the numerator, participant monitoring occurs to confirm that an outpatient follow-up visit was completed in the 28 days following prescription with a provider who has prescribing authority to dispense antipsychotics. Individuals newly prescribed an antipsychotic face both benefits and risks when taking the medication. Proactive, timely oversight of new antipsychotic use ensures that the prescribing clinician is aware of any side effects associated with initiation of treatment, including impacts physically, such as newly diagnosed conditions, uh, excuse me, newly diagnosed infections, cardiovascular diseases or metabolic disorders, and effectiveness of treatment. 
Holding follow-up appointments with new antipsychotic medication users in the month following disbursement of medication allows the prescribing clinician to check that the dose is sufficient, confirm that the medication is improving symptoms, ensure that the individual is compliant to the prescribed regimen, and determine if any sequelae have occurred. Findings that support the underlying concept for NQF 3313 have been substantiated within the peer-reviewed literature and clinical practice guidelines. A performance gap for this population still exists, as demonstrated by analyses described in the NQF 3313 measure submission form, suggesting opportunity for states to improve upon follow-up and continuity of care for those using antipsychotics. Similar to the last measure, um, we performed a series of quantitative and qualitative efforts to evaluate the current evidence base, distribution of performance, scientific acceptability, feasibility and usability, and we're here again to answer any questions you may, you may have. Thanks. into discussing, I did have a question that I may have overlooked in the materials presented, but quickly wanted to ask, what's the look back time frame in order to say that this is a new or a reinitiated prescription? So we're using Medicaid claims data and we're look and we see that it's a new prescription um, or I think as you just described, a, a reinitiated prescription, how far is the look back to determine whether it's a reinitiated? That's a great question, Caroline. So it's 120 days. So we have about a, that's four months, right? A four month wash up period. Um, so if an individual didn't fill a prescription using their Medicaid coverage in the 120 days, then they're considered a new user again. Okay, and then what if the new prescription was started in the inpatient setting um, oftentimes folks leave the hospital with a week or something. Um, are we taking the first fill at a pharmacy and in the outpatient setting as the index date? I believe so. I've just asked my um, analyst to confirm that, but I believe that's correct. And then for follow up, it says any provider with prescribing authority. So if an individual leaves uh, a psychiatric visit has been prescribed the antipsychotic and 20 days later sees a primary care doctor, does that visit count even if say the primary care doctor doesn't address it because it says any visit per a claim with someone with prescribing authority? Yes, so I guess that's a limitation of claims data. And so, you know, in an ideal world, the individual the participant who's receiving an antipsychotic would be managed by someone who is acutely aware of the risks and benefits of the medication and can do dose titration accordingly. But we did back into identifying clinicians using NPIs to locate um, the uh, uh, to locate clinicians who see the, the individual within the 28 days. So, Caroline, to your question, if they did see a, another either primary or secondary care provider who was not the prescriber, um, we would count that as follow up. So, in the circumstance again of, say, a Medicaid patient going to a primary appointment at any clinic who may or may not have knowledge that the antipsychotic was prescribed, that visit would still count as a follow up. It would. Um, we uh, have to assume the benefit of the doubt that uh, if an individual is seeing a primary or secondary care clinician, that they are providing the list of medications that they're taking. Um, and so we assume that there would be some sort of evaluation of, of current medication use by a primary care clinician if they followed up with the individual in that 28 day window. So this wouldn't have to be linked to an actual uh, code uh, for some sort of Psychi psychiatric code. They could Correct. We, any type of visit. I come in for an earache. That would count. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, I, it's a limitation of claims. Yeah, Again, yeah. If we were I, able I, yeah. to, you know. Yep. But yes. Is it just to avoid any kind of uh, issues or to maybe anticipate some issues. Um, how are you dealing with uh, telemedicine? <laughs> uh, I knew this was going to come up. Uh, so I did check the value sets as you all were talking about it last time. I checked the value sets for both measures and we do not currently account for telemedicine or asynchronous evaluation uh, within these specifications. Everything you said, it's the same team. So I have uh, 
wrote it all down <laughs> so that feedback is absorbed for both of the measures we're discussing today. It, it, although it, there might be some sort of different issues as it relates to prescribing responsibilities. Sure. And people may want to bring that up just so it's, we have that in the discussion. I'm sorry, Harold, I missed your point. That, th th that there may be some difference between the considerations about this measure because it involves prescribing responsibilities. Uh, exactly. It might be a bit different from the previous measure we talked about. Got it. Yes. So, if people have comments about that, you know, they should bring that up rather than reiterate um, the previous discussion. I have a question. Um, the logic model that that you that you guys presented was, um, you know, um, these folks, both because they're on antipsychotics and because of their diagnoses, tend to have more medical problems, and it's really important to make sure that their follow up is occurring. Yet I noticed that um, in your exclusion criteria, you're excluding anybody who gets admitted to an inpatient unit within 28 days or somebody who dies within the first 28 days. Um, I would think it would be you would learn more and be more knowledgeable to sort of track those and find out what's causing that. You know, um, and part of why I'm saying this is we did a, a, a collaborative in Minnesota where we tried to reduce readmissions statewide and looked at uh, all the readmissions. And we found that there were a number of people that were readmitted to hospitals for uh, medical problems that came up within the first 30 days that we did not do an adequate job of really taking care of and arranging really tight follow up for their medical problems, not psych problems. Um, and it helped us change sort of what we did in terms of before we discharge people's people in the hospital. Uh, but all that would sort of be missing in this sort of how do you learn to improve things kind of approach if you're using this measure. And Michael, building on that, would emergency department visits count? I wasn't clear about that. Uh, so those are both great questions. So thank you for that point, Michael. Um, I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're hoping to capture here in this measure, although I completely agree that it's important for us to understand the full universe of um, medical and, and behavioral issues with, that a person's dealing with in that um, follow-up window. Um, but it's, it feels like it's a little bit out of scope for what we're hoping to address with the quality action in this measure. Caroline, I'm going to open the value sets and double check, but I do not believe we include emergency department encounters, just um, outpatient or home visits. So, um, based on the experience of looking at a lot of claims data across the country, I can tell you at, that at any given time, about 50% of the persons with schizophrenia um, who should be on an antipsychotic are not taking an antipsychotic. And the most common place for those individuals to show up first is in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would say that those individuals, if they haven't filled a script for an antipsychotic, would would not be captured in the measure. And so, again, another problem that I absolutely not think not needs be, to be addressed. Not because they didn't fill a script, but because they had filled a script mm -hmm. and at some point stopped taking it. So the yeah. percent of days covered is under 50%. Understood. Thank you for that. So, and, um, what, what, why don't we um, turn, you know, rather than having direct interactions with uh, the developer, why don't we move to Craig, if you could sort of give your sort of overview. Sure. Um, let's see. So, We'll just do the overview first, the introduction. The measure number is 3313. Um, the description is uh, percentage of new antipsychotic prescriptions for Medicaid beneficiaries aged 18 years and older who have completed a follow up visit with a provider um, with prescribing authority within four weeks or 28 days of prescription of an antipsychotic medication. Uh, the level of analysis is it's a population level uh, uh, measure, and uh, this is a maintenance measure. Uh, it was last endorsed in 2018. 
and it is a process measure. So that's the, uh, the basic introduction to this. Shall we go on to the evidence? Uh, sure. Uh, Caroline, do you have anything to add? I do not. Okay. Yes, let's move on to evidence. Okay, so um, new added evidence since 2016, they added some, um, uh, they did an environmental scan to identify new evidence pertaining to the measure, um, as well as interviews. They did some qualitative interviews with key stakeholders and subject matter experts. Um, uh, the developer states that the guideline, uh, APA guideline from 20, 2004 was replaced with an update in 2020. Um, and that comes from a systematic review that includes 167 blind randomized trials, uh, 465 randomized clinical trials, and 402 randomized placebo control trials, um, you know, for many, many, many decades. Um, and also the recommendation comes from um, 100 and, okay, I think I already covered this. Yeah, so I covered that. So that's, that's their change. So they updated the evidence. Um, in terms of comments on the evidence, it seemed like it was uh, widely uh, supported, except for the comments about um, uh, the hospital, um, the hospitalization data. So that's that's with regards to evidence. Any comments, Caroline? Yes, my um, reading of the comments and looking through the information was that no further vote on the evidence for a need of a measure of this type was necessary. Um, whether or not the measure actually had changed performance uh, was a different question, but the need for the measure was not questioned. Other other comments on evidence? Yeah, I just have a comment, a question, I guess, for the developer. I, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I like to measure the follow-up is important, but when you were doing the extra, uh, the additional, um, uh, information is this not applicable to all populations? I guess why it's just stuck in Medicaid and it hasn't gone to commercial or Medicare. Uh, because Medicaid is the scope for our contract, and so we would be happy to partner with other developers who serve commercial and Medicare clients uh, if they have interest. But Medicare is our scope. So it might be appropriate. We just just didn't do anything because it's not. Part of the scope of the measure. Okay. So, are we any other comments about uh, evidence? Okay. Are we ready to vote on evidence, or at least um, understand what our options are to vote on evidence? <laughs> No further questions. I'll share what the vote would be for measure 3313. Um, so for evidence, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And it would have to be high or moderate to have it move move on, correct? Okay, so are we still, we're still moving ahead with not voting now? Is that the plan? That's correct. Unfortunately, once we lose quorum, we proceed with offline for the remainder of the meeting. Um, but also, even if we regain quorum, based on RSVPs, we, we don't expect to keep it. So this is the smoothest way to proceed. Okay. So why, why don't we move on to discussion of uh, importance? Okay. Caroline, so, 
Is it gaps that we move on to next? I'm sorry. That's correct. Yep, performance gap would be next. Yeah, right. performance. Okay. So um, they did some analysis. Um, again, this is state level data. Um, they looked at 13 states uh, between 2018, Jan January 2018 to um, December 31st, 2018. Um, mean performance rate was 46.72%. Um, standard deviation with, uh, was 6%. Um, the lowest state had a follow-up visit rate of 35.86% of patients newly prescribed an antipsychotic, and the highest rate was uh, only 58.72%. Um, uh, they reported a 25th uh, percentile of 43.62%, median was 45%, and the 75th percentile was 50.60%. Um, in terms of disparities, there's a number of disparities that they reported. In terms of gap, uh, younger patients and those that were older uh, than 75 were less likely to follow up than individuals 35 to 74. Uh, white non-Hispanic and Hispanic patients were more likely to have follow-up visits than black non-Hispanics. Uh, dual eligibles um, patients uh, were more likely to follow up than Medicaid-only patients. And females were more likely to follow up than males. And then there was also some disparity uh, with CHIP patients uh, not following up um, as much as um, adults. So well, it seemed and further oh, I'm comments. Sorry. Oh, no, no further comments from me. Uh, other comments, questions from the, the group. So We're again, on gap should we now, just, right? Any anybody? We're on gap now. Is that correct? Yeah, performance caps. Okay. Any other comments from the group? Okay. Um, what? Um, maybe again, show the options for voting on performance caps. Sure. So for measure thirty three thirteen. Um, for performance graph, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, why don't we um, move on to scientific acceptability? All right, so um, we start with reliability, right? Is that correct? Correct. Assuming. Okay, so they did um, signal to noise ratio using uh, beta binomial uh, models uh, on these 13 states representing a cross section across uh, different US regions. Um, so, and they use that to measure testing uh, Medicaid and Medicare data um, between September of 2017 to December of 2017. Um, the average signal to noise ratio was 0.99 and ranged from 0.97 to 0.99 across all the states, the, uh, the 13 states. Um, the results were similar to the previous tests that they did in 2016. Um, and they, they felt that it was a high level of reliability and that the measure could be used to distinguish between states. So that's, that's that. Um, it did seem like the comments were uh, had no concerns around reliability. I agree with I agree with Craig's presentation. Okay, um, Jeff. So, uh, harking back to the last conversation, uh, if reliability includes specification, uh, the lack of uh, telemedicine and other. Um, asynchronous, uh, potentially, or otherwise approaches, uh, is a, uh, problem. As well as, uh, I think the specification not being specific to including some code around the, uh, a psychiatric condition. Um, so going in and following up with, uh, your primary doc and talking about their blood pressure or an ear infection really isn't um, sufficient. Uh, it isn't uh, 
uh, reliable uh, specification to my way of thinking. So I think those are two substantial flaws um, that as I understand, we should now be talking about uh, under reliability. Thank you. Other comments that people have? I, I would echo what Jeff said, although I thought that the second half would fall under validity, not reliability. But I might be off on that thought. We struggled with that all day. <laughs> it can't be replicable for sure for reliability if we are not taking into account telehealth. And this was last tested in 18 when telehealth was not where it is today. Are there any, um, again, going back to my earlier comments, are there any comments that people have with regard to um, the specifics with regard to it being um, an assessment of a prescriber interaction, a prescriber visit? Anything that would be different that you think of that uh, should be a consideration here? You know, rather than repeating the same discussion we had before, but I, I can give my 2 cents about that. And again, building on what Jeff said, if the follow up visit is with a behavioral health provider, a psychiatrist prescriber or a nurse practitioner prescriber who is specifically engaging in that follow up visit for the purpose of symptom checking adherence checking, side effect checking, those sorts of things related to that episode of care. That's what I think this measure is meant to drive toward. Because of the way the measure is currently set up, we can't be certain that any of those things are happening in the follow-up. So I, I think that has a significant bearing on how reliable and valid the measure is. And what about with regard to the telemedicine versus in person? Any other issues related to prescribing? If the telemedicine encounter is again around the prescribing of the antipsychotic medication, I don't see an issue with that. If it is any telemedicine encounter, um, who knows? It could be for a therapy visit and a therapist is not necessarily going to check medication. Other comments with regard to that, uh, this issue? Oh, I have two, this is David. I, I think the telemedicine is the follow-up for medications is even more of an issue for um, antipsychotics Wait, than it was. Say, say it a little louder. Uh, I, I think it's even, the telemedicine issue is even more important for this measure uh, I think it's going to be a long lasting remnant of, of COVID in a positive way than it was even for the previous 3312 substance use measure. Um, the second thing is related to um, Jeff's second point, and I'm not really sure where this lands. In my system, which is safety net, we're really trying to push very strongly towards primary care follow ups as an alternative to, to um, specialty care. Um, Primarily because safety net clients, if they show up at all anywhere, it's a success. So I actually don't know how this either does or does not capture that. Maybe I can ask that to, to the developer. And I think it goes to both questions of specificity. If primary care follow up is important, did they ask about substance? I mean, sorry, about, about antipsychotic use. Yeah. I, 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 I would, I, I would echo what David's saying with so much integration. I mean, we shouldn't have a problem if it's, uh, if the service is provided in primary care, as long as they are reviewing and they may have consultation from, uh, you know, a, a co occurring uh, disorder consultation. And it, we should still allow it in primary care as long as they're uh, do have that consultation and prescribing. Yeah, it's sort of a two step logic model. Are we testing for that there was a follow up visit, or are we testing for there was a follow up visit and they checked antipsychotic dosing? And I am thinking this does the former. So, that a separate measure did they ask about, about antipsychotic medications would be another measure, like a, you know, what do you call it? A two part measure, partial measures. 
I agree, David, and was going to bring that up under the validity discussion because I think the measure itself is only suggesting that a follow up visit of some sort occurred. It doesn't get into whether or not the follow up visit was specific to caring for the person on the antipsychotic as related to use of the antipsychotic. And, and Mike, I just want to echo what you said, um, and uh, also you, David, as a med psych doctor, I am all about visits being conducted in primary care. I just came from my clinic at the FQHC, and I can tell you the primary care physicians at the FQHC would know not what to do with treating someone on an antipsychotic. So we have a long way to go to get to where that needs to be, but the the ideal behind that and the collaborative care models that could be moved forward um, would absolutely support what you both are saying. And just to be clear, my point wasn't that there shouldn't be uh, counting of a primary care visit <clears throat> if it was directed uh, to the patient's problem at hand right. and assessing uh, right. emergent uh, side effects and uh, tolerability and uh, effectiveness and all the other things that would go into an effective follow up visit. Uh, my point was that we can't specify that in the current measure, and therefore we don't know if it's a you know non specific unrelated follow up or not. And for that matter, uh, if, if they happen to see a psychiatrist, we don't know if they had that or other mental health provider. Uh, it's a function of the way um, the data set uh, allows uh, a uh, particular measure to be constructed. Bonnie, uh, you had a comment? Yeah, and, and I just, I think our developer had her hand up before me, so. Bonnie, if you're gonna go on the same issue, I'm happy to take your comment in and address it. If you have something separate, then I can address it after. Yeah, I, I was just sort of channeling your core group um, and thinking about this conundrum, and I just want to put out on the table, you know, I'm wondering if there's a way for your team to explore the timing of an adjudicated pharmacy claim for AP meds around that visit to explore whether that was a primary care doc for, you know, was primary care visit for something else versus not. Um, it, this issue comes up with ADHD with kids where primary care docs uh, bill uh, for something else. Um, but if I see an adjudicated claim for a stimulant, I know that that was an ADHD visit, right? So just, just one way to explore the extent of how much you're capturing. Yeah, so all of these comments have been very um, astute. So thank you for providing that feedback. Um, we do include NPIs for any clinician who has prescribing authority. So we're not necessarily looking specifically at those individuals who um, specialize in psychiatric care or primary care. Um, I wish there were a way for us to know um, if the uh, visit covered antipsychotic use. Bonnie, I think your suggestion of timing is interesting. We do look for the prescription to occur prior to the visit, so we're looking at follow-up, but I absolutely understand if we thought about disbursement of medication post the post to the current thing we're measuring, that's also an interesting way to evaluate if the discussion occurred during the follow-up visit. Uh, but so because we're using claims data, if this were an EHR measure, I think we'd be able to use more rich information to evaluate whether the clinician um, discussed the um, antipsychotic use, um, but we're kind of constrained by the data that we have available. Um, there's a comment by Brooke in the chat. Yes, um, I come from New Mexico, where we actually have like community health workers that have been trained in mental health um, and other sort of along with even RNs that could potentially, I think, serve this role provided they had direct um, access to a prescriber, um, but they wouldn't get counted. Um, again, that may be going a little off into left field, but there are areas of this country that don't have access to prescribers quite as readily. Other comments with, uh, with regard to uh, 
reliability and then just move quickly to validity. But other comments? Just one comment that I would have, and, and it's not really totally pertinent, but um, should at some point the developer revisit the issue of telemedicine, uh, in this case, thinking about it from a prescriber focused kind of issue, whether there would be a difference in terms of uh, audio only versus um, video, especially with regard to the issue of motor abnormal motor movements among people taking antipsychotics. And again, it's not relevant directly to the measure we have in front of us, but just in the future as that is anticipated to think about that. Yeah, I Harold. Think, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to note that again, all of the conversation about telemedicine um, is very well taken, including the points you just made about thinking about which types of uh, encounters outside of the the clinic setting would be appropriate to capture. Certainly, items we would discuss with our technical expert panel um, prior to implementation, as well as assessment quantitatively when the data are available. I think the point of following up from antipsychotic from a medical safety point of view is that the individual needs to be weighed, their girth needs to be measured, and their blood pressure needs to be taken, as well as a hemoglobin A1C drawn. Those are the, the main correlates of antipsychotic use and downstream metabolic syndrome. So in any circumstance, um, if the idea behind the measure is to prevent those metabolic side effects, any follow up with any prescriber, even in the telehealth setting, and maybe especially in the telehealth setting, doesn't help get to what this measure is intended. Yeah, you count a really good point. And it's sort of interesting how the whole sort of world of sort of uh, telemedicine and, and digital apps and monitoring can potentially, uh, you know, because some of those things are capable of, you know, being measured, even though you're not face to face. Right, but if we think about a population of individuals with schizophrenia on Medicaid, unless they're in a clinical setting, I think it's highly unlikely that all of those kind of tech gadgets will be in their hands. Um, and I, I'm not trying to be prejudicial against the population, but I think we have all experienced the reality of using consistent telehealth among persons with psychotic illness. No, I, I think you're right. And it, it's just something to think about in terms of how, um, you know, you know, how that might work or not work as one anticipates these technological advances. The other issue here is to think through what are we trying to assess early on versus a more intermediate for metabolic syndrome to make itself uh, present within, for argument's sake, a week would be relatively rare compared to a month or two. Uh, and, and just thinking through um, where the focus of such visits might lie. And I don't know the, the data, but I'm sure there are data that look at uh, over um, a course of time, uh, how uh, prevalent uh, those side effects from metabolic syndrome, for example, uh, raise themselves. You yeah, know, but, I actually, but I, I just issue. to say that, um, again, we're kind of getting into the validity issue here as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, um, which is fine, because they sort of obviously are linked closely. But, you know, with, with face to face visits, we don't know that all of those things are going on at a face to face visit either. That's right. It's interesting when you look at the developer rationale, they are specifically saying the rationale is to address the physical health problems. But within 28 days, I don't know how, how relevant that is for me. I look at this as a continuity of care measure. And, and so there, for me, there's sort of a logic model problem when they. In the, based on their rationale, but I'm willing to overlook that because I think there's other values to following up at 28 days. I, I don't know. I asked the Dr. Pincus whether that is an important consideration here. Other comments by members of the panel. So, can we show the uh, the options for validity?
And then this section, we're still considering the telehealth uh, impact, correct, right? So, so even though we've shifted some of the discussion. While that's being pulled up, I would note that I do still see value in having asynchronous encounters or telemedicine. Obviously, a lot of the um, discrete medical markers like A1C and blood pressure may be more difficult to capture uh, via telemedicine, um, but you can assess medication adherence if the dose is appropriate. I think that there's conversations that could be had with an individual um, with telemedicine or asynchronous encounters. Um, again, certainly something that we'll discuss with our technical expert panel once we have more data. And I just want to call out, um, Brooke put a few comments in the chat, and just to make sure those get uh, on the recording, I'll read them out loud. She said there are very rural areas where non-prescribers can screen for antipsychotics, uh, use side effects that feed into a prescriber if necessary. That would not count under um, under the measure. Is that a, was that a question, Brooke? Sorry, I want to make no, sure. No, it's under the current measure. Um, okay. You know, and again, it's sort of getting back into probably more the asynchronous tele. Um, health of having a lower level um, go out and do the blood pressure medicine uh, or blood pressure weight, girth, check for side effects, do the aims, um, ensure compliance. Um, and then also, you know, there's very much you can do point of care for lipids and hemoglobin A1C um, and have the provider review that at a secondary time if necessary. That would, be that would be captured. So we do have home health and various um, encounters outside of the acute care setting. As long as the individual reports up to someone who has an NPI that's considered a prescribing clinician, we'd capture that. Would be captured even if it was just an RN? As long as it's uh, billed with a clinician who has a prescribing authority. So if, if the RN reports is under a, an MD or a, an NP. Right, okay. but if it's a community-based worker, that would not necessarily be the case. Yeah, that's something that um, we can take back as a as an, an action item for us to look into to see for the home health encounters kind of what data we're capturing. I, I think this points to some of the problems overall with, uh, you know, um, visit based, you know, encounter based claims measures because you don't know the content. You know, people are, are identifying you know, sort of issues that, sh that you know, a, ra a range of issues that, you know, should be addressed in a follow-up visit. Um, and, you know, we just don't know whether those things are occurring. Um, so, uh, um, so, did we show the uh, validity voting options? We did. I think you moved into the validity, dis validity discussion without us showing the reliability oh, voting okay. options. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'll just I'll just say out loud that for reliability the options are high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Um, other comments about validity. And uh, and I'd say that the validity options uh, remain the same as the reliability options, correct? That's correct. Um, validity is also high, moderate, low, or insufficient. So, what do we move to feasibility? All right. So, in terms of feasibility, um, you know, these are claims. So, all data is available through Medicaid claims and Medicaid Part A, B, C, and D administrative claims. Um, the developer used the data quality atlas to identify the states with sufficient data quality, and there is no fees attached to any of this. So. Um, there were no comments, you know, in the negative about that. So that's that's feasibility. Okay. Um, Caroline, any further comments? None from me. We got other comments from the uh, panel. Okay. Um, the options for voting on feasibility. Tammy. 
Sorry for that delay. It's um, okay. Yes, for feasibility for measure 3113, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on to usability and use. Okay. Um, so, in terms of use, uh, CMS has approved the measure uh, for states to use um, to assess their continuum of mental health care for anti psychotic use. Um, and the developer also states that uh, a number of states are going, to, are going to likely use it in the near future. Um, they mentioned seven, seven localities that are going to be used. Uh, any information on how they use it or any ex sort of exemplar? I didn't see anything like that. No. Mm -mm. No. Happy to talk more about that once. Mm -hmm. um, Caroline? None, thank you. Um, um, any other comments about usability and use? I think that was just used to just to, to separate for our voting distinctions. Right. Okay. Um, Somebody had commented that I couldn't see who it was about saying that they had some examples. Oh, I'm sorry. That was uh, Colleen McKernan, the developer. I'm um, just flagging that uh, unlike 3312, where we have less information, um, for 3313, um, it's been flagged as use in one of the Medicaid waivers, the Section 1115 demonstration for SMI. And so, um, as uh, Craig noted, um, there are seven states who have expressed interest in use. Unfortunately, the question that I think someone asked um, about how they're using the measure or what quality improvement efforts have been implemented, we don't have those data yet. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to report them in a future um, discussion, though. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anything on uh, usability? Um, not much here. Uh, state level performance rates range from 35.9% to 58.7%, which is uh, what we discussed before. Um, less than half the Medicaid beneficiaries in the studies uh, who received a new uh, antipsychotic medication had an outpatient follow up visit within 28 days. So there's some performance differences here. So looks like it could be very uh, usable. Uh, no potential harms for use of the measure as well. And it didn't seem like uh, there were any issues with the comments. Mm -hmm. So any further comments of, about use usability or actually any of the other um, issues with regard to this measure? I think it goes back to the concern about as part of usability, the accountability statement, and that is what are we holding providers accountable to if this measure isn't valid from the outset? Can you explain a little bit more in terms of well, if we're if we are holding providers, uh, the idea is holding the prescribing provider accountable to doing the right type of follow-up for an individual newly started on an antipsychotic, but the measure itself may not be valid for all of the reasons we suggested about the use of claims. It is challenging for me to think that downstream usability and accountability as related to usability is fair. Okay. Other comments, overall comments about the measure? So, we show the options for voting. Yes, I'll show the options for you. Okay, you should be seeing that for measure 3113, the options for use would be pass or no pass. Okay. And then the overall suitability options. Uh, 
Um, I'll just also share the usability options um, for measure 3113. Um, they would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And then overall suitability would be yes or no, just to be mm -hmm. clear on the options. Let's see, any further comments by any members of the panel on this measure? Okay, well, thank you, Craig and Caroline. Thank you to the committee. Thank, thank you. you to Harold and Michael, too, for leading us through our first discussions. And thank you to the developer for being present this morning. Um, we did have on the agenda that we would do a discussion of related competing measures for these two measures um, if they were recommended for continued endorsement. Since we are not doing live voting today, we, are, we will also hold that related and competing discussion at another time. Um, so that concludes our discussion on 3312 and 3313. We are actually five minutes ahead of schedule, so I'll call that right on time. Um, we have a lunch break scheduled at noon, and we'll go ahead and take that now. You can have five extra minutes, and we'll still return at 1230 for the remaining measures this afternoon. Hey, thanks, everyone. See you again soon. See you later.
Okay, hello everyone. I have 1231 on my clock, so we will get ready to start discussion again. Um, if you'll give us just one moment to do a head count of our participants and make sure that we have sufficient attendance to proceed, um, the team will just take a count really quickly. And actually, we're we're short a few, so let's give everyone about two more minutes to to log back on here, and then we'll get started. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, hi, it's uh, Mike Lardieri. I'm just by phone right now. I'm trying to connect on the uh, WebEx. Oh, great. Thank you. We will uh, we'll note your name when we do our attendance here. I see you're calling user six. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And I'll try to connect. Great. And if you're um, well, I guess if you're having issues, you can't chat us, but you can always send us an email if you're having any further problems and we'll try and assist. Okay, sounds good. I think it's just the hotel I'm in. Thanks. This is Bonnie. I just have a comment for our co-chairs. Just, I have a general question about the data source and how it was collected and all the Minnesota measures that might be applicable to this cluster of measures. Yeah, and I would say um, let's let the developer um, present and maybe they'll address yeah. even in their opening comments. And then, um, yeah, it's, I think um, Michael, ha we have you leading the first measure. So um, then if, if her question remains, you can, you can call on her. That sounds good, thanks. Okay, perfect, thank you. I mean, me, Michael Lardieri? No, it's, I think it means me, Michael Trangle. Oh, good, because I'm totally unprepared. I didn't know that. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Although, it, it could be entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and it looks like we have sufficient committee attendance to proceed with discussion. Um, as we stated earlier, we, do, we no longer have quorum, um, so we will proceed with offline voting. Um, and we can start discussion now. So let me check and see if someone from the developer team from Minnesota Community Measurement is on the line. Good morning, this is Colette Cole and Julie Sonier from Minnesota Community Measurement. Great, thank you, Colette. Okay, so to begin today, um, this afternoon, sorry, uh, we'll be starting with measure 0710E, depression remission at 12 months and I will turn the discussion over to Michael. Okay, so the first measure, at least on the schedule I have in front of me, is the NQF 0710E, depression remission at 12 months. Um, uh, and hi, Julie, hi, Colette. Uh, do you guys wanna give us a three to five minute uh, sort of summary? And if you uh, could mention your data sources, that will save one question later. Thanks, Michael, absolutely. Um, I made a note, so our introductory comments are going to be a little bit longer for this first measure because we're kind of going to try to incorporate many things. Uh, again, I'm Colette Cole, a measure developer with Minnesota Community Measurement, and Julie Sonier, our president and CEO, is also present. We're pleased to pre be presenting several measures for depression for consideration of reendorsement. We'll be discussing each measure individually, but like I explained, I'd like to talk about some commonalities of the measures 
and how this suite of measures works together. And so I don't forget Bonnie's question. I want to clarify about the data source for these measures. So um, we actually have the, uh, the data methodology that we've been using for about 15 years. And also we're developing a new warehouse system, but the data source for these measures is individual patient contact information that's being submitted through a HIPAA secure data portal at Minnesota community measurement. So envision um, clinics are sending the confirming diagnosis codes and they're also sending all the dates and PHQ nine scores for the patients that are eligible in the denominator. So we're calculating these rates for the clinics and medical groups based on um, individual PHQ-9 scores coming in. So um, let's see. So there are four patient reported outcome measures and one supportive process measure. Depression remission at 12 months and six months, depression response at six and 12 months, and depression assessment with a PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M. The outcome measures have the same identical denominator of patients and the measures track remission and response at two distinct points during a 14 month period of measurement at six months and 12 months respectively. The measure construct is longitudinal. Each patient is identified for inclusion based on having a diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia and an elevated PHQ-9 score greater than nine, which indicates a need for treatment. When these two events occur, the patient is given an index date or starting point, and then an assessment period is held constant to determine patient progress. At six months, plus or minus 60 days, and 12 months, plus or minus 60 days, the most recent PHQ-9 in that window is evaluated for response, which is a PHQ-9 score that is reduced by 50% or more from the index PHQ-9 value, and remission, a PHQ-9 score that is less than five. Zero to four indicates no or mild depression symptoms. I'm going to walk through a fake patient example to illustrate how the measure calculations work. A patient presents to the clinic on February 15th of 2021 with feelings of hopelessness and difficulty sleeping. A PHQ-9 score of 21 indicates severe depression and the patient is diagnosed with major depression and the ICD-10 code F32.2, major depressive disorder, single episode, severe without psychotic features is coded. With the diagnosis of major depression and a PHQ-9 score that is greater than nine, the patient's index date is set for 2-15-2021, which is the starting point for measurement. A measure assessment period is then held constant for ongoing assessment for 14 months to allow measuring outcomes for the two measurement points to occur. So patients are not re-indexing at multiple times within that measure period. Additionally, high PHQ-9 scores are not indexing again. That measurement period is held constant. So for this patient, multiple ongoing assessments with the PHQ-9 occur as the patient progresses through treatment. The first point of measurement is at six months or August 15th with an assessment window of plus or minus 60 days. So the most recent PHQ-9 between June 16th and October 14th of 2021 will be used to determine remission and response at six months. The patient's PHQ-9 on September 17th is nine, and that's the most recent in the window, which is 57% reduced from the index PHQ-9 score of 21 and meets numerator criteria for depression response at six months, but does not meet numerator criteria for remission, which is a PHQ-9 score of less than five. The patient continues with treatment and the provider increases the number of therapy sessions and changes to a different type of antidepressant medication. The second point of measurement is at 12 months or February 15th of 2022 with an assessment window between December 17th of 2021 and April 16th of 2022. The patient's PHQ-9 score on March 22nd is three meeting numerator criteria for remission at 12 months. 
Some might question why there is a need for four outcome measures, and when viewing them individually, this is an understandable question. However, the collection and calculation of these measures <coughs> is efficient in that the same set of patients utilizing the same patient reported outcome tool used for monitoring progress and calculating outcomes for both remission and response from the same data collection of the PHQ-9 score at six and 12 months. Response is considered progress towards remission, which is the desired patient-centric goal. If the patient doesn't achieve the desired response and remission at six months, there's an opportunity for continued improvement to achieve targets at 12 months. The goal for these patient-centric measures is to promote ongoing evaluation of patients, applying a stepwise process if current therapy is not working, and ultimately the alleviation of depression symptoms. Different stakeholders have different preferences. The Minnesota Department of Health uses the six-month remission measure in its statewide quality reporting and measurement system. CMS prefers the 12-month remission measure as demonstrating a more sustained outcome for use in the MIPS and the ECQM programs. And the CMMI models prefer the 12-month response measure. And CQA has adapted all four outcome measures at six months and the PHQ-9 assessment measure for its HEDAS Electronic Clinical Data Systems, ECDS. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since these measures were last reviewed and endorsed in 2015, we have, re we have convened a measure development work group for redesign of the measure. These efforts resulted in the inclusion of adolescents age 12 to 17 into this measure previously specified for adults. Measures are reported as two separate stratifications by age and are not combined, ages 12 to 17 and 18 and older. Expansion of the follow-up assessment window from plus or minus 30 days to plus or minus 60 days, essentially going from a two-month to a four-month window around the measurement point. Evaluation of other pro tools for consideration in this measure was conducted approximately 20 other tools were examined for comparability and potential inclusion in the measure. The PHQ-9M with a slight modification for adolescents was added to the measure. Of the other 20 tools evaluated, none supported comparable cut points for remission. The evaluation and modification of exclusions occurred. Two exclusions were added by the work group schizophrenia and pervasive de developmental disorders. The personality disorders value set was revised to only include those disorders in which a patient could not reliably complete a PHQ-9. Borderline personality, um, histrionic, and this, the tissues, I'm sorry, disorders were um, part of that narrow value set. So I'm just going to start with the first measure, um, depression remission at 12 months. It's the percentage of adolescent patients 12 to 17 years of age and adult patients 18 and older with a diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia and an elevated PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M greater than 9 who reach remission at 12 months plus or minus 60 days after their index or starting event. Remission is defined as a PHQ-9, PHQ-9M of less than 5. The cut points for the tools indicate a score of 0 to 4 is mild or no depressive symptoms. In the most recent, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, if the most recent PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M score is less than five within that 120-day window around the 12-month mark, the patient is included in the numerator. The PHQ-9 tool is a patient-reported outcome tool with strong psychometric properties and is validated both in aiding the diagnosis of depression and for monitoring improvement of symptoms, assessing patient progress. Exclusions for the measure are patients who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, personality disorder, schizophrenia or psychotic disorder, or pervasive developmental disorder. Additionally, patients who die are enrolled in hospice or palliative care or permanent nursing home resident are excluded from the measure. 
The measure is used in both psychiatry and primary care settings. The measure additionally promotes ongoing contact between patient and provider as patients who do not have a follow-up PHQ-9 score at 12 months, plus or minus 60 days, remain in the denominator. The measure is reported on our consumer-facing website, MN Health Scores, annually in our healthcare quality report, and is included in CMS's ECQM and MIPS programs, and was previously included as a metric for accountable care organizations. The measure is currently collected for all primary care and psychi psychiatry clinics in Minnesota, full population, representing 120 1,344 patients, adults from 550 clinics, and 11,658 adolescents from 118 clinics. And that's our typical annual statistic of this ongoing measurement. Remission at 12 months demonstrated adults with a rate of 10.1% with a range of 0 to 22.9. Adolescents in their first year of measurement 7.8% with a range of 0 to 18.1%. We cannot provide trend data over time because of the redesign. However, we can note some differences based on the previous construct of the adult measure. It is possible that an increase in rates could be attributed to any of the following. The expansion of the assessment window, increased follow-up rates, or increased attention to improving depression outcomes. For adults, a 3.7 percentage point increase of remission was noted from 27 report year prior to the redesign, so 16.4% to 10.4%. Although the measure demonstrates significant gap and continued opportunity for improvement, stratification by race, ethnicity, type of insurance, sex, age group, and neighborhood socioeconomic variables further identifies disparities in care. In the preliminary analysis worksheet for this measure, NQF staff identified one area of concern regarding validity testing, and we'd like to clarify. For the calibration of the risk model, we inadvertently did not supply the C statistic that was contained within the logistic regression model, statistical results from SAS. The C statistic for this measure was 0.616, for adults and 0.592 for adolescents. Other areas of validity criteria were noted in the pre-evaluation comments by committee members. One commenter mentioned that there was no testing of the critical data elements. However, this is not the case. Critical data elements for this measure were tested and the results of the data element validation process are listed in question 2B03. I'm sorry, this, this is, uh, Becoming very long. We understand you were going to take a little bit longer, but we really have to be fair to our other developers and, and the standing okay. committee. So, if you could just, you know, maybe just end with just a couple, just one more sentence or so to give your introduction, but we do need to move on. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that our practices have worked really hard to follow up with their patients and follow up rates increased over the last 10 years from 17% to 42%, and that low outcome rates are not solely attributed to lack of follow-up. Additional analysis of denominator patients who do have a follow-up PHQ-9 score at 12 months demonstrated that only 22.3% of patients were in remission, and another 29.7% of patients demonstrate scores between 15 and 27 which are major to severe depression symptoms. Thank you for the opportunity to present the measure for your consideration of reendorsement. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I at least have hopes that uh, some of what you presented will shorten our discussions later as well in terms of the other measures. Absolutely, my other introductory comments are a minute. So thank you. Okay, so our lead discussions for this uh, are Jeffrey and Julie. I don't know who's going to uh, start us off, but go for it. Carol had a comment. Okay. It's really a quick question. I, when you said only 22% um, showed remission, I, could you repeat that? That that uh, 
uh, statistics? Um, sure. So when we look at our data and we only include patients that were followed up, so a much smaller segment of the denominator, there were a lot of comments that suggested we remove patients from the denominator if they don't have follow up. We don't necessarily agree with that, but when we look at the patients that did have a follow up PHQ 9, only 22.3% of them were in remission. So it's not all, all of the cases of not being re in remission weren't because they were lost to follow up. There was a, a large segment of patients, almost 30% of the patients still demonstrated severe, major to severe depression symptoms with a score of 15 to 27 on their PHQ-9. And what about those that had you know, significant improvement? Um, so 22.3% had remission and I don't, uh, I have a further breakdown. Let me just go find it if that's all right. Okay, well, we, we the, can the move breakdown on. By the tool, so 32% um, had a score of 10 to 14 in their PHQ-9, 37% had a mild depression symptom, so five to nine, and then, um, the, the remaining of moderately severe and severe was 29%. So I, I see that we have other hands up, but we also have two discussants who have poured over the data themselves and are gonna lead our discussion. So whether it's Jeffrey first or Julie first, since you guys did some of the work, um, maybe you guys could go next. And I, I see that Bonnie, that your hand was up, but we'll let's at least give them a chance. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, go or Julie, whatever you prefer. Well, you're already you're already unmuted and talking. Just go. Okay, I'm just gonna go for, for it. Just for sorry, just for Jeff's knowledge, I don't see Julie on the line right now, so she may have gotten delayed coming back from lunch. Just if you're expecting to co-lead, I expect her back, but just for your awareness. Okay, well then I uh, will proceed. Uh, so, we've already heard about the numerator and denominator statements, the number of patients in the denominator who reached remission with the PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M. The 9M is the adolescent uh, version and uh, is modified to include things like school, uh, stuff that would be pertaining directly to adolescents. Uh, and uh, the 12-month uh, follow-up, when we heard the a uh, window of uh, plus or minus 60 days. The denominator, either the adolescents or uh, adults with major depression or dysthymia, an index score of uh, greater than nine, uh, which all seem to be relatively uh, consistent in uh, the literature. Um, so the first consideration is uh, on evidence uh, this is a, a maintenance measure. It's been through the endorsement uh, process uh, beginning in 2011 and reendorsed in 15. And uh, it is a uh, measure that uh, uses patient supplied data within a standardized uh, instrument. Does not. Does not. I'm sorry? Go, Bonnie. What, what are you saying? You're muted, Bonnie. We're muted. Muted. Sorry, sorry. I think, um, yeah, I'd I'd like some clarification on the data collection data source. Um, I'm hearing some assumptions that need to be checked out in your discussion. Well, I mean, my That's understanding is honest. that this is an electronically reported uh, information based on either patient or provider uh, completion of the PHQ. Uh, if the um, Developer wants to clarify that, or if you have some specific question, uh, why? Yeah, I, for it. is is this a good time to ask the developer? Go for it. Okay. Sorry, so, Michael, not to jump in again, but that is a feasibility discussion about the data use and the data, um, the data sources and how they're calculated. So I just want to make sure that we're focusing the discussion really on evidence. Um, I know that all these conversations are interconnected, but. We want to make sure that we talk about evidence first, uh, and then when we talk, when we get to the appropriate section to talk about that. Then. Okay. Uh, then I'll patient yeah. Bonnie. Yeah, I, I will get back to you, Bonnie, and uh, we'll eagerly await the answer to that. Okay. 
So uh, there is a logic model presented uh, that uh, suggests that uh, first uh, you need to identify uh, individuals with major depression and that uh, you then uh, are trying to uh, have them remit and then finally, um, you know, or respond and then finally remit uh, in their depression. Uh, and uh, there is a wealth of evidence uh, that was, uh, again, updated uh, with the use of uh, broad guidelines. Uh, I wouldn't say they went back to primary literature but I think it's fairly well accepted. Um, the um, information was also uh, evaluated uh, with a qualitative uh, study, uh, looking at patients and uh, their preferences, and that also further supported that this was an important uh, set of outcomes to measure in patient-oriented terms with uh, goals to regain daily activities and social function functioning, while those uh, with chronic depression stressed the need to find new ways of functioning, even if they were not able to respond to full uh, social functioning. Some of the comments that our group made uh, revolved around uh, other elements uh, that uh, weren't, uh, quote, controlled for. I'm not sure that's really relevant to the causal pathway. Uh, but at least confounders potentially to this that might include uh, things like continuity, the organizational type, um, the a issue of missing data, which again, I don't think probably uh, is in here, uh, the lack of trend data, which again, I don't think is a uh, evidence uh, issue per se, uh, and uh, the fact that, um, you know, uh, scores tend to regress to the mean. Uh, again, I think that's uh, not necessarily an evidence issue and that this uh, focused clearly in Minnesota. Uh, so um, the evidence, uh, I would say, uh, from my perspective, would be uh, a pass. And I welcome questions. Michael, I think we see your hand up. Go. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I guess uh, hopefully this is around evidence. So I guess I'm just confused around this, these measures, the uh, uh, remission, not a problem. And it's, you know, providers were all, that's our, our target is under five, but um, uh, less sure about the response. So um, I guess my question is, is, is there evidence that we should be going to a five or is there evidence that we should be decreasing depression by 50%? Um, I'm not sure which is the, the right one. And as a clinician, if we're putting a measure out there, I think we need to guide people in terms of, you know, what 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 really is the the evidence, five or or just on the road to uh remission. Uh also have some issues with on the road to remission, because do we do that with other uh um issues like on the medical side, like on HBA one C, I'm not sure if we have a measure that says you're moving towards under seven or under nine, whichever you know uh, starting point you're at. So I just have a concern about adding an extra measure to you're you're on the movement too, uh, but more concerned. What's the evidence that the you know fifty percent is good versus five? I mean, what, what yeah, and that? and maybe just to interject, um, this specific measure, while well, recognizing that we have sort of this suite, is about remission. So I take it from your comments, Michael, you wouldn't have a problem looking at remission and defining remission in the way it is given correct. the evidence. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's more the response components. So I don't know if we wanna hold that part of the discussion for um, the response measures, but I'll leave that up to staff and uh, Michael. Well, let's just try and keep it focused on what we're gonna vote or at least what we're gonna write down our votes on. Next, okay, um, but body, you have a your hand is up. So this is this is related to evidence, not the other issue. And uh, just a question: um, How do you know which PHQ nine to pick? It's based on age. Is that or or do you I mean, mean which in, in the patient's episode of care for the twelve months? It was the it last goes, one. What that's if it goes up and down? Which one do you pick? The most recent one the at the period during the period. 
So if you're doing it at six months and you have a window, it's the one that's, as I get it, uh, closest to that uh, six month. Uh, so the four. Marker. What's that? The four month versus the eight month. It's the, the most recent is what I heard Colette saying. During and the Colette, do you want so, to clarify so that? Somebody then? could have within the 12 months, they could have a PHQ nine go down. And then still within that 12 month data window, you could have a PHQ nine go up. If you, you measure only the, the best one, regularly, so, you would undoubtedly see ups and downs. So Colette, why don't you uh, just repeat what you said? Which, yeah, which so, one do you choose? Thanks for the question. So it's not over the entire 14 month period, but it's the 60 days around that 12 month mark. So it's actually like a four month period. Um, if I think back to my patient example, it was December to April. So you're looking at that specific period around 12 months, and then you're picking the most recent PHQ-9 within that window. So not picking the lowest, but picking the most recent. And that aligns with other measure science and other measure constructs when you have multiple values over a time frame that you pick the most recent. Does that help? Most and recent I, instead of the one closest to the time window of 12 months? That's correct. It's the most recent. And I'm going to just segue a little bit into your data question. So we are receiving information on every PHQ-9 that the patient is administered to them and the date on which that occurs. So we can apply the date math programmatically to determine what each patient's window is and then does a PHQ-9 fall within that window and if there's more than one PHQ-9, then by date we pick the most recent. Most recent. In that in that four in month window. window. In that window. Of four That's, months. Uh, and your index start date is when you first have a diagnosis of MDD plus a PHQ-9 with and any and it seems like in your data source you can't assess gap in care. So you just assume that the first time diagnosis is made, that's the index start date so, in your data set? Yep, thanks for the question. So the very first time that, and, and we kind of define a denominator identification period and put some parameters around that, but the very first time that a patient has the combination of those two events, so they have an elevated PHQ-9 right. and a diagnosis of major depression, that kicks off their start date. So each patient that's included in the denominator yeah. has an individual start date and then enough time yeah. is allowed for each patient to do that assessment correctly. I, I get it. I guess it kind of threw me off a little bit. It looked to me like in one of them that basically the uh, clinic or medical group um, reports their data to you in four month chunks. So you identify the episode of care by the patient so, within your analysis. So let me clarify, this is Colette. So all of the data is submitted to us, all of the diagnoses, all right. of the HQ9. So we determine if the patient comes into the denominator and when that occurs. So if a patient has a high PHQ9 and they don't have the diagnosis of depression, we're not going to include them yet because oftentimes a patient will be assessed a couple of times before they're given that determining diagnosis of major depression. So that when we have those two elements together, that's when the patient comes into the denominator. Okay. So getting the other the other evidence. questions yeah, uh, on evidence, other people have questions, concerns. Uh, Julie just joined us. I see in the chat. Um, welcome, Julie. I guess if you just missed this, I, I don't know <laughs> if you have something you want to say as well. Feel free to do so. Jeff did present a, a, a rundown of the evidence and other people have been making comments. Yeah, no, I apologize. I had a 12 to 1 meeting. Um, no, I mean, I think it was pretty, I, I didn't have anything. I, I, 
one thing that occurred to me and I reread it and reread it and tried to make peace with it um, is that it's a depression screen, not a suicide prevention screen. Um, because, you know, I just kind of wanted to say that is that there are other great tools like the ASQ, um, which asks specifically about suicide. The PHQ is okay for suicide. And I know that's one of the things that they were addressing in their comments. Um, and I'd love to see the, the two things that kind of dawned on me were one, that we were so specific to the PHQ, there are other depression screening tools. So I did wonder why we were wedded to that particular tool um, or why the developers were. Um, and then two, I'm very mindful of processes and what happens when somebody screens positive and maybe this isn't the place for it, but I, I would love for the developers to offer something or um, just, just to put that out there. So Colette, I think did discuss the choice of the PHQ versus other depression uh, screeners and uh, monitoring instruments. I can, this is Colette again, I can share that information or kind of recap that. So when our measure development work group met for redesign activities, we evaluated 21 other tools that were suggested by the community, by a variety of people and um, applied specific criteria to those tools. But the most important one was, did the school, did the tool have cut points that told you this patient was in remission? And many of the tools that we evaluated, like the geriatric depression score tool, did not score at all. There was no numeric scoring or no way to identify remission from the basis of the tool. So the work group evaluated all the tools against the eight or so criteria they set and um, included the PHQ-9M with the addition of adolescence, but no other tools um, had comparable cut points to readmission. I mean, it is acceptable to have more than one tool a patient reported outcome tool in a measure if you're consistently measuring the same outcome in the inclusion of those tools. So that was the activity that we undertook. And I appreciate the questions about suicidality and um, granted that is not a part of this measure, but a very important measure concept. Uh, yes, Bonnie. You're, you're muted again, or still. Uh, I just had one other cross-cutting question for our process, and that actually is probably to the NQF team. Um, this is a maintenance measure. If we have no trend data over time, um, do we still meet your requirement? Because the specifications have changed, so we don't have trend data over time. Are you talking about for for the performance gap data? Just, um, um, yeah. So it, it, it's 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 an issue, issue comes up for maintenance measures. Wouldn't so, it be under use and usability? Mm -hmm. uh, There's yeah. So that wouldn't really be part of the evidence conversation, but um, there are sometimes reasons why there might not be trend data available over time. So it's something that we ask for, but um, if you don't see it, you should have that conversation about if there's a reason it's not there and if there's an acceptable response. Um, so it's, and when it's you not a to see it. It's, it's not a requirement, it goes under the domain of usability. Okay. It's not part of evidence, yeah. Not part of evidence. All right, let's look at any other comments. Let's at least look at uh, how, how we'll vote uh, regarding evidence so we can write it down for later. Okay, uh, this is an outcome measure. So uh, for measure 0710E on um, evidence, your options are pass or do not pass. Okay. Um, gap? Um, if you look at the current performance 
data uh, dating back to uh, 2019. Uh, they had 10% uh, of uh, patients uh, who uh, had a depression response. Uh, and in the adolescents, 7.8% uh, had a depression response. Uh, remission at 12 months was 10.3% uh, in 19, 10.2 in 20. Um, and if you uh, use the sort of less stringent standard of just including those who followed up, there still uh, was only 24% uh, in the uh, data we were provided, only 24% um, uh, had uh, remission. So uh, I would say there's probably a fairly substantial gap there. Um, hey, Harold, did you have a comment or a question? Uh, yeah. So, um, what is what can be reasonably expected if if we're finding that even those who did not follow up, uh, who I mean, if we limit the denominator to only those with follow up, because I could see that there's, you know, something, you know, a problem with follow up. But if we just focus on those, that that number of twenty four. Why is it that, you know, that there that it's so low? Um, well, Harold, you know the data as much as anyone uh, mm -hmm. around what happens in uh, fairly controlled uh, settings and controlled trials, um, and we don't get anywhere near a hundred percent there. Correct. Correct. Um, so, what should we expect? Uh, is that the question you're asking? Yeah, yeah. when we're talking Should about we a gap, fifty percent. Uh, you yeah, know, what? That, that, that's really the question: is what you know? Is the gap between what is even under the best of circumstances in a clinical trial, or is the gap you know more of a you know an effectiveness yeah. rather than an efficacy kind of question? Right. So one of the things, and this is my own opinion, has nothing to do with what we have here necessarily, is that we need more effective follow-up and ongoing modification of treatment. And I actually like this measure because it is looking at the long-term effectiveness of a treatment in a real-world setting. There was variation uh, in uh, the data uh, so that uh, people had response rates from 0 to 22.9% uh, in the adults, and they had 0 to 18.1% in uh, the adolescents. Um, there was uh, the box plots of, applied, which showed that there was variation from site to site. So while I not sure what the exact number is. I think we could do substantially better. I think we probably could come close to doubling our current remission rates at 12 months if there was more effective follow up and then action. Uh, and we used guided care uh, in a much more robust manner than currently is being applied. Uh, this is really tough, as you well know, even in the best of circumstances. Uh, but I think it's it's a worthy challenge given the substantial disability from major depressive disorder. Now, I'll get off my soapbox. That's just it. But, but I, I guess in, in, in some ways, uh, this it comes up on, under the gaps issue, but it also you know relates almost more to a usability kind of issue yeah. in terms of. Uh, you know where is the flaw in the in the system? Leaving us, you know, I mean, obviously there's a flaw in follow up, but where is the flaw in the in the in the system for people that were followed up? Is is my question? And I think you know, um, and and I don't know whether the measure developer has taken into consideration the results of the Diamond Project in terms of you know what's been learned from that about how. The measure is best utilized. Um, I'm going to make a comment here, if I, if I might too. Um, in some sense, it's really very complex treating depression, 
and there's so many things that can go wrong. In, in, a, in a funny way, um, what was nice about what I think Colette presented was, we know that if you don't get a PHQ-9, even if you're still seeing a patient, it counts against you as if the patient doesn't either respond or reach remission. So the fact that she was at least able to say, we can, for those that just didn't get the PHQ-9, let's subtract those and look at those that we continue to treat and measure and they still didn't get better. We can look at those two, you know, because if it's the PHQ-9, you know what you need to work on. Get them back in, remeasure. But for there's still a substantial performance gap for those you're getting and you're not still doing enough modification or step care or whatever it is to get them better. Um, and the fact that we have some of those tools, at least to do that, gives us some zones of what we want to focus on. But uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet, you know. Just like I think there was a comment about looking at each of these measures separately. And I think the first one that got listed when we were going doing our homework at home had to do with the utilization of PHQ-9 was one of the measures. And then some people made this comment about um, what does that have to do with outcomes? You know, and I would say in some technical sense, nothing. But if you don't have a tool to, to remeasure and see if you're getting better as part of the suite, even if it doesn't stand alone, you know, all, so some of what we're measuring are real outcomes. Some are sort of management tools to figure out where we need to start focusing our efforts to get things better in this tough area. It's my comment. I don't know. And so, I think oh. one of the folks uh, in our group commented that uh, this data uh, doesn't help clinicians necessarily um, find actionable steps in the process, which is true, but it provides a yardstick uh, for us. So, to a certain extent, I'd answer, Harold, that it's up to each system to find uh, solutions based in evidence uh, and develop those. But, you know, that isn't really, I guess it is GAP, but it's also, uh, are these things actionable? Yeah, yeah I mean, the uh, response measure versus remission that Mike was talking about earlier is, is another interesting one, because you're right, what we really want, and the literature clearly shows that we want remission so people can function well and get right. back to being what they were like before. But it's so hard to move the, the dial here that having some measure saying, well, we're sort of getting there, beginning to get there, they're halfway better. Although if you're, if you're a clinician like me and you see somebody in the office, they say, I'm halfway back to normal, doc, what are we gonna do to get me back to myself? But there's still a sense that you're doing something and you're making some progress, at least to keep clinics motivated somewhat. I don't know. Why, why do you have an interim measure like that, you know? And why does the literature look at that besides just for drug company and drug approvals? Response rates. Collaborative care setting, though, that interim measure matters because we would look at that to say patient doing well, keep everything the same, keep on going versus we should consider consider altering therapy at this point. Uh, so I think there is use in those interim kind of measures. Um, HRSA requires a few FH. I'm sorry, I can't talk to QHCs. Thank you um, to report on this measure also as a mandatory reporting, uh, but it's done just with the PHQ. Okay, can we uh, look at what we're gonna what we're gonna vote on? I think um, we. Yes, I, sorry, I wasn't sorry, sure, Tammy, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna say that the discussion veered a little bit, but a reminder that was actually the just the performance gap discussion. So this. This next vote would be just on performance gap for 0710E. Hannah, you're on mute. Thank you. And I thank you uh, for filling in a little bit as well there. Um, Okay, the options are also high, moderate, low, or insufficient. That was all I was going to add. Thank you. And I would think, Harold, you know, you might temper how you would rate the gap based on, say, the difference between efficacy and effectiveness.
Shall we proceed? Yes. So that was performance gap. The next one is uh, for you and Julie, a scientific accept acceptability, reliability. So um, the reliability um, uh, has to do with the specifications and uh, the actual reliability uh, testing. Um, there uh, was, uh, I think, uh, some changes uh, as uh, we've talked about uh, to the measure specifications uh, that um, they uh, folks at uh, Minnesota uh, Community Management uh, felt that uh, the Kronbach Alpha from the literature, uh, test retest reliability, um, and the differences between the uh, PHQ 9 and PHQ 9M were small enough uh, that uh, there didn't need to be separate testing of reliability in the adolescent population. It was testing at the accountable uh, entity level and uh, signal to noise was 0.944666. Very, very <laughs> ambitious there with the number of digits. Adolescents, it was 0 0.900, a little uh, less. Uh, and uh, they thought uh, that this indicated uh, the ability to distinguish higher and lower performing uh, clinics. Uh, they um, thought that the uh, signal noise ratio greater than 0.7 was good and uh, reliability scores uh, increased in the uh, adult population uh, slightly using a beta binomial test. Um, and there were some comments from our group about, well, is this really testing uh, the PHQ as a, quote, quality measure, uh, its, its reliability? Uh, and I would argue that uh, there's a fine difference perhaps in um, what uh, we might uh, deem as reliable. I think the measure itself seems to be have fair and appropriate reliability. Um, and I, I would be satisfied with that. Um, I would also be satisfied with the supposition that the PHQ 9M and PHQ 9 are similar enough to uh, not have to separately do that. But if you were a stickler, you'd perhaps want to see that. Julie, do you have further comments? You got it. Okay, uh, other comments, concerns be before we look at uh, the vote on that? On reliability, we're still focusing on reliability right here. Okay, maybe you could just show us what the vote would look like here. What our options are. Sure. Okay. Um, so for measure 0710E. For reliability, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Julie, I don't want to hog things. Do you want to do the, the validity part? Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll turn to validity. Um, there uh, has been uh, a fair amount of uh, work on constructability of the PHQ um, and uh, sensitivity and specificity are each 88% uh, ROC uh, curve uh, uh, analysis uh, showed that the area under the curve was 0.95, which is quite uh, good. Uh, there's been testing at the patient and encounter level, uh, encounter level validity by analyzing um, standard quality checks and audits. 
Um, a little bit concerning. Uh, they reported 49% of groups passed with no errors, 58% uh, submitted data passed in initial quality checks, 30% of groups that submitted data were audited, and 94% passed the audit. Uh, so there's certainly some um, wiggle room there that might affect validity and or reliability. Um, that said, uh, the validity testing at the accountable entity level uh, was done primarily by testing against other constructs. And sometimes um, these constructs are related, so I'm not sure how valid the validity testing is. So they did, for example, look at the correlation between depression remission at 12 months and depression response. Um, they looked at the correlation between response at 12 months and rates of follow-up. Uh, they looked at uh, those who receive remission at 12 months and patients who receive response at 12 months, but not remission. And a lot of things were uh, uh, had R squareds uh, ranging from 0.905 at the top to 0.2. 2, 3, or 2, 4 for adolescents when looking at remission and uh, response, but not remission. Um, they looked at a correlation between patients with depression outcome and diabetes outcome. Um, they wanted to uh, hypothesize that there'd be a uh, weak but uh, present correlation, and the R squared there was 0.12. Eight, um, and there was no uh, concerns uh, looking at a feasibility scorecard uh, with the data elements. Um, the exclusions uh, were in total about three point five percent, and included things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, personality disorder, and the things that. Uh, were talked about earlier, including death and hospice care, nursing home care. Um, the uh, interesting uh, area, uh, to me at least, was the risk adjustment. Uh, they used a logistic regression model uh, to look at risk. Uh, they came up with uh, things like the age, the initial uh, PHQ-9 score, which uh, was a few people's concern that uh, people uh, with higher uh, levels of uh, depression uh, may have an influence on outcomes. Uh, they also developed a de deprivation index, uh, which used uh, the uh, proxies of SNAP benefits, living under the poverty level, unemployed status, uh, public assistance, and single female with children. And uh, they considered race, ethnicity, language, country of origin. Um, they had some impact, but um, they didn't think there was a sufficient uh, basis for including those and that there was potential for implicit bias. Uh, they looked at the expected rates and in uh, their terms, uh, there was no, quote, radical shifts in the measure results based on the risk variables, uh, including uh, or indicating that the measure was stable. Uh, they did a R-squared analysis of the model for adolescents and adults, and uh, these both were quite uh, high at 0 0.97. Um, and then there was a question of whether there are meaningful differences uh, and uh, we uh, talked about uh, the range uh, here of 10% uh, uh, ranging from 0 to 23 approximately, adolescents 0 to 18, um, and uh, the box plots, I think, are fairly um, helpful in saying, yeah, there is uh, actually uh, valid information um, as far as being able to find meaningful differences. Um, there is uh, clearly um, a ceiling here uh, with none of the groups uh, doing horribly well. Um, and we get into Harold's discussion of, well, what, what should be 
uh, if you will, uh, what we're shooting for. Um, and then finally, there was a lot of uh, questions uh, about how to treat missing data. Um, in this instance, uh, you know, like uh, many uh, clinical trials, they treated missing data as non uh, remitters, uh, but they also did analyze the difference between um, including them uh, or not. Uh, and it changed uh, the data somewhat, uh, but not a huge amount. So um, the reported outcome uh, of those uh, who finished was about 24%, uh, but as was stated earlier by Colette, the uh, percentage of patients who had significant symptoms uh, remained about 50% uh, of individuals. So, a lot of information there about uh, validity. Um, there's a lot of uh, pros and cons about uh, including uh, missing data as non remitters. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to the committee. Uh, Julie, do you have any uh, color commentary? No, I put a question in the chat so that I'm not derailing us if people want to answer me there. Um, I don't think that we should, I saw somebody's note that we oh. should take the, we remove people from the denominator if we don't have the numerator, numerator and I think that's a mistake. Um, you know, I think that the goal is to get closer to doing well, to doing this, not to change the measure to match care that, you know, unfortunately is, is hard to access for difficult patients. Yeah, my own belief, and then I'll shut up here is that, uh, we really should be trying to develop systems to follow up and ensure that every patient uh, is uh, tracked. Uh, Lord knows uh, from bunches of people's work, that's very hard. And to follow up anyone over a year can be difficult, uh, particularly in this population, but that's what we should be aiming for. So comments from the rest of the committee. Makes it difficult to interpret interpret the data because what there's such a high data? high rate of missing data it goes in the denominator yeah it's yeah. it's artificially lowering performance um, but it's very difficult to interpret the data from this measure well i would argue bonnie that really what we should be accountable for within each of our clinics since this is a sort of uh, entity level measure is for actively following up those individuals. And loss to follow up doesn't mean that we should get a pass on that, but that's part of our job. Now, I understand that's a pretty stringent uh, perspective, but I think this is uh, actually a really good measure because of that. But, you know, there's reasonable I, people I, who are going to differ. I said my piece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could agree to disagree. Well, I, can I just say something? I, and I'm not sure this is a validity issue, as uh, but it there's a conflation between v validity and feasibility in a way. Yeah. Um, that because part of the problem that Bonnie is alluding to is the fact that it's apparently very, very difficult to get practices to get an initial measure that then, you know, uh, and, then, uh, and then a second measure within, uh, you know, a, a certain... Uh, you know, period of time. Um, I'm not saying they sh they shouldn't be able to do it, but apparently, in multiple sites, multiple settings, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not you know we're not able to do that, um, and so it raises a question of, uh, and I'm all you know I I think the, the the framework makes total sense in terms of you know using the PHQ nine, you know, initial assessment follow up, you know. Um, you know, improvement over time. I mean, that is something that is an ideal sort of clinical situation that you want people to do, um, you know, in terms of process. Um, but for some reason, we're not really able to to get it implemented. Um, and so we're, le we're, we're left with these kinds of, uh, you know, really big gaps of, you know, of actual data. Uh, and I think that's a real problem. Some people have suggested that we should make it more like um, the hemoglobin A1C measure for diabetes, 
where it's sort of at any, you know, at a certain given point of time in the past X number of months, you know, what is the status of, you know, PHQ-9 status of people who have been diagnosed with depression? Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, and it may be more of a matter of trying to get people to actually, you know, apply measurement-based care uh, as a kind of a, you know, continuous improvement process. I mean, but on the other hand, um, um, you know, I think what Colette said is that, yes, I, I, I know that the measure was developed in, in concert with the Diamond Project, but the results of the Diamond Project itself which was hinged on, on, on the uh, use of these measures was not terribly impressive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, you know, we're kind of missing some kind of secret sauce that actually, you know, enables this, this whole system to work. Um, I think Colette wants to make a comment here too, um, and has patiently had her hand up for quite a while here. And, and wants to make and wants to give us some data about follow up that she thinks is important. So, Colette, why don't you speak here? Um, yes, thank you, Michael. I just wanted to. There's so many questions about validity from the committee, but I wanted to clear up perhaps some misunderstanding about our data element validity process. It's kind of a stepwise process. The percentages we gave in our validation summary were the percentages of groups that hit everything right off the bat. In the subsequent paragraphs describing that, we indicate what kind of errors were found in like a pre-submission quality check, and those errors are corrected before the group can proceed on to submitting the data to Minnesota Community Measurement. So ultimately, out of all that validation process, there were only three groups who could not make the corrective action. So the, the data that we're receiving is very clean based on our data quality checks. And then we audited 30% of the medical groups submitting data and 94% of those completely passed that data element validity audit. So I just wanted to clear that up. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about follow-up. I cut that part out of my intro because my intro was getting long. Oh, let me just there. Okay, so a lot of people, and again, the discussion has gone this way, suggesting that inclusion of the patients with no follow up um, remaining in the ident in the denominator is a concern. And some suggested that the patients who are not assessed with the follow up PHQ 9 should be removed from the denominator. And 1 of the reasons that these measures were developed 15 years ago was to address this known gap in care related to patients with depression who are lost to follow up estimated to be as high as 80%. So having a measure that removes them almost creates the status quo, the status quo. So the decision to include patients who are missing follow up assessments in the denominator was intentional for the following reasons to support collaborative team based care and accountability for follow up. The measure is less susceptible to gaming or selective follow-up assessments. The condition of depression itself makes patients less able or less likely to reach out themselves for follow-up. So any efforts that we can make to encourage or help facilitate that is fantastic. The measure is patient-centered, striving for the best outcomes for all patients. And in our opinion, it's necessary to include these patients in the denominator to avoid having a measure whose validity is threatened by missing data. And we, like I had said earlier, we have been working really hard on increasing follow-up rates for patients, uh, have, a, have a ways to go in terms of doing that. Um, I know there's more questions. I can't remember exactly what they are at this point, but please feel free um, to share, thanks. Yeah, sort of one of the questions I had was um, just this issue. There's really no exemplars in this. I mean, if you look at it, if your highest uh, group is still, you know, below a quarter of the patients, maybe a little better if you take out the uh, non-follow-up, 
Um, it's not like anybody's discovered the secret sauce, as uh, Harold uh, suggested. I wonder what that means then for um, the future of this measure. If we're just missing something obvious, if there's the just the blocking and tackling that have to be done here, uh, or whether it's uh, actually much more deep. You know, let me make a comment on that, if I might. Um, and this goes back to your, uh, Carol, your comment about the diamond project where the results were not that outstanding. Um, in the subgroup looking at there in Minnesota when diamond was going on, the Mayo Clinic uh, uh, spent, was able to sort of support collaborative care in a much more robust manner than some of the other smaller clinics uh, where payment and then sustainability became an issue. Um, and their, their results were positive and statistically significant. It, in some sense, under the whole state, it gets lost in the uh, hubbub and the, uh, the noise kind of ratio. But um, one of the things that did seem to come out of there is that if you really are doing a collaborative care model with fidelity and somehow you have enough money and the payment structure makes it sustainable, which was an issue and drop off rate for the others, um, it looks like that really did give you statistically significant and important real clinical, real world results that were good. Um, uh, it's just that uh, we're in this grand experiment about how can you uh, support the elements you need to really get reliable, uh, better follow up as well as step care in the real world. So instead of making this too much of an intellectual yeah. <laughs> discussion, Perhaps we sort of look at how we would, how we're going to vote on this eventually. This is still the validity, if you remember. We've wafted on and off a little bit, but. Sure, I can, I can pull that up. Yeah, I just want to make a general comment. Say, we, well, we've I mean, been I doing think... these, oh. No, we've no. been doing measures for many years, and I think many of us have been you know, feeling measurement fatigue at our agencies because we tried to get a lot of measures out to move the field. I, I think as we are now in our, I don't know how many cycles we've done this now, moving towards quality and kind of sifting through measures to make sure they're doing what we want to do. I, I think it's something this committee might want to think about. You know, if it's not really just moving us in a, in a, in a grand direction and not a, not with, without specific goals. While that was good in the beginning, there's a lot of stuff out there, and we may not be contributing as much by being as um, as global rather than than at this point specific and having learned from our our previous measure development. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. Maybe I'm kind of addressing this to Harold um, in, in in terms of the work of our committee. No, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, David. I think that there's, you know, I, I'd be interested, you know, Michael, in terms of like, what was a se what was a secret sauce that the Mayo Clinic applied? You know, I see sort of see this measure as kind of being um, necessary, but not sufficient in a way. Yes. Yeah. I mean, part of what the secret sauce was, I don't know that I have all the ingredients, you know, of one of one perfect secret sauce, but the primary care docs were all revved up and, and really into it, as well as the psychiatrist. And uh, um, it, it was big and big, a lot of a lot of leadership attention, a lot of focus. It was primary care. It was psychiatry, both, you know, and the therapist all kind of working on this. Um, and it had just a lot of. Uh, Notoriety and uh, oomph behind it at that time. And, yeah, it's, and, hard to, it's hard to measure those things. Yes, it is <laughs> hard to measure those. And I don't think it's going to be one measurable thing that's the secret sauce, you know? And the world changes. And I just want to say money and reimbursement was it, it ultimately became a huge Achilles heel. Bonnie, it looks like you're saying something, even if your hand isn't up. I'd like to echo David's uh, comment that I think we're really at a maturation point now in how we how we think about um, these measures. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, so should we look at how we would vote here? Sure. Okay. So for measure zero, Kevin. 0710 on validity, 
your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay, well, uh, that brings us to feasibility. Uh, Julie, to, uh, I'll give you the opportunity here. Got it. We can keep going. Okay. We don't want to be hogging all the uh, quote Corey here. Um, <laughs> so, feasibility uh, is, uh, you know, uh, are the data requirements, uh, the elements uh, normally generated in usual care? Uh, are the required data elements available in electronic form? And is the data collection strategy ready to be put into operational use? Um, you know, I think they've demonstrated that um, this is uh, certainly feasible, at least within their setting. Uh, one might quibble that if you were to generalize this across uh, the U.S., that uh, some folks would have um, more feasibility challenges than others. Uh, but um, I think I'll stop there for the sake of time. Other questions, comments, concerns about feasibility? Yes, Mike. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I have some on on that. So some of my questions are, um, and I'm not sure it's just a it would be a quibble, Jeff, if you were looking to uh, do this across the rest of the country. But some of the questions are: Are the are the clinics getting reimbursed for sending the data? And then who's who's paying for? setting up the data repository and managing that um and then how are you how are they uh, accommodating it seems like they need to do double entry they need to enter in your platform and then also in their uh current ehr um but wondering you know you know who, who's paying for that because that's the biggest issue i see feasibility if we're going to look at a measure and extrapolate it across the country I don't know any other state that has that uh, registry set up that way, and uh, people are not generally yet sending everything electronically to the registry. So maybe you can discuss that a little bit. Okay, Colette. Hey, everybody. Um, just to share a little bit about feasibility um, for a very long time, uh, we have a high propensity of Epic users that are submitting this data. The PHQ-9 data is stored in the EHR, so it's a process of extraction. As we're working with our new data warehouse, by the way, there's no cost for participation in that. Um, a one-time feed of information is being submitted to the data warehouse and all of the denominator identification and the measure calculation with PHQ-9s that are coming in from stored tables is, is all occurring um, without the providers having to do any uh, denominator identification or calculation. And are you um, in more than just EPIC or is it oh, all EPIC? Yes, absolutely. So the warehouse is structured for submitting um, files of very standardized information and we've been successful in doing that in other electronic health systems or record systems, not just Epic, but the warehouse is accepting everything. And do the providers get reimbursed for submitting? So to, to try to answer that question, several of our health plans have these measures in their pay for performance contracts. So Minnesota Community Measurement is a nonprofit um, we are not charging providers for submitting this information and doing the calculations. As a nonprofit, we don't have the ability to um, reward or, or pay, but some of that is happening through our health plan pay for performance contracts. And additionally, this particular measure is in um, CMS's program recently, was in the Accountable Care MSSP program. Uh, now is in the MIPS and is an eCQM measure. And who pays for the registry? 
for maintaining it and staffing it and all the electronics that go behind the registry and accepting the data. Julie's going to answer that question. Thank you. Minnesota. Oops, this sorry. is Julie from Minnesota Community Management. I just want to make sure that you can hear me because I'm a little far away from the microphone. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, so Minnesota Community Management is funded by a variety of sources. Um, it includes member dues, which are from health plans and medical groups, as well as state government contracts, grant funding, and other various sources of funding. So if this was going to be national, how would how would that all how would all that get funded in every state? I guess would be my question. So we are not aware of too many other states that are sort of collecting this in such a comprehensive way at the state level. Um, but you know, as Colette mentioned, it's in CMS pay for performance programs. And so really the question of how providers get paid to do get paid to do this is something that we don't have a lot of visibility into. Um, but we suspect that it is incorporated into their value-based payment contracts. And I, I would say that there are examples of at least community-wide um, collection of data measurement uh, registry functions that are usually funded through uh, payers and uh, large uh, groups uh, because they think that it provides their employees with value and uh, reduces potentially medical expenses. So are yeah, I know that. To be judging this measure on the basis of a national rollout, potentially, or judging the measure as it's currently being implemented by Minnesota. Because I agree with Michael's comments. I mean, this might be extremely difficult to be a feasible measure for the entire country. Yeah, yeah Heidi, I, I, I mean, it's just me. I always look at the measures as their measures nationally, because once they get in place someplace, somebody else uses them, and then it makes them not workable in another area, because you don't have the infrastructure. Anybody know how it plays out with diabetes? That's the farthest along medically nationally. Um, I know it's part of the MIPS. I think most groups, uh, uh, or do participate, you know, I, I don't think it's quite inventing the wheel, even though I don't know exactly what. No, but it's a HEDIS. Isn't diabetes a HEDIS score? So it's actually in. Yeah, and you're actually sending lab data and stuff, which is a little different than this. Right. Well, it's not that it's much different than getting a PHQ-9 from a, an EMR. Well, it's a lab test. The results would be uploaded by the lab company. Right. So that's a whole different process than this. This we're making the, the provider shoot it to the registry who then does the evaluation. And but also it's not it doesn't require sort of two points in time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of threats. That's, to that's, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge in a lot of places is the two points in time thing. So getting back to feasibility, other comments, questions or concerns about the feasibility. Um, I, I think again, I think the feasibility problem is kind of what what Michael and others were talking about is that, you know, that in order to feasibly implement this, it really only works if you have a registry. Yeah, and not everybody has a registry. Right. And um, how do I want to say this? I mean, I think any chronic disease you're treating, if you want to sort of not lose everybody to follow up and figure out what you need to do when. You got to have a registry, any medical disease, not just depression and not just diabetes. I, I think it's coming, even if it's by fits and starts. And, and, and I would just guess, Michael, that the reason Mayo did well is because they're big enough to support the registry internally and the extra care management people that you need to then do the follow up. And that might actually be why. Yeah. I mean, Epic or any modern EHR can extract data. Um, usually from, a, you know, a trained analyst, uh, and that's how we port off information to uh, CMS or to local, uh, managed care organizations. I don't think that this is any different. Uh, there is the tracking over time, which I think is a slightly different issue, but I think conceptually it's very feasible. 
No, it's just what Colette said. Colette said that you can easily get extracted the data from an EHR. I think the follow up and the management requires a registry and the team to work. Right, with. exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's more of a, I would say, a use and usability sort of thing in some ways than. So, uh, but the way I see it, I Jeff, is that you, you can extract the data from most all EHRs, right? And not all, uh, all EHRs keep every question. Some just yep. keep the total sto yep. score, so yep. you can extract it. But all on the back end, that would mean every state would need to fund a registry and fund the staff in the registry. To it's it's more of that extra piece of it, not so much. Yeah. Funding. I hear what you're saying, Michael. Yeah. Bonnie, you were going to say something. Yeah, I I think to Michael's Michael's point, this would be a tough one for state Medicaid agencies to use. Why? Because there isn't a registry. I mean, to Michael's point, Michael, maybe you want to state it again. Yeah, I mean, they they need to have all the infrastructure on the on the back end. So it would mean every state or whoever's you know reviewing it would need to put in all the infrastructure to have the registry, have the electronics, have the servers, have the people on the back end who are going to manage it the same way they're doing in Minnesota. Yeah, and, and don't really, what, what I think the difference we're focusing on, which is totally correct, is that you might be able to get the measurement data out of the EHR automatically, but to to actually do a good job, you need the team and you need the uh, uh, all the other stuff to to work a registry. Totally, I totally agree. So back to feasibility. <laughs> so we can. Do you want to see how we would vote on this? Yeah. And just also to point out that a big chunk of the behavioral health workforce is kind of a cottage industry without access to those kind of resources. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think we keep using circular logic though, which is we don't do it because the structure doesn't exist and because it's really challenging to do. And so maybe we, we're not ready to do it. And I think in behavioral health, if we don't drive it forward by saying, this is the expectation and it may take a while for us to get there. And we sort of undermine our own ability to improve. I think the systems change is the only, and the, that quality piece, I, I would love to see a quality measure about sort of systems change rather than sort of these discrete measures, but this is what we have at our disposal right now. So, uh, Joint Commission uses a structure process outcome approach. Yeah. The first structure step was use PHQ-9. And then we mixed the process, which means maybe it should be hire an analyst team of 50, and then you get an outcome that makes, that make, that makes sense. So maybe there is a missing step here. Yeah, I, I think, the, David, I think this step is in the, in the structure piece that every practice should have access to a registry. Right, instead of just PHQ-9, which is the item 712, I guess I was looking at, there's a, a, a measure that's related to this. Yeah, so use registry and, and track, track the PHQ-9s, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. it's a sustainable yeah. way to pay for it. Yeah, the structure thing is you have a registry and the process thing is you are measure, you're measuring stuff using the registry. And you, and you have a sustainable way to um, support the staff and the processes you need to do that. Right. And you trust that. You can so act on the registry results. Yeah, I mean, we're going to fix the entire healthcare system today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> People see enough about how you're going to vote regarding the uh, feasibility. It's high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And maybe we can go on from feasibility to use, which we've kind of already nice. half talked about, you know. Right, yeah, um, you know, 1st of all, yes, there is public reporting and uh, it's used in accountability uh, programs. Uh, there is uh, the CMS MIPS, uh, the uh, ECQM. Uh, we've got uh, the Minnesota uh, health uh, scores uh, and then uh, some of the neighboring states evidently also use this uh, in bordering communities. Um, you know, the other question in this is, um, could this be used for accountability and performance improvement? Well, I mean, I guess it's being used for accountability. Um, the whole thing based on feedback, 
uh, there have been changes. So there is some uh, um, feedback loop that uh, currently exists. Um, but, you know, one of the concerns that we've already talked to death about is, uh, is this really enough evidence that this has been vetted in the real world or is Minnesota really sort of a special uh, exception to the uh, 50 states and five territories and other things that are measured. So I'll just stop there. Other comments, concerns, Julie, anyone else? Well, then maybe why don't you show us how, how we're going to vote on this? Great. So for 0410E, um, for, oh, sorry. Use. Yeah. My apologies. For use, um, your options are pass or no pass. That's 0710E, just for the record. Okay, and then usability, uh, just to remind us of the definition, the extent to which audiences uh, use or could use performance results for accountability and performance. I'm never quite clear what's use and usability, but um, there it is. Uh, progress toward achieving the goal of high uh, quality health care. Um, the problem here, as we've already talked about, is we don't have trend data because of the respecification of the uh, measures, um, there's the issue of overall benefits from and harms. Um, it's hard to imagine that there was a huge amount of unintended consequences or negative uh, harms related to this. Um, the um, developer did do a survey of medical groups. Uh, have found that 55.9% of uh, them rated the measure as moderate or high value, which is somewhat surprising. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, we need to decide whether this could be used for furthering high quality care and do the benefits in the measure outweigh any potential unintended consequences, uh, despite, uh, if you will, the challenges potentially of generalizing this uh, beyond Minnesota. Any other comments or concerns about usability? Hearing none, maybe you can show us our options and voting. <clears throat> Um, so for 0710E for usability, your options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And then I don't know if we're going to go on to replate related and competing measures, or do you want to table that? Well, before that, before that, we talk about overall suitability for endorsement. Yep. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Well. That's just a matter of uh, showing us the uh, yes or no. Correct. Anybody want to make any comments on it, though? Yeah, my, my own. It's already been made. <laughs> yeah, I think we've already made uh, the discussion, so. The one, no, I won't say anything. I, I can share the slide just for clarity if that's helpful. Go for it. So for 0710E for overall suitability for endorsement, your options are yes or no. So finally, for uh, relating competing measures, do we want to take that up or not? We're actually going to skip that for today since we're not voting. 
um, because we only hold that discussion on measures that are recommended for endorsement and we won't have those results today. So um, we'll bypass that for now. Thank you. Okay. I have said what I have to say. <laughs> and I think uh, Harold's gonna, gonna uh, um, facilitate uh, our next measure. Is, can I jump in before you really quickly, Harold? Sure. This is Tammy again. I just wanted to remind the committee um, because I know there is a lot of overlap in the criteria in these discussions. And so it is easy to kind of get into the wrong area. So I just wanted to remind you that one of the reasons we discuss in order is because there's a hierarchy to the criteria and some are must pass and some are not. Um, and so it's important that if the committee has concerns that their voice specifically about the area and the criterion that they apply to so that the developer knows where the issues are in the measure and where where the committee has no concerns that that provides um, more clear feedback about the composition of this measure. So that's all just a little reminder and I'll turn it back to Harold for 0711. So, yes, mom. <laughs> okay, so this measure is basically the same as the measure we just talked about, except it's a, the pressure on emission of six months. And so maybe we could frame, uh, be more efficient uh, for how we address this measure by thinking of it only as uh, really focusing on comments that have to do with how this measure is different from the previous one. Are the issues any different um, with regard to this measure than the previous one? Um, and so we don't sort of rehash what was discussed before. Is that okay? Is that okay with you guys, Bonnie and uh, Caitlin? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I will. I will do my best. Uh, just a quick disclaimer: This would be my first time being a lead discussant, so please bear with me. I will be leaning on Bonnie heavily. And you um, should. Give the developer also, a quick intro first, too, just yeah. as a reminder. Okay. Right. And also, Colette, if you could, you know, in your re introduction, uh, you know, focus on that as well. Um, great. As promised, my intro is short. This is basically the same measure construct as the previous measure, but the outcome is assessed at a different time. So, again, looking at adolescent and adult patients. Um, with major depression or dysthymia and an elevated pH Q9 greater than 9. Who reach remission at 6 months plus or minus 60 days after an index or starting event. And again, the remission is defined as a PHQ 9 or PHQ 9 M less than 5. Hey, Bonnie. Uh, I think Caitlin's going to take the lead on this. Okay. Um, Yes, so I will, I will try to keep this uh, concise, but um, just to review some of the evidence uh, that the developer presented to us, um, we have um, a mix of um, clinical guidelines from reputable organizations, guidelines from the DSM-5, and um, a presentation of um, a few randomized control trials, and then some qualitative and observational studies um, in some of the um, the uh, RCTs, uh, there is data that demonstrates a relationship between the interventions and the patient outcomes. So we saw um, a, a study by Utzner et al. where we had assessments at baseline 3, 6, and 12 months where we saw um, patients showing a decrease in depressive symptoms, um, increased rates of treatment, higher satisfaction, lower depression severity, and less functional impairment. Uh, we saw at six months that Hugner et al. Um, showed that nurse telehealth improved clinical outcomes. And at six months, we saw Simon et al. Uh, showed that uh, use of a care manager uh, by phone significantly improved outcomes. There was also separate studies that showed um, that use of the PHQ-9 as a clinical instrument um, is effective and reliable um, assessment tool in depression treatment, uh, and that was by Duffy and Lowe. So, based upon the NQF's algorithm for evaluating clinical evidence, we would move to pass um, on this measure because um, there are health outcomes related to the patient's daily functioning, depression symptom uh, improvement, um, and there's a relationship between um, those said health outcomes and the interventions and services delivered throughout the course of depression treatment, as I just covered. Um, 
Additionally, um, I think Jeff already covered this, uh, but there was uh, the study by Khan et al uh, that identified that this, this is important to the uh, patient uh, population that we are serving. Um, the patients identified goals for, uh, regarding social functioning, prevention of future reoccurrences, and management of their depression. Um, and then as far as some of the unique comments uh, to this measure uh, provided by committee members uh, in the pre-evaluation uh, period, um, they mainly uh, felt that the evidence provided by the de developer adequately supported the measure, um, and specifically certain committee members identified that clinician follow-up use of the PHQ-9 and clinical intervention could achieve outcome improvement. One committee member did identify that there's a potential issue with the timing of the PHQ-9 assessment. I think that um, Colette has um, adequately addressed this question, um, in my opinion, but we can certainly discuss that more if needed. Um, and there, just to, to clearly report on this, uh, there was just concern that um, the measure evaluation cases where if there was a first visit with a positive PHQ-9, if it were not the first visit for treatment, um, and then wouldn't capture a baseline um, and or the effectiveness of the, the treatment thereafter. Um, last uh, thing I just want to mention with regard to evidence is that we did have a comment by the American Medical Association with regard to um, the timing of um, of depression treatment, um, and there was concern about the evidence not demonstrating that remission can be successfully achieved um, within the six month time frame. Again, I believe that Colette uh, elucidated that, that it's it's actually a little bit more time than that. Um, and then there was a request for data that demonstrates which practices um, can be implemented um, or processes uh, that could be implemented would lead to improved outcomes. Uh, so with that, I um, would turn it over to my co-lead, Bonnie, for additional comments. I have no additional unique comments. Maybe open it up to the group. Evidence. It's kind of a cut and paste kind of job, right? Yeah, any other comments from people with regard to uh, evidence? Again, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure there's a difference here in terms of evidence at six months versus 12 months. Um, you know, the only thing one could argue about is that uh, perhaps that, you know, if you're measuring things at six months, you have an earlier opportunity to make, you know, to make an intervention. Should we move on to the next category? Yes, so the next category is opportunity uh, for improvement. Um, and um, again, this is um, similar to what we already heard uh, from Jeff is that um, the, the sample that was presented by um, the developer showed um, 11% um, of adults and 8% of adolescents showed remission at six months. Um, and uh, this goes back to Harold's question about what can we reasonably expect um, on those metrics? Um, and then um, jumping off of that, um, you know, with regard to Jeff's point about there, there's just a clear need for better follow up um, in uh, this patient population. Um, regardless of what we uh, want to uh, make a goal for uh, for remission, um, and then um, and then just you know reiterating Michael's point about um, the measure allowing us to identify earlier um, within the course of treatment um, those who are not doing better despite showing up for follow ups. Um, and giving us opportunity to try other interventions um, or pharmacotherapies, combination therapies, if that's not already being done. Um, and then do I, do I keep going to disparities at this point? Okay. Um, and then um, as Jeff already reported, uh, there were disparities with regard to insurance status um, and race. Um, and um, then most committee members who provided pre-evaluation comments 
uh, felt that there was a need for or felt there was opportunity for improvement uh, demonstrated in the evidence provided by the developer. Um, and one committee member did bring up the point that uh, the measures being considered for application nationwide, uh, Michael um, uh, Larry Nardi had brought this up in the last discussion, um, and uh, in this separately, this other committee member um, was worried that the Minnesota population or this representative sample may not actually be representative of the greater population in the United States. Um, however, another member made an asynchronous counterpoint, suggesting that with depression increasing during the COVID pandemic, measuring improvement in depression treatment is more important than ever. Um, and I would personally um, also support that sentiment. You know, we saw um, the work of Mark Seisler, um, who did a longitudinal study with his team during the COVID pandemic, where they surveyed 5,412 adults across the United States in June of 2020. And they found the prevalence of depressive disorder was at 4X reported, um, or 4X to that reported um, in Q2 of 2019. There was also a twofold increase in the prevalence of suicidal ideation. Um, and with follow up surveys in September of 2020, the prevalence of adverse mental health symptoms among US adults remained uh, elevated compared to pre pandemic em uh, estimates. So um, I think if we want to apply this nationally, there's at least one piece of evidence that would support that. And at this point, I will turn it over to my co lead, Bonnie. Yeah, and then just to remind, since we're on the gap, um that um, the performance is probably underestimated because the missing data is still in the denominator. Um, other comments uh, uh, with regard to um, importance to measure report and on the performance gap. Okay, um, you know, what, 1 of the things just this is a sort, sort of a side comment, but. You know, the 1 advantage of, you know, having a measure at 6 months, not waiting a year. Um, is that you could do something about it. <laughs> and, and 1 would wish that there was something you know, that, that the measure actually included something that could be done about it. That you know, there were if so that it included some, and this is sort of a, again a side comment, but that you know, if in fact there's um, you know still significant symptoms, you know, is somebody taking some, is the provider taking some action to um, intensify response? Anyway, that's sort of a wish for a thing. But um, so uh, unless there's any other comments on the uh, performance gap, let's move on to scientific acceptability. Oh, right. Here's what we need to say about importance. Um, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to clarify that um, for evidence for this outcome measure, your options are pass or no pass. And then for importance to measure and report performance gap, your options are high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. So let's move on to scientific acceptability. Okay, and um, I'm to remind you that the numerator statement is the number of patients in the denominator who reached remission with a PHQ9 or a PHQ9M <clears throat> result less than five, um, six months plus or minus 60 days after an index visit. The denominator statement is adolescent patients 12 to 17 years of age and adult patients 18 years of age or older with major depression or dysthymia and an initial index of PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M score greater than nine. Um, the denominator exclusions would be patients who die, who are permanent residents of a nursing home, are enrolled in hospice, um, they are excluded from the measure. Um, additionally, patients who have bipolar or personality disorder, schizophrenia, psychotic disorder, pervasive de developmental disorder are also excluded. Um, as we, I think we clarified, uh, the data source are electronic health re records. 
Um, we went over the um, specification changes. Uh, they are the same for this measure um, and include things like including adolescence, PHQ 9 M tool, the plus or minus 60 days, and so on. Um, now, the uh, developer referred to prior evidence of encounter level reliability um, of the PHQ-9 from the literature where the alphas were within range to indicate that PHQ-9 measured the same construct consistently. And additionally, there was a strong correlation between the PHQ-9 completed by the patient in the clinic that was administered telephonically by the mental health provider within 48 hours. And then of that same sample that um, we have been looking at, um, they were included in the testing of this measure. Reliability statistics were provided at the clinic for all levels, uh, or at the, sorry, at the clinic level for all clinics, um, where there were greater than 30 patients in the denominator. Um, and then the developer also presented empirical evidence at the accountability level using the beta binomial model. Uh, signal to noise was good, uh, was high, uh, 0 0.94 um, for adults. And then for the adolescents, they were measured with the beta binomial reliability performance score. And um, that was 0 0.89. And uh, those both demonstrated the variability in the measure is attributable, attributable to real differences in the performance. Uh, the differences between the PHQ-9 and PHQ-9M uh, were, were surfaced, but again, they appear to be minimal as Jeff already covered. Um, and so, Bonnie, I'll turn it over to you for any additional uh, comments. No, I think it was a, kind of the same drill. Uh, they used the data that they could use for the reliability testing. Um, and like you say, they, they used the um, Beta binomial model to distinguish high versus low performers by the at the at the ac accountable entity level, which I assume is the medical group. Harold, you're on mute. Let, let's move on. Uh, you know, and let's try to push through before the break so that we can sort of. Take a break, uh, you know, once we finish this and so let's move quickly. Sure, so, um, validity is almost exactly the same as what, um. Jeff presented in terms of, um, you know, the, there was an addition of the neighborhood deprivation index, um, and there was risk adjustments made for for variables, including case mix insurance product, um, and, uh, PHQ 9 score. Um, there was the same. Um, encounter level validity testing ran um, using a mix of demographic utilization and clinical outcome data, which performed well, um, which Colette had clarified for us. And um, and then I think, I, I'm not sure, uh, Bonnie, I'm going to lean on you a little bit here um, to um, add, add comments. Uh, again, I think this is kind of a cut and paste, no additional unique comments. Compared to our discussion earlier on the on the twelve month, right. And so, uh, show the voting options. Hannah. Yes. Sorry for the pause. Um, okay. So for reliability, your options would be high, moderate, low, and insufficient. And for validity, your options would also be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay, let's move on to feasibility. So again, uh, this, this measure is captured through electronic health records. It's currently um, being extracted. Um, there are plans for using a new warehouse um, where the measures can be uh, calculated centrally. There's no fees associated with this. The main concern um, within this um, area was that there was only use of one depression screener where other tools may be acceptable. Um, and there's, there was also, again, the concerns about the timing um, or lack of reassessment, which again, I believe Colette already addressed for us. So I, I think it comes down again to the earlier discussion of this is 
dependent on a registry data. I agree. Okay, and uh, use and usability. Now, the measure is currently being used as part of an accountability program um, and in all primary care clinics um, and outpatient clinics in Minnesota, um, in addition to surrounding states. And, um, and the um, results are reported publicly. The uh, medical groups have an opportunity to um, appeal the results before public reporting. And then um, the developer did um, something I thought was was kind of nice is they they put together um, a multi stakeholder expert work group to review updates to their measure and um, that's that's all I have for this area. Bonnie, anything from you? No additional unique comments. Okay. Um. So Hannah, can we show the uh, any any other comments from anybody else? Okay. Uh. So. Uh. uh Hannah, do you want to show the the voting on feasibility and the voting on um, uh, and the voting on uh, overall endorsement? Oops, I was muted. Uh, so for feasibility for zero seven eleven, you have options of high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And then I think I heard discussion of use, um, yeah. which is pass, no pass. And then next would be usability. Okay. And then, uh, anything else that people want to add to the discussion on this measure? Sorry, there was just 1, um, last concern that was raised by a committee member that I just wanted to surface and that was regarding the mix of patients being served at some practices. Um, and they may be more clinically severe and psychosocially complex patients, which are outside, which is outside of the. Clinic and providers control, um, but generally the rest of the committee uh, felt that there were no one unintended consequences um, or apparent harms associated with the measure, and that there could be potential benefits uh, for patients being treated uh, for depression. That's it. Thank you. Um, and just the final uh, voting category. Oops, usability and use. And so for usability, it's high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Sorry, Harold, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Okay, and then for overall endorsement. And that's a yes, no vote. Okay. Good, so I think we can take a break now. Um, Tammy, when will we re... Uh... We're going to take a... 10 minute break. So let's, uh, my clock just went to 229. So let's come back at 240. Let's take an 11 minute break. Okay. You're being kind of Eastern time, just to be clear. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord. Well, I think we can go ahead and start. Um, Michael, I see that you're on. Harold, are you back? Maybe we just give Harold a second. Michael, are you leading this measure or is Harold? Uh, I'm leading it, yes. Why don't we just give Harold another second to get back? Okay. But I think it is a sign to me. Yeah, I think it's Michael's. Oh, well, there's Harold anyway, so we can go. <laughs> Just want to make sure at least our coaches are here. Go ahead, Nico. So, should I? Are you saying start or? Okay. Well, the next measure we're going to talk about is uh, depression response at six months. Um, and once again, we've talked about many of these things. Our uh, uh, we'll ask Colette. Uh, to once again, sort of give us a very short uh, highlights of things that are different about this than the things we've already talked about. So go for it, Colette. Great, thank you. So this measure is a little bit different in its construct. It is not seeking remission at a certain point in time. Rather, it's looking for the same denominator of patients, but it's looking for an outcome of response. And response is defined as a PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M that is reduced 50% or greater from the index PHQ-9 score. So response is considered progress towards remission in which is, which is the desired patient-centric goal. And as these measures were being implemented early on, there was um, also a preference from providers, and I think this was shared before, it is not easy achieving remission, and these measures um, kind of like give you credit or let you know that you know you're part of the way there or you're making progress with this patient. That's all I have to add. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have two discussants listed. Uh, Bonnie, who at least earlier I have not heard her talk. Is Bonnie the, Bonnie around? I know Caitlin is. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, who's going first? You or Caitlin? You, you uh, I, uh, Caitlin and I are tag teaming, and this time I'm going to lead, and she's going to support. Gotcha. Okay. What a what a nice organized team sub team you are. Yeah, it's it's all Caitlin's. Um, but bottom line is, um, this is a a, a measure as a Colette had mentioned. Um, adolescents twelve to seventeen and adults eighteen or above. Uh, they have to make the diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia. And um, the outcome, the proximal outcome is basically a 50% or more reduction in either the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-9M score. And this can be detected anywhere between four months to eight months from the quote index start date, which is defined as a major depression diagnosis first charted plus a PHQ-9. Um, and I assume then that in this case, again, the most recent screener is used within that four to eight month time window after the index start date. Um, so uh, bottom line, as far as evidence, it's um, similar. Um, to the other 
indicators basically based on uh, depression guidelines um, based on um, scientific literature that supports use of the PHQ-9 um, and um, actually nothing much new there. Okay. So I, I think the big issue was the question for the committee is that, um, you know, if you do that, is there a change? So I'll stop there. Okay. Other, uh, well, Caitlin, do you have anything to add? I don't on this. Okay. How about other uh, comments, questions, concerns from committee members? Yes, one one thing it seems to me that the biggest difference with this one is that you you again you need two points in time to compute it. Yes. Yes, you need two points in time. And as Colette had mentioned earlier, there is a problem with the regression to the mean. Um I want to ask the developer something because uh she indicated somewhere earlier that she had some data regarding um uh, frequency of follow up and impact that had. And I wonder if that has much, even more salience when you have such a in the six month versus the 12 month timeline. Collect, can you lose it? Is that part of what you have data but weren't able to give before? Um, yep. Why is this not going down? Uh oh. I reorganized my notes and now I can't find it. Um, my apologies. Oh, that's because it's in the last measure. So, um, for the HQ9 assessment measure, we had a lot of um, comments about no evidence for using a PHQ9 frequently. And so we did some um, analysis on the data. And those results, um, so we looked at a population of about 26,000 adults and found that those with 4 to 12 PHQ-9s during the assessment period were three times more likely to achieve remission or response outcomes at 12 months as compared to patients who were assessed only one to three times. So the odds ratio for remission was 2.79 and 3.36 for response. Or basically, patients with three or less assessments had a 6.3% rate of remission as compared to 15.8% for those patients who were assessed more frequently. Patients with three or less assessments had a 10.5% rate of response as compared to 28.3% for those who were assessed more frequently. Okay, thank you. Michael, you have your hand up. Yeah, and so I, I have some of the same uh, issues that I brought up, I think, with the uh, the first measure. So with this, it's, um, yeah, what's the magic? Am I supposed to be, as a clinician, am I supposed to be, are we targeting five for remission? Or, are we, or is the evidence more you really need to look at a 50% reduction? Uh, and I'm not sure why. Yeah. We necessarily need to have both when you could do that calculation with just the one measure. So is there evidence that says 50% is better than going to five? Uh, so those are some of my questions. Okay. Uh, Colette, you have your hand up regarding this evidence? Yep. Is it okay if I respond? Yeah. So um, in terms of, I mean, there is strong evidence and that's related to the cut points of the, P of the PHQ-9 tool itself that uh, a value of zero to four um, indicates mild or no depression symptoms. So that is um, pretty straightforward. Um, so when we talk about just going to five, it's actually remission is defined as less than five. In terms of response, um, there are some literature articles that talk about a five point drop in the PHQ-9 score is considered clinically significant for difference. So even if a patient comes into the denominator, for example, with a PHQ-9 of 10, um, they, they would, well, also, they would also be meeting remission, but that five point difference in the response would also um, be indicated by clinically significant difference. And uh, again, as I said, that providers wanted to get credit 
for improvement that does not necessarily convert to remission right at that moment, but again, progress towards remission. So, so, so is there a reason why you didn't use five? If 5.2 decrease is a good number, why you chose 50% instead of just five? Um, that's a great question, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, I will try to conjure up what I think occurred at the measure development process, which actually occurred prior to my start time here at MNCM in 2008. Um, but if I think of a patient who has a PHQ-9 score of 25 and they come down to five, I mean, granted, that is making improvement, but, you know, probably not as much as improvement as we would like to see, or I'm sorry, do this, correct me, 25 to 20, dropping just five points would not be the realm of what we were looking at. And I know that there were other comments um, by the committee members that maybe disadvantage people who are starting with a higher PHQ-9, um, and perhaps maybe Michael or Harold can speak to this, but um, Reducing that PHQ-9 score by 50%, if, if you have someone that's in the very high range, is right. definitely a, a wonderful kind of metric, especially as you're measuring progress towards remission. But even going from a 10 to a 5 is also important. So, so just to clarify again, the, uh, the proximal outcome is a 50% reduction in the score from the index start to the most recent PHQ-9 within the four to eight month time window. And um, that again, patients who initially score high have higher probability of meeting a 50% reduction compared to people that start their episode of care at a lower PHQ-9 score. That would be a correct statement, Bonnie. Thank you. Any other discussion on evidence? I think we did derail a little bit into usability, so I apologize. Okay, uh, hearing no other comments then, um, I think for evidence, uh, it's either a pass or a not pass, right? Yeah. So maybe we don't even need to see the slides. <laughs> you know what that is. We could save 20 seconds here. Yeah, I, I agree at this point, I think people have those, those uh, choices emblazoned in their mind. Right. So really the question is, is there enough evidence that uh, this is meaningful? Seems meaningful to me. So, to, I won't say anything else. I'm sorry, what were you saying, Bonnie? So, just again, the, the evidence presented is similar. It's a guideline concordant care, the, um, the strength of, of the measure itself, the PHQ-9 uh, guidelines used at the VA and a qualitative study on. All right then. Um, so people can write down for themselves how they're gonna vote when we do it electronically. It's either pass or not. And then the next issue we'll look at would be performance gap. Right, and again, the, for the performance gap uh, using 2019 data because specifications had changed after that. But so based on 2019 data, uh, uh, patients from 550 clinics, it was on average a 19.4% of patients from the index visit had a decline of 50% from baseline or within the six month time window. So 19.4 with a range of zero to about 37.2% uh, across these clinics. Um, and what's really important here, and I appreciate um, the uh, developer actually in this one included the amount of missing data and it states 51.6% of adults were not reassessed after six months of treatment. Um, 
So among their teens, again, 2019 data, 12 to 17. Here, the sample size was 118 clinics. On average, it was a 15.5% that um, had in, met this criteria for uh, response at six months. The range was zero to 27.7%. And again, um, this was really helpful, and I didn't see it in the other applications. The developer included the amount of missing data. And so it was 55.6% of teens were not reassessed after six months of treatment. As far as disparities, um, they did stratify by insurance status type um, and race. Um, they found that there was um, a range as high as 17% among white patients compared to 11.4% among black patients. Uh, which could be confounded by a uh, clinic and medical group uh, for 2019 uh, for 118 clinics. Um, it, there was some difference by insurance status such that 13.7% for managed care versus 16.2% for other. And um, when they stratified by race, they found a uh, range as high as 14% among whites to 6.9% among black patients. I don't know, Caitlin, do you have any other comments? I think you covered it. Okay. Other comments, concerns from other folks about this particularly about the um, performance gap in this measure? Okay, um, uh, I know it's it's a Likert scale with uh, high, moderate. What exactly? What are the possibilities for this? I don't remember the exact terms you use. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to say the options for the votes verbally um, for the rest of the meeting if that's helpful for folks. Um, so the options for the vote on gap for measure zero. I'm sorry, 1884 are high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Okay, then uh, we're on to reliability. Okay, so on reliability, uh, just to summarize the uh, the work group's uh, feedback, um, there was comments that the specifications were clear. Um, there was an issue that there's a request for uh, whether the criteria for maintenance was met, given that there was a change in spec specifications, which does not allow uh, looking at use of this measure over time. Uh, there was concerns and I think echoed from prior discussion that data systems do not accurately uh, detect change in PHQ-9. Um, and given the reliability test and given this data source, again, it was running a, a beta binomial uh, to differentiate ability to detect high versus low performing clinics. Um, and then there was also a comment uh, about the PHQ-9M which is relatively new, um, that it requires reliability testing, um, but in all fairness, this person also commented that it would doubt it would differ much from the PHQ-9. So that's I have unreliability. Caitlin? Sorry, no, nothing further from me. Committee members? No, just the, the the same issues we talked about before with the uh, yeah. And, and meaning, is it redundant? There is it doesn't add anything. Is what you're asking? Was what you're yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking about that, um, and uh, I, I know Colette said you know there was sort of this funny map of some organizations were using twelve month. Remission, some were using uh, six month response. It was a funny hodgepodge of, of which large organizations were using picking which which isolated ones amongst the suite. Um, and uh, I don't know how to respond to that. It's just an interesting notation note something I noted. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, and if you play it out over the country, then which states are going to decide to use, you know, the the remission versus which are used in the response? And if I'm a provider in multiple states, I'm doing multiple things all across the country. Yeah, you know, this is one that personally, just as a clinician, I've kind of find, found it useful uh, to to sort of keep myself and keep my patients sort of motivated to keep working on things, you know. Um, even though it's not the real deal, because you really want permission, but to sort of, sort of say, don't lose heart, we're getting there, you know, that kinds of stuff, don't give up, keep coming. <laughs> Let's add another. No, I, I, I think those are important things, Michael, to look at. Um, but I think you can look at them with the current measure. Um, right? It seems to me that this was put in just so providers who weren't making five could say, get some money because they are moving the needle. And that was really the only reason. I mean, uh, otherwise you could just look at your data and see who's moving or not moving yeah okay um how are we going to be voting on that? so there are no other comments so um for this particular one we're going to be what are our options for reliability hannah uh so for 1884 for reliability your options are high moderate low and insufficient okay and we want to go on to validity then? Right. Okay. So on validity, there was concerns because missing critical critical data elements were um, uh, apparent. Um, uh, says here, developer does not present all critical data elements. Uh, internally examined correlation between um, the remission and response measure given this data source. That's all they could do. Um, so it does raise questions about selection effects and, and uh, not sure they really could adjust for that when they looked at convergent validity. Um, two people stated bluntly no, one said okay. Uh, for threats to external validity um, exclusions, one person felt was appropriate. Um, there were some concerns about statistical methods to measure meaningful differences. No follow up data versus original PHQ 9 could falsely lower results. Um, and that's that's it for the group. Caitlin. I have nothing further. Okay. Committee members. Well, hearing nothing, what are our options for this, Hannah? For validity on measure 1884, your options are again high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Okay. So then feasibility. So feasibility, uh, bottom line of the measure is using EHR data. Um, and as Colette had mentioned, um, they do the data abstraction and, and the analysis based on the patient level. Um, the uh, developer acknowledges that they want to have the PHQ-9 as part of standard care. So that's what's really driving this measure as well as, you know, the spirit of, of really giving credit if there's some response. Um, and I think Dr. Trangle provided more of an individual patient level scenario to support that. There's some concerns about inconsistency with approach with the joint commission and CMS pool. Of measures again, the registry um, issue comes up versus other claim, other types of data sources. There was some concern that this is difficult for providers to report. Um, there was one concern that six month time window was too short. Um, we've also heard in our discussion that six month is also an advantage that you can detect um, like treatment resistant a little bit earlier. Uh, so. Um, and there were just some concerns about implementation of this was a concern. I'll turn to Kate if I missed anything. I think you got everything. Uh, other committee member comments. You know. Hearing hearing this uh, reminds me of some of the data that I'm now recollecting from the Diamond Project in Minnesota, where the average if someone was going to reach remission, the average time they would reach remission 
uh, typically five months. You know, there was a huge spread and I can't tell you the confidence levels and that kind of stuff, but uh, that seemed to be the average. Other, okay, our options for voting on this? For measure 1884 for feasibility, your options are high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. Then we've got use next. Yeah, so uh, comments from the uh, ad hoc committee on use. Um, difficult to interpret the data, performance results, um, uh, reported back to the clinic um, some concerns about um, what the group would do with it at, at the group or the clinic level, the provider level. Um, I think that, you know, to your point earlier, Dr. Tringle, like that, you know, in routine outcome monitoring, um, uh, looking at responses can provide a, an opportunity for the physician to talk with the patient, um, encourage the patient, um, but that's beyond what the data is that we're going to get here. Um, there's there was concern about lower performing clinics having more clinically severe, complex, treatment resistant patients. Also, on this on this response, it might be that the fact that people are not worsening, but um, may not have made the fifty percent mark. Uh, should be interpreted carefully. So I'll stop there. Kayla. I, I think just underscoring the point that um, there's the psychosocially complex patients where it, it simply may take longer for them to show effect uh, with treatment and this measure may miss that. Yeah. And I, I apologize. I missed something. One of our work group members commented positively that um, there was potential for early detection of depression in teens. Um, I think it's. I think that might be true if you're doing PHQ nines, but I think this measure is really looking at response. Um, and there was one member that felt that this could help develop and use more effective interventions. But again, I think that this is really just taking the temperature of whether there's a 50% reduction in score. Okay, other committee views, opinions, questions, comments? Okay, our options, Hannah? For measure 1884 for use, your options are pass or no pass. Okay. And how about usability? Is that you, Bonnie? Oh, no, I, I, I combined all my comments with usability okay. and use together. Okay. So, any other committee comments on usability? What are our options for that? For usability for measure 1884, your options are high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. And then the last one would be uh, overall suitability. Right. That's a yes, no vote. Anybody want to make any last minute comments about? Whether we should endorse it or not? Yeah, I'm, I don't. I don't think we should. I don't, you know, because you can do. You you can see if someone's making progress or follow up with them with the current uh, PHQ and getting to five. If you're not at five yet, I need to follow up with you. I don't know that fifty percent makes that much difference. It seems to me it's just put in place, just so some providers could get some reimbursement from. Yeah, whoever was reimbursing them in the state. Right. Yeah, I kind of thought the same thing because the other six month measure will tell you whether or not the patients are actually getting better. Yeah, I, I, I always think it's a really interesting discussion about, um, 
you know, what we do clinically, what we advise to do clinically for our patients versus what the bar is for a quality measure, particularly for national use. I, th I think it's really important we not muddle that. Other comments? Someone's moving their mouth. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Jeff. I uh, was trying to be a good boy and mute myself. So, so I, I don't understand Michael's comment altogether because if I start at 25, having the bar be I get down to five is basically making it a remission measure. What you want to do is measure response. So, do I have a 50% response? Or maybe I'm not understanding what you're um comment is is about michael mm -hmm. yeah i i'm not sure that you can't get that just using the current measure you're going to look at you know wh where someone's at say they started at 20 and now i'm reviewing them three months later they're at 18 they're 17 whatever um you'll see what number you have if they're moving or not i don't think it's just showing that they're 50 percent Shows me anything, right? I, I, I'm not seeing the benefit of that. I agree clinically that if if my patient is still scoring quite high in depression, um, that's that's not a response. Well, I mean, I think the the literature would show that uh, that is a response. Now, you may because of the. Uh, remaining depressive symptoms or the score on the PHQ decide that you need to augment therapy, or maybe you decide with the patient that the balance of benefits and uh, harms from side effects is such that you want to change therapy. But I actually think it's a very important part, but I mean, we don't, we're not going to resolve this and I think uh, we're going to end up voting as we feel, but I, I understand now what you're saying. I, and I agree. You should look at it. Right, but I'm I'm just in disagreement about making it a measure across national. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah, that's fair okay. enough. Anything new to add the discussion? I'm sorry, I missed part of it. But I just want to say, I I just in general, I like the idea of a response versus remission. It just seems to me when you're talking about depression, it's a chronic relapsing condition, and so you know, it this these endpoints don't necessarily take that chronicity in. It's kind of a it, assuming sort of a linear response. Um, that this is also, I guess, a measure that looks at individual outcomes. I think performance as opposed to system outcomes. I was thinking a 50% response, you know, d decrease could be like, uh, you look at drug doses. There's an L50, LD50 about when 50% of your drug is eliminated. You know, can you show is 50% an indicator? And then you can think, well, is it 20%? Is it, is it 10%? I mean, I think it has all the validity problems, but I, I think. We're getting closer to a workable construct with me than the previous ones that we looked at 710 and a 711. So uh, I think these are moving in a better direction, but I don't know if they're there yet. I think there's still lots of, you know, uh, uh, logic um, um, questions that need to be resolved. Okay. So just one thing I, again, is this is not really, I don't know if it's a comment on a measure or is this a, a wish for thing, but. It, it, you know, I, I would almost prefer that this wasn't an outcome measure. It was more of a process measure that you found that they were, uh, you know, not really, um, you know, getting towards remission. And so, therefore, you did something else. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I would almost prefer that as a kind of measure at six months. I, I agree. It, it's pretty well suited as um, yeah. like a guideline. You know, for stepped care, right? Yeah. It's what it is, and it's not a measure. Unfortunately, we have what we have. Right. But just All for right. future for future measure developers. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move along then to our next measure. Which Harold, I think is I assume if we're alternating, this should be you. Uh yes, it's me. And so this one, like the one we literally just discussed, let's just focus on the difference between, you know, is there anything different we would say because it's 12 months? Okay. 
So let's hear for the measure developed. <laughs> I thought you were going to go for the vote. <laughs> yeah, we could do that, but let's hear from the measure developer first. Do we have a quorum? <laughs> Um, hi, this is Colette again. Had to find my unmute button. Um, like the previous measure, this is a measure of response, but at 12 months, the percentage of adolescent patients 12 to 17 and adult patients 18 and older with the diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia and an elevated PHQ9 or PHQ9M greater than 9 for progressing towards remission by achieving a response, which is a PHQ9 or PHQ9M. 50% or more reduced from the index visit. The adults um, had a measurement of 17.0 with the range of 0 to 32.7%. Adolescents, 4.5% with a range of 0 to 29.1%. And this particular measure um, is used in Minnesota and publicly reported, but it's also used in the CMMI innovation model for kidney care choices. And that's all I have. So I, I think our lead discussant is Heidi. Yep. Am I correct? And, um, and you don't have, you're not paired with anybody. No, I'm not. Okay. Um, so, so you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in an effort to not belabor the points, um, the, the pre pre committee meeting feedback was that there was strong empirical evidence um, that the measure was well established. Uh, it measures the response to treatment and their measured provider. Um, the developer provided information that uh, that there was a evidence to support a need for this measure. So anything different about th this one versus the six month one as far as you yeah. can? Not really. Yeah. Okay, and um, so uh, do we and need this, to go yeah. go through the um, the evidence choices? I think it's just a pass fail, right? That's correct. This is an outcome measure, so your options are pass or no pass for measure eighteen eighty five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, so let's move on to importance. Yep. So there's um, the gap, gap in care and opportunity for improvement. Um, the measure developers provided uh, data that 17% of adults and 14.5% of adolescents had depression response at 12 months. Um, the decrease during COVID also is illustrative of a performance gap and urgency for this measure. Um, the measure developer also did present uh, differences in racial groups and insurance status for both adults and adolescents. Um, and that's, that's really, um, the committee's feedback and it doesn't seem to differ too much from the six month. So that's for both, uh, um, performance gap, uh, and, uh, and also importance, uh, and so, um, any other comments from the committee? Other committee members? Okay, let's um, move on to scientific acceptability. So, the um, committee asked us to think about whether there were concerns um, about reliability testing between the PHQ and the PHQ 9 M. Um, and do we think it could be implemented, uh, consistently? Um, most people didn't have any issues, um, that the data elements I thought were clearly defined and descriptors were provided. Um, but there were concerns that data systems might not actually capture the change in PHQ 9 score. 
Um, so not, again, not much different than the six month. Any other comments by other committee members? Um, what about validity? Um, not a lot of concerns about validity. Uh, there were two comments that it that it doesn't pass due to missing critical data elements, and that the developer didn't present results for all critical data elements. Um, so the testing threshold isn't met. Um, Exclusions were clinically appropriate. Risk adjustment was handled appropriately. Um, there are conceptual relationships between potential social risk factor variables and the measure focus. Um, and people seem to generally there seemed there was a little bit of um, discourse on whether or not it was a valid measure or not. Um, and the developer included differences in performance among clinical sites, uh, reports of the 12 month follow up are the lowest. Um, so, again, pretty much the same issues from the 6 month measure. Okay. Other comments from other committee members. You know, I guess uh, I'm trying to noodle through the logic here. Um, if you aren't respond or if you're responding by 12 months, but you haven't gotten to remission, is that really a good thing? Uh, and in other words, it's yeah. either that well, it's not definitely not a good thing. <laughs> you know, you're fussing around here and not uh, you know getting the patient treated appropriately. Or they have, you know, really uh, resistant depression, um, but it, it's sort of it doesn't feel right to me to be talking about response and measuring that and holding that up as a goal at a year from your initial measurement. Is that a use question or a? I don't know what it is. <laughs> no, <laughs> I agree with you though. And especially if you have the six month measure. Yeah. yeah. And you say that a person is improving at six months, but haven't has not reached remission at 12 months. Well, that's sort of a problematic, I think. I don't know. Yeah, and then there's yeah, the issue I'm... of relapse and so on, but anyway. Right. Well, that's true. I, I, I think you 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 make a very good point in saying that, well, if this person has been you know, sort of, you know, only part way there after a year, you know, what have you done about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, but, you know, I guess the other data is, well, it's really hard to get to remission. I, yeah, I think the other part of this is, do we really need all five of these measures? And I guess we'll maybe get to that later on, but. So, yeah, and Jeff, to your point, at the end of the 12 months, you could still have a patient scoring in the depression range versus a patient that does not. Sure. Because it's a 50% reduction based on right. the baseline PHQ-9. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could have someone who was 26 and is now 13. Right. Or... More. Or 10 to a 5. Yeah, yeah, or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you got it. So. Yeah, it feels odd to give somebody credit for that. Right. right. That That's where I I just feel uneasy. I, I understand sort of what the developer and uh, the clinicians in Minnesota are trying to do, but. I mean, it almost makes sense to me, and I know we're not supposed to be looking at all four measures together, but if you wanted to look at, okay, is there a partial response at six months and then full remission at 12, that seems a more logical stepwise approach than having all four. Yeah, I would agree, but I don't know. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of assumes that life is linear and one thing, you know, one thing causing another thing, 
Yeah, uh, I think in some sense, people <laughs> lose their jobs, they have this, you know, things happen. They, they go off their meds. They for me, for me, I keep it's thinking. Not as, it's not quite think, as pure and clear as it, in real life, I think. No. You, you could have been in divorced and married three times within that year, <laughs> right? And so. Well, that's true. <laughs> if you're just asking your marital status, it doesn't really mean something. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, where are we at? I, I'm sorry, I just. I, uh, I, validity. Did anybody else validity have any is where we are. Validity. So, and again, uh, uh, Hannah, the options for validity. Yeah, for high measure 1880. Moderate. Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone going to say something? No, it was just, it's the high, moderate, low. Exactly. Okay. And then insufficient. Correct. Okay. And the same with reliability as well. Right. Correct. Let's move on to feasibility. Is there any um, is there any difference in feasibility? No. no. All the same comments, except for one. Uh, like it's okay. So there's one difference that a six month time frame may be too short based on when patients receive follow up care uh, versus medication management only. So it it might be better to measure this at twelve months rather than six months if the six month time frame is too short. Hmm. Although, on the other hand, at the six month time frame, you could do something about it. Yeah. Right. And this isn't measuring full remission, it's response. Okay. And um, uh, what so about? So I think it's the high, moderate, low, insufficient again for feasibility. Right. Correct. The, any other comments from the committee? Okay, let's move on to uh, use. Uh, that it's used as a quality metric for CMS, CMMI innovation uh, model, the kidney care first group. Um, and that's really the only difference between this one and the Six month measure that this is is being implemented somewhere else. Okay. Other comments. Okay. And usability. Um, there was promising improvement from 2010 to 2019 for adults. Uh, no apparent harms or unintended consequences and the positive response from the Minnesota medical group. Um, again, harm benefits outweigh the harms. Um, same, same six as six month comments. Okay. Um, and the voting options. For use, your options are pass, no pass. For usability, your options are high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay. And then um, any other comments from the committee on usability and use? Okay. And now overall suitability for endorsement. Any comments in terms of people's, you know, views on that? Hannah? I mean, um, excuse me, Heidi. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, no, no other comments. Um, other comments from others in terms of sort of the overall gestalt of this one and any differences from the previous six month one? Nope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess to summarize, it's just, you know, I think to my mind, the difference when the six month one is that the six month one, you could do something about with this one at 12 months, it's, you know, it just seems odd to give somebody a positive mark. Right. It seems financially motivated rather than clinically motivated. Now, are we not allowed to discuss the related and competing measures? Because 
this is sort of the fourth in the series of measures. We're, we're reserving that discussion because it's only supposed to happen with measures recommended for endorsement. And since we're okay. not actually voting, um, we don't know yet which measures are being recommended for continued endorsement. Okay. So we're on our last potential measure to talk about today, right? Um, That's right. And uh, if we can get this done, we don't have to schedule an extra meeting if you guys want motivation. That's right. <laughs> so, and this is one we haven't talked to death yet. <laughs> it's a little different. Um, so it's, it's a 712 depression assessment with PHQ-9 and PHQ-9M. And uh, Colette, I assume it's going to be you that's going to give us the uh, uh, three to five minute uh, uh, summary here, right? Thank you. Yes, so this measure is a little bit different than the outcome measures discussed previously. This measure, the denominator of patients is not dependent on their PHQ-9 score. Rather, it's looking at the percentage of adult uh, adolescent patients 12 to 17 and adult patients 18 and older who have a diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia who have a completed PHQ-9 or PHQ-9M tool during a four month measurement period. So just to kind of explain the context, so a patient is seen either in the office or virtually and they have this diagnosis, the patient is assessed with the PHQ-9. This is a measure that we've been able to trend over time for the adults because it has not changed. Uh, currently, we are at 77.7% with a range of 0 to 100% for 192,822 patients. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the end for over 248,000 patients. Um, since the statewide rates have increased since 2010, have increased 22.7 percentage points from 55% in 2010. Um, and the denominator of note has more than doubled for this measure. So um, that kind of reflects more screening is happening, more depression is being identified, and practices are doing a, a good job of trying to assess their patients. Um, Let's see, it's a supportive process measure, a companion measure to the outcome measures without frequent and ongoing assessment of the patient's depression symptoms. One cannot successfully achieve patient goals of improvement or alleviation of depression symptoms. It also serves as a purpose for a gauge for overall use in the tool relation related to the outcome measure. When this measure was initially endorsed as a paired process measure, a committee member stated that the easiest way to avoid having your outcome measured was to never give the PHQ-9. This companion measure informs the use and promotes frequent administration as a four-month measurement period is used. Uh, this is different from a screening measure, which would assess the population regardless of diagnosis. This is focusing on patients who are diagnosed with depression or dysthymia. Depression is considered a chronic episodic condition, and there's value in assessing for increase in symptoms, which may signal a need for a change in treatment. Simply administering a PHQ-9 tool itself in isolation will not improve outcomes. Administering a PHQ-9 is like taking a blood pressure. You need to do something with the information to affect the outcome of hypertension. Depression is now being considered the sixth vital sign by many, and assessing patients is critical to identifying depression and improving outcomes. Um, I had shared some data previously, but we looked for empirical information in the literature, could not find any, and we analyzed our own data, finding that patients who were frequently um, assessed with the PHQ-9 were about three times more likely to reach re remission and response. Um, and this measure is reported on our consumer facing website and, and in our annual quality report. This measure has also been adapted for use in NCQA's electronic clinical systems data program. 
Okay. When you say frequently, uh, what, what does that mean? If it's frequently used, you get three times the remission rate. What's frequent? Yep. So we divided the data into patients who had received only one to three PHQ-9 assessments versus patients who received four to 12 PHQ-9 assessments over that 14 month period. Um, and again, the difference for the less frequently assessed patients had a 6.3% rate of remission compared to 15.8 for those assessed more frequently, i.e. four to 12 times. And those with um, three or less assessments had a 10.5 rate of response compared to 28.3 for those that were assessed more frequently. Thank you. Uh, uh, so is that the new stuff? Should, should we go on to the next phase collected or do you have something else? I, I, I don't have, have a question any... about the, um, the, the numerator denominator just to kind of understand the indicator. So when you're saying the uh, uh, PHQ-9 within four months, so you get a diagnosis and within that diagnosis, you have to have your index PHQ-9 within four months or is this the follow up it, to a first PHQ-9? Appreciate your question, David. It is not related to identifying a patient for index. So it is, it is unlike all of the other outcome measures. The difference is um, we're looking at a, a four month period because a 12 month period would be too big. Getting a PHQ-9 once in 12 months is not gonna benefit frequent assessment. So a patient who has depression on their encounter and is seen, like for example, October to January, in that four month time frame, we would expect that they have at least one PHQ-9 assessment um, in their record. Does that help? Yes. I don't know why the numerator doesn't say person diagnosed with depression, does it? The denominator does. Is a, so the oh, numerator is is having a, having a tool. I dyslexia flip flip those two around. Thank you very much. You bet. So even if they had a PHQ nine on the the first day and they had the diagnosis the same day, then that counts. Correct. That would count. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our discussant here is Marissa, right? That's right. You, you ready to go talking about the evidence? Yeah, ready to go. Um, so the developer did provide updated evidence for this process measure. Um, the evidence that was provided was largely a summary of clinical guidelines for depression for adults and for adolescents, um, which include use of the PHQ-9. The developer did not provide data that directly linked the performance of the PHQ-9 with outcomes. I think what Colette just shared was in response to the preliminary finding uh, or to the preliminary uh, grading of, of moderate, actually. So, so that was um, some new information we just heard. Um, so that was why, and I'm sorry, not moderate, it was rather uh, rated as insufficient as a result of the lack of empirical evidence. Um, so I think as a result of that, Colette provided the information she just did. Um, in terms of what the subcommittee thought, um, all of the comments indicated some degree of agreement with the rating of insufficient and felt that the measure would be stronger if it was linked to improved outcomes and that that would allow for more meaningful quality improvement. Um, at the same time, the, the subcommittee was pretty sympathetic to the challenges of doing this comparison in light of the fact that not doing um, the PHQ-9 would mean missing diagnoses. So I think overall there was a real thirst for more information, but also unanimous support from a clinical perspective for the measure. And I think the, um, the associations that uh, Colette just provided um, might be satisfying to the subcommittee, at least uh, in terms of, of looking for a little more data. So I'll pause there. Okay. Other comments, questions, concerns from uh, committee members? Well, this is interesting. I like it that it's short. Um, so, so, so I, 
I guess our options are, um, are regarding evidence that we're not going to vote on now, but vote on later. So what are our options here? It's uh, pass or not pass, correct? Um, no, on th this is a process measure. So for these oh, okay. types of measures, um, evidence is an assessment of high, moderate, low, or insufficient. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think the last thing that I would just add, I thought the um, the metaphor, or the the analogy rather, to the blood pressure was helpful to me as I was thinking through this. That doing a screening in and of itself doesn't yield a uh, improved outcome, and so it, it's it's what happens as a result of that screening. And so I think that's important for me. That was something that helped me think about you know our expectations relative to evidence. Um, need to be cognizant of the fact that outcomes um, aren't aren't uh, a result of doing a screening necessarily. All right, should we move? Are we moving on or is there more discussion? Uh, well, if I don't hear any other comments, let's talk about performance gap. Okay, so 1st, in terms of performance gap, so 2020 data for Minnesota found that the rate of usage, as we heard a few minutes ago, is pretty high about 78% for adults and 78% for adolescents. Um, and there was a lot of variability among medical groups with a um, range from 25 to 100% for adults and 8 to 100% for um, adolescents. We did not have standard standard deviation or interquartile range reported. Um, there was no disparity data for this measure, but there was data provided surrounding the um, logical outcome measures. And so there was disparity data cited around um, depression, follow up response and remission. Um, and, uh, you know, consistent with what we've heard earlier today, you know, non white populations were found to have lower rates of depression, follow up response and remission than average. And there were also age disparities um, given the widespread um, undiagnosis and under treatment of depression in the elderly. So that's um, performance and disparities. There was no standing committee feedback provided in this area. I don't know if that was actually a. Um, Maybe a, a typo or uh, in the document, but I, there was just none listed in the in the PDF I received. Um, but I would say, in summary, you know, in my opinion, I think the variability in the rate of usage does suggest some performance gap, and there are clearly some disparities of concern for certain racial and ethnic groups. So I think this is another situation, much like evidence, where it'd be really nice to have data linked to the measure and not just outcomes, but I think we have to be reasonable with what we can expect from a, a screener. Okay. Committee member comments, questions, concerns? And once again, I, well, I, I think there are options for this, what are high, moderate, low, and sufficient? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. okay. The next one would be uh, reliability. Sure. Um, so I think we went through the numerator and denominator in some detail, so I won't repeat those. Um, and and uh, you know, exclusions followed a lot of what we've been discussing today. The data source or electronic health records. So. In terms of specifications, the subcommittee raised no concerns around consistent implementation of the measure. Um, there was one comment uh, expressing concerns about the way that PHQ-9 completion is recorded, um, noting that not all EMR systems may record PHQ-9s uniformly or adequately. Um, and so it can be difficult to accurately capture completion of the metric. I didn't know if the person who made that comment wanted to speak to it. I wasn't completely sure um, what the concern was about, but it sounds like, you know, what made this different than any other degree of, um, consistency, uh, of any other e e EMR record. Doesn't sound like, like there's, I, I didn't have that comment, but just some EHRs, they just take the, the total score and they don't give you the each line response. So it's um, harder to compare that over time. That's really the issue. Got it. Thanks for that clarification. Well, um, if I was a clinician, not seeing that, I mean, I'd have to look at the raw data to know what's the what is this person not sleeping? What's the if they suicidal? What, what's the issue? You know, it's like uh, it would be totally insufficient to work with. 
Yeah, and I think that that goes back to a comment that Julie made earlier, which is that PHQ-9 question 9, which asks about um, Suicide. suicidal ideation, I think does is probably the in particular the 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 question that um, would set the treatment course apart maybe from from the other questions. But isn't this measure just asking if they have a PHQ-9 completed? Not, you don't need every line item to know if it's complete, right? Yeah, for this measure, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That that, that will um, the the concern that was raised by the comment had to do with the PHQ-9 as a tool. You're right, not about um, this measure per se, the way that it's extracted. Right, it's about, it's about Would most EMRs have a place to record whether or not it was done. I think certainly the EMR system in in the system I was most recently working at did. Okay. Actually, that's a question. And this is one of those new measures that's that's really useful clinically for management as well as useful for measurement. Yeah. Uh, which of course could be its downside if all you're if you're only focusing on the measurement. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Just to clarify, is the data element that's required to be reported a yes no or is it the full um, metric. This is Colette. Um, in our previous data collection system, we are um, getting counts of patients and the expectation is a completed PHQ-9. In the warehouse system, we are um, getting summary uh, PHQ-9 scores and the expectation has always been that um, an incompleted tool really doesn't count as administrated um, administration of a PHQ-9. I see. So they have to report they have a completed tool. That's correct. And if they, in some places, use a PHQ-8, does, does that get counted? So we've had that question recently. Uh, can the PHQ-8 be used for all of the measures? Uh, that's a fairly new question. And currently, um, we are not accepting a PHQ-8. Uh, and our work group actually did not evaluate and examine PHQ-8 uh, back when we did the redesign. But currently, no, not a, a PHQ-8 is not considered the same as a PHQ-9. Julie mentioned, and she asked in the chat whether a PHQ-2 or 3 would suffice, to which I assume the answer is the same. It would not. That's correct. The answers no, those would not suffice. So again, this is not a screening measure either. A PHQ two would suffice for a screening measure. Okay. Um, should I speak to reliability testing, or do we pause after specifications? Well, just uh, for reliability, it's uh, high, moderate. Low insufficient, right? Just to remind everybody what the way you're going to vote, so you know if you're taking notes. Great. And then, in terms of the reliability testing, um, the developer did calculate the Cronbox alpha and test retest reliability. Um, and the PHQ9 actually, and I, oh yeah, the, the scores were about 0.9, so fairly strong. Um, there and then the PHQ-9 has also been validated in adolescent populations, but as we've uh, made reference to before, the PHQ-9M, which has some minor language um, adaptations to be more understood by an adolescent population, has not undergone separate validation studies. Um, and the developer did attest to that version having essentially the same nine questions, but has slightly different wording. For example, I, I looked it up, and I think you know it asks instead of asking about work, I think it asks about your ability to function in school, for example. So fairly minor, but meant to um, speak more to an adolescent population. Um, in terms of the subcommittee comments on reliability, um, so the preliminary rating, by the way, was moderate. The majority of the subcommittee had no concerns. Um, one person did raise a concern with the, what they basically stated is given aggregated data, the team is left with beta binomial model to statistically explore capacity to distinguish higher versus lower performing clinics. Um, another person I think felt that the P 
HQ9M should undergo reliability testing um, since it's not undergone separate validation studies. Uh, so I think those were the, the, the gist of the concerns raised by the subcommittee. Sorry, uh, hearing no comments, then our options would be high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And why don't we then move on to feasibility? Uh, or validity, you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, validity. Sure. Um, so, in terms of validity, um, the developer tested construct validity in the literature using mental health professional re-interview. Um, the PHQ-9M for adolescents was not independently tested for validity. Um, the developer also did some empirical and counter level validity testing by looking at the results of standard quality checks around elements like date of birth and exclusions. And most of those passed the quality checks. Um, however, the results of testing on all of those critical data elements was not provided. Um, and so it did not meet NQF criteria for sufficient critical data element testing. Um, at the accountable entity level. Uh, the developer analyzed correlation against a depression outcome measure to test the hypothesis that clinics that do well assessing their patients with a diagnosis of depression frequently with this measure will also perform better at achieving remission. Um, and there were weak positive associations for both um, adolescents and adults. So the preliminary staff rating for validity was moderate. And overall, most subcommittee comments raised no concerns. Um, a few subcommittee members raised some concerns with the issue of not having sufficient, da sufficient data elements at the um, encounter level. And with the fact that the, um, the associations at the accountable entity level were somewhat weak. Those were the only two um, things I picked up on. Any questions, comments, or concerns members want to say here? If not, our options for this are. I think this one's also the Likert scale. Yeah, it is. It's the high, moderate, low, and insufficient. Yeah. And, fe and feasibility. Great. So there were no major concerns raised by any of us regarding feasibility. Um, data are quite easily collected in the course of clinical treatment um, and well integrated into most EHRs. The PHQ-9 screener itself is free and publicly available, um, certainly as I found as I quickly Googled it. Um, and I would say in my experience working for a large health system um, on the administrative side, it has, even I'm well aware as, as both a patient and uh, as a non-clinician, how, how very well adopted it is into most practice workflows. Um, there was one comment that stood out to me in which um, the basically the commenter said, you know, the developer is indicating that the PHQ-9 may not be a standard part of care in many settings, which this measure is trying to change, um, noting that there's sort of a conundrum of, of that this commenter saw in having the developer advocate for a single depression screener noting that the Joint Commission allows a pool of validated measures for suicide screening um, and so forth. So I don't, I don't know that this necessarily has any major impact on feasibility. It was just kind of um, an interesting comment that this is one of many different measures when it comes to um, suicide in particular that, uh, that entities may choose. Um, and I think that's important to recognize. So that's, that's it for feasibility from my standpoint. Any burning comments? I just have a question. Is this uh, um, measured at the provider level? Because if it's measured at a system level, I have the same issues with the, uh, you have to have a registry set up in your area and you've got to push the data over to the registry. But if it's at the provider level, they would have the data themselves. Mm, can the developer confirm that? I'm sure. So the, the, the data is measured at the patient encounter level and it's rolled up at the clinic and or medical group level. Okay, fine. So I don't have any issues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then once again, it's the Likert, high, moderate, low, or insufficient. And then we've got use. Yep. 
So the measure is being used in all primary care clinics in Minnesota and in bordering communities in Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa. It's publicly reported. It's used um, in an accountability program, specifically in the Minnesota community measurement that we um, heard about earlier. And, and Minnesota um, community measurement does also, um, uh, or actually Minnesota health scores, which I, I actually don't know if they're exa exactly their association with Minnesota community measurement, but it is reported publicly in a consumer facing um, website. In terms of vetting and feedback, Minnesota community measurement surveys all medical groups in Minnesota to assess the value of the measures and to collect input from stakeholders on the experience of data collection and submission. Um, apparently, this is the venue in which the developers got the feedback with which to uh, add adolescents into the measure. Um, and the subcommittee comments indicated that there's pretty solid use. Uh, in terms both of utility for the accountability programs and also for performance improvement. So no major concerns were raised. Okay. Any committee member comments, questions, concerns about use? Okay, and for this particular is this am I correct in saying for this particular measure it's still passed or not passed? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Then usability. Um, so in terms of improvement over time, the developer provided data showing gradual improvement in the measure um, from, from about 55% in 2010 to 78% in 2020, and that's for adults, of course. Um, the developer also noted that during that time, the denominator of eligible patients has more than doubled. Um, and so this demonstrates increased screening overall for depression. Um, the subcommittee didn't seem to have any concerns about unintended negative consequences or potential harms. The subcommittee comments indicated support for the inclusion of adolescents um, when it comes to offering opportunities for early detection. Um, in, I'll just add my own experience from implementing zero suicide um, in a in a uh, large health system is something that I think um, Julie alluded to earlier, which is that when these screeners are done and when someone um, especially answers yes to that um, question nine about suicidal ideation, um, there is you know there there can be major impacts on on uh, the clinical experience, not just for that patient and for the time that it requires that the provider invests, but for other patients, um, the provider may need to see in that day. So that's something that we certainly heard from a lot of clinicians in the system I was formerly with is just that um, this the, someone saying that they're suicidal on the P9 question nine has has real impacts on what happens um, next. Obviously, I think a sense of real responsibility for addressing that concern, but also sometimes um, uh, ripple effects on the rest of that provider's day. And then the only other concern that was raised here is about um, liability. So sometimes concerns at a provider level that the screener could place them at increased risk for medical liability if they detect a, in particular suicidal ideation, but don't feel they have the resources to do something about it. So I think those issues around suicide is where um, some, some anxieties can lie on the provider side, but. Just want to mention that. And that's it. Okay. Committee member comments, concerns, questions. Alrighty, then this is of the Likert scale again. High, moderate, low, and sufficient. And then the very last question is overall suitability. And by the way, I forgot to mention, I don't know if this is the place to, to note that the AMA um, first provi provi or asked a question in public comment about whether the developer intends to submit this to each ECQM, given its similarities to another measure, um, 0710. So that was just one question I had for the team if we need to address that. The other was I wanted to note that Stephen Inman from the Children's Health Network sent a public comment supporting Reendorsement, um, given the impact the measures have had on um, lots of different aspects of behavioral health care. So, sorry, forgot to add that earlier. So, Colette, you want to come? Uh, you want to answer her question? 
Um, sure. Actually, um, this measure was specified as an ECQM and was part of CMS's um, program for that, but it through the rulemaking process since then, it is uh, was dropped from the rule, so it's no longer in the ECQM program, but definitely a measure that can be captured digitally and reported with ease, like, like all of the measures. Thank you. And is there a reason why it was dropped from the ECQM program? So CMS's rationale was that we were already capturing PHQ-9 with the outcome measures. So not necessarily seeing the benefit of having that overall kind of assessment and monitoring measure. And they were trying to reduce the number of measures in the program. You mean the outcome measures we consider today or other outcome measures? Um, specifically depression remission at 12 months is the complementary measure they um, chose in place of this. Is that correct, Colette? Um, they had both of them in the program all along and they decided about two years ago to drop this particular measure from the ECQM, feeling that they were getting that along with the depression outcome measures, but they truly are two different measures with different purposes. So does that mean they would not have the data that you presented to us? Like how much of your bad score was from not measuring with the PHQ-9 and it being counted as uh, not getting better versus of the people that actually continued to get measured, how many weeks for mission and how many didn't? Right. So. You know, um, CMS has different methods of, of collecting this information. Um, one of the nice things that we have about collecting this information in totality is we have how all of the outcome and measures kind of play together. We also have two additional measures that we did not choose to seek endorsement from all along, and those are the rates of follow up at six and 12 months. So we have all all of those measures to better understand the patient population. But, um, oh, Michael, to kind of further answer your question, CMS does have a related measure, a screening measure. So it's the percentage of patients who are screened for depression. And if there's a positive, then a follow up plan is documented. So that might have been part of their decision why to not continue with this particular measure. So anyway, we're considering overall suitability of the measure here. And um, other people have comments or uh, concerns or just things they wanna say about it? And when we do come to vote, that's that's a yes or no, correct? Anna? Correct. Um, and then what happens we vote and then we talk about the competing measures after we vote and if we were to say yes then we talk about the competing measures do we go back and say no after we have that discussion or what happens there so how the related and competing discussion would typically work is that um it whatever measures were recommended for endorsement today the committee would have a discussion about the related measures. And I can tell you that all the measures reviewed today, we had only identified related measures. So we have no immediate competing measures to note. Um, that said, the committee is always free to have a conversation and decide that what we deemed a related measure is actually more of a competing measure. And if that's the case, um, nothing would be done about it that day. So we would uh, note that for the future review and when measures were back for endorsement, if they, if they weren't being reviewed in the same cycle, we would ensure that they were, and then there would be um, a best in class vote for competing measures. So we would basically go into a meeting knowing if there was going to be a competing discussion in advance. So in this case, in, yeah, sorry, in this case, because we don't know, um, we, would hold, we would hold the related and competing discussion until the post comment call. And is the measure that was identified the, uh screening and if positive you do something is that that would be a competing measure for us as well so the the measures that we have we have a few measures identified as related to the first two this morning 3312 and 3313 
And then these last five from Minnesota community measurement are all considered relating to each other, but that's all that we had identified as currently endorsed related measures. So is the one that was cited, is that part of NQF now? Is that an NQF measure to screen and if positive then to do something about it? Just <clears throat> five that we're discussing today are the related ones. Oh, this is collect. Can I, I guess just I'm, 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 I'm missing? I, mean, I guess I'm missing. Maybe I'm just not understanding. So, oh. is the measure the NQ? Do we have a measure in NQF to screen? And if you screen positive, you have to do something. Is that an NQF measure? Yeah, isn't there a screening and uh, a, sc a screening and follow up measure? Yeah, that's what I. That's what I'm trying to get to. I think Colette, you have the details of it, right? It's no longer yeah. endorsed. I believe um, endorsement was removed by the measure steward. And I only know that from participating in the MAP rural group and the CQMC kind of evaluating these measures coming through. So I do know that that measure was endorsed at one point in time, probably fairly recently, but it is no longer. Um, 0418 is no longer endorsed. Thank you. Okay. It would be useful to actually know why that happened and what were the flaws in it yeah yeah it, just to clarify on the 2022 course set we do have screening and follow-up for teens and adults steward is cms and we we're happy to look into it but measures can lose endorsement for a variety of reasons um some not related to flaws, some related to funding or a change in a steward or developer too. So there's there's quite a, a few reasons why that might be the case, um, but we can look into it a little bit more. Yeah, it would be good to just know the context in order to you know, have any kind of discussion about related and competing. So have we concluded our discussions session. for the day. Yeah. Um, well, great. Thank you so much for um, bearing with us today. I know that offline voting is not as desirable of an outcome, but um, we really appreciate attendance throughout the day to be able to hold these discussions. Um, and <clears throat> this all day meetings, I think, take a little bit longer to turn around. So I can't promise the recording by tomorrow, but we will do our best to get it to you before the weekend. Um, if not, it will come early next week. Uh, as it's a long weekend and the recording for this meeting will be sent to the entire committee along with a survey um, for to record your votes on all measures picking up where we lost quorum. Um, <clears throat> once we send that to you, uh, we typically request a 48 hour turnaround time on that as we are trying to move these measures forward to stay on track in the cycle and. Um, and we will require a quorum of votes to be submitted offline. So if you get continued emails from us, it's that we haven't hit our number yet and we're just trying to get a few more committee members to, um, to participate there. Uh, okay, so as I said, we won't have a related and competing discussion today. We'll hold that until the post comment call. Um, so now we'll take a moment for NQF member and public comment. So I one, will invite- one, one quick question so that we're not having a meeting on, Jul on July 8th. That's correct. We will cancel that meeting. We'll, we'll restate that in our next steps as well, but you're right about that. So good job moving, moving through the agenda today to everyone. I'll take a moment now to open the lines for any NQF members or members of the public who have a comment uh, to speak up. Please feel free to unmute yourselves and state your comment. You can also raise your hand and someone will call on you or put a comment in the chat. Okay, and I don't see any hands raised or anything in the chat. I'll pause for 10 more seconds.
Okay, next slide, please. And now I will uh, turn it over to Sean to uh, talk about next steps and timelines. Thank you, Tammy, so much. So just as a quick reminder for everyone, we will be canceling the scheduled meeting uh, day two for next Friday, July 8th, since we were able to get through all discussions today. And we will be sending the offline voting survey link along with the recording from today's meeting to assist everyone uh, with their uh, with their offline votes. NQF staff will prepare a draft report detailing the committee's discussion and recommendations. The report will be released for 30 day public and member commenting period. Following this uh, 30 day commenting period, staff will compile all comments received into a comment table, which will be shared with, with the committee and the measure developers. During the post comment calls to be scheduled later this year, the committee will reconvene to discuss submitted comments during the commenting period. Following the post comment call, NQF staff will incorporate comments and responses to comments into the draft report once again in preparation for the consensus standards approval committee meeting known as CSAC. CSAC meets to endorse measures for the relevant cycle, and there is an opportunity for the public to appeal any endorsement decision that comes out of the CSAC. Well, since we were able to get through all discussion today, we did remove the date for the uh, next Friday meeting, July 8th. We will be canceling that invitation today, so keep an eye out for that shortly. The draft report commenting period runs from August 15th through September 13th. Uh, and we will be scheduling the post comment web meeting, CSAC review, and the appeals period uh, later this year. So keep, keep an eye out for further communications from us regarding those dates. And as always, please feel free to email uh, the project team at behavioralhealth at qualityforum.org. Um, you can also call us or uh, get more information on the project page, as well as the SharePoint site for uh, further measure in related information to assist with voting. Are there any questions? Does the committee have any questions today? And I think I will turn it back to Tammy to close us out. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you, Sean. And thank you again to everyone for your attendance, your participation. Thank you to all our lead discussants for walking us through those measures. Um, seven is a lot to get through in one day. So kudos to the committee for having um, fruitful, engaging discussions. We'll look for your continued participation as we vote offline and look to round out um, the, the events of this meeting this cycle. Uh, a big thank you to our co-chairs, Harold and Michael, for leading us through discussion today and for fielding our, our side chats as we nudge them along. Um, I'll let them say some closing remarks now. I, I just want to uh, thank everybody, both the staff uh, and the members of the committee. I want to apologize for, for my abrupt leaving. Apparently, I plugged my computer into the wrong wire and the wire wasn't connected to a power source. So, um, but I'm back. <laughs> you know, let me echo that. Thanks. And especially thank everybody for your patience and your forbearance. It's a long day. It's frustrating not to be able to vote and people were coming and going, but, uh, thank you all for your perseverance and your patience, uh, and your goodwill. Thanks all. Have a wonderful holiday weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.